Ward by J.C. McRae. A production by Parahuman Audio. Performed by a cast of fans and volunteers. Please visit parahumanaudio.com to learn more. Thank you and enjoy. Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 1 We'd known we'd have to face the music at some point. I wished we'd had a chance to talk it over before said music, but this wasn't a shock. Defiant wasn't in his full armor, much as he hadn't been when in the warden's new headquarters. But with the boots he wore and the augmentations to back, shoulder, and neck, he was tall enough that the back of his head could have rested against the door frame behind him. He didn't have nearly enough winter wear for how shitty the weather looked outside, but I could see the faint shimmer of heat radiating off of him. Someone less serious than me might have made a remark or even allowed themselves to think about steam coming out of the man's ears. I didn't allow it to be anything more than a fleeting thought. He was liable to go ballistic if there was even a hint of good humor on my face. I was still in that alien space, still experiencing the exhilaration of battle, and as I looked out the window into the darkness and the snow that the nearby lights illuminated, my vision warped in much the way it would if I had been flying at high speed, focusing on the horizon, and came to a quick stop. Sorry, Natalie said. When you all passed out... No, I said. No, it was right to go for help. What wasn't right... Defiant raised his voice. Was this asinine idea of yours? We can explain, I said. If no, he said. We can't explain? Kenzie asked. Not yet, Defiant said. Stay still, be quiet, and be prepared to follow my instructions. Kenzie nodded vigorously. I'm all for following instructions, but just to be clear, when you say stay still, does that include... Be still. Do nothing. Be silent. Okay, can do, Kenzie said. But does nothing include... Candy covered Kenzie's mouth. Kenzie managed to worm her way free of the hand, pulling down on her arm, then piped up with... There are about three exception cases I don't want to trip over. If you'd just let me go over them... Chicken Little joined Candy in working to subdue Kenzie. Sorry, Chicken Little said. When she gets going, it's hard to get her to be quiet. Quiet, Defiant growled, clearly on his last nerve, is the operative word. Chicken Little gave the man a salute with his free arm. His other arm hooked around Kenzie's upper body to pin her arms down. He dropped the saluting hand to the cone-shaped beak that stuck out of the lower half of his mask, covering it. Defiant marched out to the center of the room, the center of our group, I floated to my feet so I could get out of his way if I had to. By the looks I got from some members of the group, and the way Sveta pulled her arm apart into the flat, zipper-toothed tendrils for just one second, before restoring it to its prior shape, I wasn't the only person unconsciously noting the fact that my power was still functional. There wasn't anything new about it. A small worry assuaged, knowing the dream room hadn't knit us all together power-wise. You, he said, pointing at Kenzie. She jumped like she'd been caught doing something wrong. Over there. He pointed to Chris's old corner, paused, and motioned for Damsel to move away. They stay, he indicated Candy and Chicken. Miss Madison, as someone watching over her welfare, would you please do us all a favor and ensure Lookout is quiet? I will, Natalie said. Sveta Karelia, stand by the computers. Don't touch them. Sveta stood and went to stand by the computers. He got halfway through telling people to stand in specific places before giving me my position. Standing in the hallway just past the front door we rarely used, near the small bathroom and shower. It dawned on me just why he was positioning us. Well, part of it. Put Kenzie far away from her tech. Put the least tech-savvy people... Damsel and Sveta, closer to the computer terminals. Take the leaders, me and Tristan, 
and put Tristan in the corner where the whiteboard made him hard to see, put me in the hallway. Separating the kids. He did put Iden and Candy on either side of Rain, though. Not what I would have done, and he did put Darlene near the computers, probably to put her farther from Tattletail, who was between Tristan and Kenzie, far from the consoles. When everyone was separated, he began talking to Tristan. I couldn't overhear. From what I could see of the others, they were getting themselves sorted. They stretched, they looked around, and they looked more alert. Candy had messy hair from where she'd slept on it and was combing it with her fingers. She stopped as Rain set about dabbing at the cut on her forehead with a handkerchief. The contact elicited a warning sound from Defiant, who relaxed once he investigated. My mind was a storm of recent events, which did not feel like a dream, and the twenty-five different things I'd seen that could have each been things I sat down and thought about for an hour. The individual glimpses of triggers and their effects on these people I knew. The implications of the quirkier rooms or dream vision triggers, like Ashley being in damsels. And the implications and nuances of the different parts of the dream landscape. The scholar in me wanted to think on that, discuss with Tattletail, who might have insights, and even take notes. And Dean, who had lied to me. I could revisit old conversations I'd had with him. He'd told me once he'd had a trigger event, had closed up without saying exactly what it was, and I'd taken it as a betrayal, leaving me reeling now as I remembered those feelings I'd had and how he'd let me think I'd been in the wrong for pushing too hard. And then he'd caved. He'd told me a story about a home invasion, which had actually happened, but he had lied to me, made it into a trigger event. Him sharing that with me had made me feel close to him, and I'd tried to initiate a makeout session with him only for him to pull away. He hadn't wanted to do anything with me that night, and I'd respected it, but it had still played a part in me being willing and wanting to sleep with him just a little while later. It had played into the one fight, but now it made me wonder about the context of other ones. Breakups and makeups were part of any relationship, especially teenage ones where school and superheroics had a way of making the remainder of life very limited option-wise. So we'd done that. But now, it was tainted. And I'd had only the one thing that wasn't tainted, that I could go back to that was sexy, sweet, and lovely, where I'd felt like I was loved and there weren't ulterior motives where I'd been me and not some mangled, violated mess of stray animals and bugs bound up into a Victoria shape, doing physio every morning because of the accumulated injuries and ugliness. I'd just wanted the one thing. And, somehow, that paled in comparison to the visions. Jessica, my mom and Uncle Neil. Amy. My skin crawled. And as it crawled, I became aware of my injuries again, of the notion it wasn't my skin. I had no right to dictate thoughts, but the notion that she thought of me, that she'd touched herself, and when I'd voiced aloud that I didn't want to know, the crystal had answered my statement with an image of me. In another situation, if she'd been in reach and I'd been confident in my ability to safely act on her— I might have mangled her hands until they weren't recognizable as hands, and those fucking tattoos would be unrecognizable forever. Hurt her. Tell her never to think of me again, and send her on her way. Except I knew that was unfair. That it was barbaric when I didn't want to be barbaric. She was... ill. I could hate her. But what she needed was to be removed from people she would hurt and treated with kindness. And that would absolutely, no way in the fuck, be me. Fuck. There were still Master Stranger protocols active there. Wholly deserved, but I didn't have the mental bandwidth to revisit that room in the prison. I should have asked about what happened, hard as it was. Why I had a fingernail I distinctly remembered losing. I couldn't dwell on it without losing it. And I was aware I needed to wrestle this whole mess of thoughts off to one side so I could focus on Defiant, 
which was a crisis unto itself. Step 1. Calming down. Touch base with where I was. Locate yourself. It was technically morning. Early enough that it wasn't light out, but morning. We thought the city might break yesterday, and if it didn't, it would break today. Tinkers and thinkers all in agreement. It didn't break yesterday. Meaning that today is the day disaster strikes again, and we see how bad it is. Rain had complained once that his dreams left him feeling like he hadn't rested at all. I could simultaneously agree and disagree. Physically, I felt rested. Physically, I felt like my wounds had bound up, muscles tensing, creeping pains having crept all the way in, much as they did any time I slept. The skin on the back of my hand felt tight, but a lot of that was my body reacting and healing. The parts of me that weren't wounded or wound-adjacent felt better, all like an ordinary night's sleep. Mentally, though, that was where I was in full agreement with the guy. Mentally, I'd felt like I'd been there for every trigger, for the fight against a monster so big I couldn't fathom its scale, for the mental gymnastics sliding around and facing down other fantastical hyperdimensional monsters, horrible realities, and teacher. When I didn't focus, my brain felt like a buzz of television static, and that wasn't a monumental leap to the twilight state where I felt like I could go to sleep. When I did focus, my mind went straight back to those twenty-five, fifty, or a hundred things that I really wanted to break into and talk to the others about. Floorboards creaked as Defiant ended his conversation with Tristan. He paused in the center of the room, head down, looking at nothing in particular, and I was put in mind of Kenzie, accessing menus and screens, looking things up. He turned my way, and he approached me probably with my file fresh in his mind, if he wasn't looking at it at the same time he looked at me. Before we get going, I said, can I just say a few things? He folded his arms. First of all, I'm sorry. I have more to say on that front, but I wanted it to be what I said to you first. All right, he said, not flinching or relaxing in the slightest. Second of all, the kids. Look out in particular. To start with, it's best if you outright tell Syndicate not to connect with the others, because if she's connected to Lookout and she's in arm's reach of a computer... Defiant, filling the doorway, turned. Darlene Vasil, are you connected to anybody right now? Tell the truth, I called out. Defiant gave me a look over his shoulder. I didn't hear Darlene's response, but I imagined she was pointing. Break the connections, Defiant ordered. Keep them broken. I don't know why we're in trouble. Candy said from near the door to the fire escape. We were here for moral support. We got roped in by accident, that's all. Candace Facile, I have heard stories about you and your siblings from my colleagues who worked in Brockton Bay. I'm trying to be fair here and to put all prejudices aside. Help me do that. Follow my orders. Sit and rest while I talk to each of you in turn. Okay, I heard Candy. She sounded more anxious than she normally did. Look out, too, I said, before Defiant had walked all the way back to me. Something you should address while we're making sure this goes as smoothly as possible. What about her? If she was that insistent on saying something, it was probably for a reason. Ask her. Look out, Defiant called out, without taking his eyes off of me. The potential exceptions you talked about? Oh, I could hear Kenzie. Um, first of all, can I move my eyes? Yes, Defiant said. I started to move my hand to indicate he should follow up when he added, Why would that be a concern? Um, because I've got cameras embedded in my eyes, and there are tracking points that let me operate some of my systems remotely. Have you been remotely operating your computer after I told you to do nothing? Um, yes. Just sending some messages and updating some things and taking notes and- Stop, he said. Don't touch your menus. Don't operate any tinker technology you or anyone else owns. Don't operate any non-tinker technology. What else? Um, what about technology that operates itself? 
It's just running in the background, but I haven't been nudging it back onto course and it's gathering and using some data and running some defensive routines and a few offensive ones. And stuff. Defiant didn't move, except to break eye contact and to dip his head a bit. The lights in the building flickered. I could see some lights of monitors and projected screens at the far end of the room momentarily flicker, glow, or change to a different interface. With Defiant occupying most of the doorway with his partially armored bulk, there was only one projected screen near the door that I could sort of see. I watched as it went black, then flashed, showing Defiant's Dragon Spear logo against a shimmering gold background. That logo changed to a woman's face. Dragons. Dragon the AI, I had to remind myself. I found exception number three, Dragon said her voice sounding like it came from Defiant's right, with a bit of an echo to it. Handled. Thank you, Defiant said, not sounding quite so angry. He turned his attention back to me. When he spoke, he sounded upset again. Antares, Victoria, anything else? Not on that front. I just thought I'd warn you so you didn't have cause to be upset after. We'll see. Dragon, I'm sorry we're talking under these circumstances. Again, Defiant, I'm sorry we're here. To give context to why, I hate feeling like I'm in the dark. Other members of Breakthrough are similar. We had what felt like a great way to get a look at the bigger picture. You said no. Then pieces fell into place when we crossed paths with Damsel of Distress and Tattletale. We got carried away, and that's not me making excuses. Antares, Defiant said. On the whole... I've always had a positive impression of you. I remember hoping that you would join my wards team once. I even remember the moment, after I printed out your grades and I had them by my right hand, my left hand at the keyboard, where I was navigating an arrest report you made. I kept my mouth shut, nodding. I don't have the most positive impression of you right this moment. Oof. I don't either, I ventured. I... I have to admit... I'm still reeling from that whole thing. I'm not thinking straight, as much as I'm trying. But I'm not happy with what we did. I'm not happy with myself. I think, deep down inside, I expected it to fail. That we wouldn't get in, or we'd get in, but it would be limited, or something. And at least having people like Tattletail and Damsel here would give us some insights we could use. And we really needed insights. It didn't fail. No, I agreed. I thought we'd have Rain do what he has to do, which is visit that dream space. We could try looking around with the tech, have Tattletail interpret. Damsel knows some stuff, but things went wrong. And you didn't reach out to us. You did reach out to Love Lost and her protege to warn them. Some of that was that we were worried if we reached out and you guys mandated certain action— we'd be outright defying you on a bigger level. Or we'd be sending Rain in to what would have definitely been his death. I have a lie detector, Antares, Defiant said. I fell silent. That read as a partial truth. It's not the majority or even half of your reasoning. The remainder? We thought we could handle it, so we focused on handling it. Okay, he said. I'm going to come back in a few minutes for your full explanation and recap. Organize your thoughts. Get to the point where you're thinking straight. Be ready, but stay put. I drew in a deep breath. Okay. I should tell you. A lot of what you said read as 90% honest at best. I hope that when I come back to get your interpretation of the events, that's improved. I absorbed that. He walked away, back to the center of the room. My turn? Tattletail asked, off to the side. I know you and your power well enough to know you'll take a shortcut, Tattletail, Defiant said. I'll talk to you once I've talked to everyone, to verify the smaller details. That's going to be a while, Tattletail said. You have options, Tattletail, Defiant said. We could arrest you as a villain, keeping in mind the theft of the Black Dog IP, the intimidation of the University Road settlers, the Justice Buy case, or the raids on the White Hill Settlement. I get what you're doing, 
Mention three things I'm a possible suspect for. Mention one thing I'm completely unrelated to. Get me to say something stupid. The raids on the White Hill settlement came from New Brockton Bay, prior to the Dauntless incident. Either you were ignorant or you were complicit. Either way, we shouldn't have trusted you to keep the peace there. The raiders disappeared, didn't they? A lion's share of the funds went back to White Hill. But not all. Sue me for not being able to catch up to them before they went on a spending spree. I did my duty. You can't pin me on the other stuff. I can try. I can bring you in. We can see what sticks. And it will be days, weeks, or years before you're free again. Or I can stay put. Got it. And be quiet. Let me ask my questions. No hints or clues to the others. Lookout has extensive cameras, and I have access, Dragon said, her voice coming across speakers. No winks or nudges, got it, Tattletail said. Defiant went to Sveta. Dragon's voice came very close to my ear, though there was no apparent source. If there's an underlying mistruth you're holding to, it would be better to let it go. Because of that thing where I'm only apparently telling 90% of the truth? I asked. Yes. Well, a ceiling of 90%. I don't know what I could say that would be 100% the truth, I admitted. I don't get everything that's going on. I don't feel sure about what's happened in the past. All I know in the present is that I should be worried. I could tell you my name, and I'm not sure it would read as 100% confident. Try it? Defiant asked. I am Victoria Dallin, I told her, and I tried to sound confident, which was my mistake, because I instinctively reached for a foundation for that confidence, and I groped blindly instead. Uninvited images of a body of strays and bugs flashed through my mind. I thought of the Master Stranger protocol that was technically still in place after the prison. I thought of the mosaic of identities that I'd analyzed and faced when fighting Lung, before deciding that Victoria Dallin, Glory Girl, and Antares needed to be one. That warrior monk, wretch, scholar, and everything else needed to fold into that. How those things had been eminently there when I'd phased into the crystal. Injured images of me, healed. Antares and Glory Girl. Again? she asked. I am Victoria Dallin, I told her, and this time I pushed those ideas out of mind. Tried to. It was like stuffing the mess of a dirty room into a closet and finding the door couldn't shut. I think you're right, she said. You can blame the dishonest readings on a lack of personal confidence. You're shaken. Not even reading a hundred percent confidence when I say my own name? I asked. No, Dragon said. Ninety percent? I asked. I could hear that telling pause. Eighty? Seventy? It could be an outlier. Can you think of a statement you are more confident about? I tried. I want to help the people of this city. There we go, Dragon said. Point in your favor. Yeah? One hundred percent? Yes, she told me. Counts for something. More than you might realize, considering some of the ongoing concerns. I could hear Defiant's conversation with Sveta. Even knowing there's going to be consequences, I thought. I'm glad we did it? To get out ahead of Teacher? To see what he was really doing and to understand all of this? I doubt there's a single person out there who can fight on this playing field who isn't breaking some of the rules. What do you say if I say that out loud, Dragon? 100% confidence in my words? Definitely not a point in my favor. Not in your books. You broke the crystal, Defiant said, incredulous. Some of the others had gathered. The split everyone up so they can be interrogated separately thing breaking down as Defiant finished his rounds. I could see them in the center of the room, peeking around Defiant's frame. I mentioned this before, I said, trying not to sound like I was exasperated or defensive. There's a lot about navigating that space that's... intuitive adjacent. Intuitive adjacent? Defiant asked, 
and I had the impression he was holding back from flying off the handle. Logic adjacent, kind of, but you have to start from the heart, not the head, and general abstracted feelings of being. Logic adjacent is being illogical, Defiant stated. Come the fuck on, Victoria. I didn't want to back down, because I was fairly certain it would make me look far worse if I didn't sound confident. Teacher's not teacher anymore. If he's been teacher for the last couple of years. The agent is running the show. I could see how the agent functioned, the structure of it, the way the patterns played out. I was sure that leaving him alone would be catastrophic. I was pretty sure breaking that key point to his power wouldn't be catastrophic, specifically. Because of intuition-adjacent, logic-adjacent understandings you picked up while exploring this space over half an hour? Defiant asked. Yes, I told him, with conviction, while willing that lie detector to register 100%. Can I say something? Rain said, behind Defiant. Defiant turned, but didn't say yes. She figured it out. How to navigate the space, how to interact with it, how to throw herself off a high cliff while leaping over a ravine, crash through the surface on the other side, and resurface while wearing... I think it was the costume she used to wear when she was Glory Girl. Working with her agent, too, Sveta volunteered. Damsel knew how to handle the space, but she didn't have that connection to her agent. I could if I tried, Damsel chimed in, from a spot that was out of sight, off to the right, near the door to the fire escape, blocked from view by the walls that enclosed the bathroom. Enough, please, Defiant said. Input appreciated, but I would like to continue this conversation with Victoria, one-on-one. -on -one. Rain and Sveta obliged. Being good at this is not necessarily reassuring, Defiant told me. Why not? I asked. Because that implies a stronger connection to your agent, and we know for a fact that agents are aggressive and conflict-driven. If it's cooperating with you, and you're finding yourself in parallel to it, that's concerning. Which tied back to what Dragon had said to me. Counts for something, more than you might realize, considering some of the ongoing concerns. I want to save the people of this city, I said, repeating the statement that had elicited dragons. Defiant went silent. I could imagine him conversing with Dragon. I glanced past him at Kenzie, who was standing beside Natalie, Natalie's hand at her shoulder. I could imagine Kenzie wanting this, someone who was there to talk to when she wanted someone. With Dean no longer in that reassuring spot in my heart, I kind of wanted it too. It felt especially lonely to be standing here, being interrogated so soon after a number of people had fallen in my esteem. Defiant held up one finger for me to wait one second, while walking over to the desk with the tech on it. I'll borrow one of your projectors, Lookout, if I may. Go ahead, have fun. It's not so fun, Defiant said, but he didn't say it to her. He held the microwave-sized cube in both hands, showing his strength with the ease he handled the dense cube of technology. Images were displayed on the walls, floor, and ceiling nearest me. Men and women in white coveralls, unconscious, lying in cots, on beds, and on floors. Time of death, 5.15 in the morning, Defiant said. For each and every last one of them, with slight discrepancies depending on the doctor and the time the doctors reached them. I shook my head. He still had control over what we estimate to be roughly 4,000 citizens of Earth Gimel and another 1,000 citizens of Earth Chite. Some, many, were unwillingly under his power. He forced it on them, using parahuman tricks. Many were capes. Some were heroes, retired or otherwise. My heartbeat hurt in my chest. I didn't dare breathe. I didn't take my eyes off of Defiant's face all brain-dead, to the extent their brains ceased regulating breathing and heartbeat. You're fucking with me, I said. This is some test to verify my convictions. You don't sound confident. There was a brief period between the time I broke it when I saw the aftermath. The thralls he had in the crystal space, they turned on him, 
They were angry. That was there. Here, lives were lost. I shook my head again. Are you calling me a liar? He asked. Yeah, I said. I didn't kill those people. I'm not sure I believe they're dead. Defiant turned his back to me, walking across the room to the tables, with the others backing out of his way. He set the cube down. He'd carried it like it was empty cardboard, but the folding table we'd had by Rain's whiteboard creaked. He didn't elaborate, didn't say anything, just walked over to Tattletail. She was his last stop, he'd said, for clarifying details. He was keeping an eye on all of us, as was Dragon, so when I ventured into the room and he didn't take my head off, I figured we were good enough. You broke the crystal? Tristan asked. I broke Teacher's crystal, I said. I thought about those images of people lying prone, people standing around their limp bodies. I think I broke Teacher. It's dawning on me, Rain said. I have to go back tonight. I don't know if the walls will still be up. What if they're permanently down, and each night it's just those things attacking us on their rotation? Staying in our sectors seemed to work, Sveta said. Right, but what if each one has different rules, or different ways of acting? Love Lost's is tomorrow. What if it has emotion control that reaches through the walls? What if it's angry, in a way Cradles wasn't? Chicken Little coughed abruptly enough it made Defiant turn his head. Between coughs, he muttered, Mr. Hugs, I'm not going to call it that. Hecaton Kyres, I suggested. That's way too cool for Cradle, Rain said. He added, I'm spooked. I feel like if we can get through last night, we can get through a lot, Tristan said. Rain nodded, sitting up straighter. Yeah. I'm glad you guys were there, if nothing else. I haven't had a lot of times in my life when people were there for reasons I wished they were. Sometimes, like the rain at the Fallen fight, because I didn't let them be. Kenzie was sitting on the floor by one of the chairs, with Candy sitting in the chair behind her. Candy's knees were over Kenzie's shoulders. Legs helped hold her in place, while Candy's hands covered Kenzie's mouth. Kenzie wriggled a bit, protesting like she wanted to say something. I appreciate the sentiment, Kenzie, Rain said, responding somberly to Kenzie's mumbles like she'd said something profound. Kenzie seemed to relax her protestations at that. I won't say I'm not spooked, Tristan admitted. I've got to get back to the hospital, switch over to Byron, see how he's doing. I'm kind of terrified he might be worse. We messed with a pretty fragile balance back there. Do you really think those people are dead? Sveta asked. No, I said, but I would have been lying if I'd said I wasn't a bit worried. The conversation seemed to stall. Many of us weren't even fully awake. Alarmed, alert, but not awake. Not fully put together. I looked over the room, at the kids, where Darlene sat next to Aiden, her head on his shoulder as she did a bad job of pretending to be dozing off. Candy with Kenzie, semi-playfully ensuring Kenzie did nothing, as per Defiant's instructions. Rain, how's your power? I asked Rain. I'm not about to pull out the silver blades or anything while Defiant's here, but I'm pretty sure I got nothing. Nothing as in... As in my powers all suck like I got no tokens at all. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same for Love Lost and Colt. I nodded. We had messed with the system, messed with the thing that was doling out these shares of power. We'd faced them, looked them in the eye. I looked over at Danzel, who leaned against the door. Through the window right next to the door, I could see Snuff on the fire escape, smoking. No side piece. Good showing, I told Damsel. Last few minutes might have made the difference. In letting you murder thousands... Glad to help, Damsel responded, dry. I shook my head. Stopping teacher, getting past thralls, all of it, all of you. That wasn't easy. But it needed doing, I finished, silent. I feel like we need to have five hundred conversations about stuff we saw or experienced in there, 
Tristan said. And at the exact same time, I feel like we need to never talk about any of it. Amen, Sveta said, barely audible. Again, the conversation died. But on the heels of the never talk about any of it, none of us picked it up again. Defiant finished his conversation with Tattletail, stiff and looming while she looked eminently casual, thumbs hooking into her belt, leaning against Chris's old desk. He turned to face us, to face me. The stare was accusing. I don't believe they're dead, I said. Victoria, your comment, immediately upon waking up, he said, joking about the world ending. You knew it was a consideration. I was phase-shifted or facet-shifted to a version of me that was more Glory Girl-like, I think. That's what others saw. I was exhilarated, post-panic. I said something dumb. He didn't respond. I'm 100% committed to preventing the world from ending, the city from breaking, whatever else. Completely and totally. Taking teacher's puppeteer crystal out was in support of this. If we leave him alone, we'll be counting down the minutes or hours before he initiated the end on his terms. Defiant nodded. A finger that looked flesh, but had odd seams to it, tapped heavily on a folding table. One hundred percent. I believe you. I won't say it was right. I nodded. But you're not one hundred percent confident those thralls were alive. Eighty to ninety percent confident. But that's not enough. It wasn't a decision I made in isolation, I told him. And I didn't have the benefit of miniatures or hours to weigh its merits. Time was short. I had a sense of the risks and the danger if I didn't take action. I acted. I understand, Defiant said. But if you take that many lives into your moral calculus, then you open yourself up to being second-guessed and challenged. We don't want to live in a world where anyone and everyone can make that choice. Am I right? I nodded before reluctantly venturing. Yes. Can I just say that it felt closer to 100% certainty at the moment? I'm sure it did, Defiant said. What did happen to the thralls? Rain asked. Released, I thought. Freed, Defiant said. Some of the beneficial side effects and powers are lingering, but they're fading out by the minute, according to reports, some faster than others. Teacher no longer has any sway over them. That's a mean joke, Darlene said, saying they died. I had to make sure Antares was convinced, and she wasn't. Not quite enough, and that worries us. With this, with my concerns about Lookout's approach to the situation and the lack of safeguards, the leaping to assumptions, with the fact I would have expected someone with closer ties to the wardens, he looked at Sveta, to cooperate more with us, and everything else in aggregate, big and small. We will be giving you a choice, to be made before I have to look after other things. What choice? Tristan asked. Either you allow us to impose consequences, you obey our instructions, endure confiscation of assets and further oversight, or you no longer have our help. No longer have the Warden's assistance. Our network, our information, our teams, the ability to call and get our help. Tattletail, Damsel, and the children can make their independent calls, if Lookout wanted to consider herself Breakthrough, and Breakthrough decided to accept consequences, we would continue working with her. Same as if the children accepted consequences, but Breakthrough did not. You want her tech, Tattletail guessed. We would lose Lookout's help in managing the access cube and security system, as well as other projects she volunteered her help with, yes. But that's not the concern. She's young, vulnerable, and caught between two teams. We don't want to force your hands. This is a genuine offer. Work with the wardens, within the law, and accept consequences. Or carry on doing what you're doing, beyond the law, without our sanction or help. I feel like there's more to this, Tristan said. There is. Do you arrest us if we don't cooperate? No, but we might if we thought you'd do this again. Tristan nodded. 
This is a mess. You really expect me to believe you'll work with me? Damsel asked. I don't expect you to agree to cooperate, Defiant told her. But if you say yes, that can be an inroad. We can talk, and arrangements can be made. Talking is better than the alternatives when things are this fragile. Damsel shook her head. Can you give us a minute? Tristan asked. No listening ears, no observation? I'll step outside, Defiant said, powering down all of Lookout's systems. We waited until he was gone. Sorry again, Natalie said to my right. No, really, I told her. You did the right thing. Do you think you did the wrong thing, pursuing this because... She trailed off as I shook my head. Stick with the wardens, Tristan asked. I nodded. Communication and cooperation are too important. Warning for the kids. Look out in particular, Tattletail spoke up. She hadn't budged from where she sat. They're going to take your stuff. What? Kenzie sat up, pulling free of Candy's hands and legs. What do you mean? If both Breakthrough and the Tenders cooperate, they're taking your things. All tech, including what you have at the institution and Victoria's apartment. Confiscated until further notice. No! Kenzie gasped, looking horrified. A smile crossed her face. This is a test, right? Like showing Victoria a bunch of dead people to see if she was really sure what she did wouldn't kill anyone? Those aren't equivalent, Rain said. They kind of are, Kenzie answered. My stuff is everything I can do. It's months of work and scans, and it's my contact with everyone, and it's my everything. It could make the difference between us saving thousands or thousands dying, couldn't it? Theoretically, I said. You can cheat your way around it, Tattletail said. Say the tenders won't cooperate. They act outside the law. Life gets harder, but you can keep tech at your place. Kenzie nodded, looking at the others. I almost said something to her, then stopped myself. Best to let Kenzie find her own way to the answer. But you shouldn't, Tattletail said. Damn it, I thought. Tattletail liked to hold the kids' hands, giving them a fish instead of teaching them how to fish. Frustrating. We shouldn't, Chicken Little said. Kenzie looked crestfallen. It doesn't make sense to make enemies, Darlene said, before walking over to give Kenzie a half hug. I'm out, Damsel said. She pulled on her coat, which was a process with the lengthy claw at the end of each finger. She pretty much had to lay the coat on the ground before picking up the edge with the back of each blade and finding the armholes, shrugging it on. When she'd lived with Swansong and I, we'd simply helped her. Not working with the wardens? I asked. She sniffed. What do they have to offer me? Then she turned to the door. A solid second or two passed. This time, it was Kenzie who covered Candy's mouth. No turning around or looking back at any of us. Her eyes fixated on the doorstep. Damsel finally kicking the door three times in quick succession. Defiant opened the door, and Damsel strode past him, into the winter snowstorm. Decided? he asked. Yeah, Tattletail answered. We're in. We'll cooperate. He stepped back inside, and the heat of his systems steamed visibly as the cold air was superheated. Or the moist air from systems made contact with the air from the cold pre-sunrise outdoors. Look out, Precipice. Your tinker technology will be confiscated for the time being. We will be asking you to vacate your headquarters and, until further judgment can be rendered, you are not to associate with one another. Each of you will be remanded to the care of an acceptable guardian, someone the wardens trust. This was important. This was worth it, even like this. They didn't take me back to my apartment. There was Tinker Tech there. I felt scuzzy in clothes I'd worn the day prior, my teeth fuzzy, my stomach empty, and that emptiness scoured, for lack of a better word, by the hunger that ate from the emptiness outward. No powers was the rule. 
good general rule while the city was in this fragile, cracked ice state, but it was being imposed on us for other reasons. Judgment pending. The warden leadership would meet and they'd assess what we'd done. No powers meant no flight. So I used the elevator in the building for perhaps the third time. Slow and painful, my bag heavy at my shoulder, my entire body restless because I hadn't done my physio yet. My wounds felt tight and uncomfortable, perpetually reminding me they existed. My skin prickled from the recent cold and the transition to warmth, and in that prickling, I remembered being burned and my heart rate picked up, vague feelings of panic making their stealthy approach. I got my breathing mostly level by the time the elevator stopped. I exited, walked down the hall, bag over my one shoulder, and knocked on the door. Mom answered. Not yet prepped for the day. She'd just woken up maybe half an hour ago and had a coffee. She held it out to the side with one hand and reached out to hug me with the other. I started to pull back, but she grabbed me, hugged me fiercely, with a lot of strength. It was surprising to see her without a suit or, well, a suit, costume or business wear, without hair done up and makeup on. It had been a long time since I'd seen my mother of the morning hours, Carol before the day began. More than four years. I was struck by the mental image of her kissing Uncle Neil, vivid and visceral, deeply uncomfortable. I looked away, busying myself with finding a spot to put my bag down. Crystal's on the phone. She was supposed to call when you arrived, my mom said. I nodded, stepping into my cousin's apartment. My mom's things were by the couch, but the couch was made up, sheets removed and folded. Boxes were everywhere, and the apartment looked about two-thirds of the way to being packed up. What do you need? my mom asked. Food? Soon, I said. I should do my physio before I go crazy, if that's okay. Can I join you? she asked. It couldn't hurt, I imagine. I hesitated. Or not? I was saved from having to answer by Crystal emerging from the hallway that led to her bedroom, pulling the phone down and away from her ear. Call done. She gave me a hug. As I broke the hug, I saw my mother walking a little unsteadily to the couch to sit on the armrest. Small steps, more like she was an old woman than a forty-year-old. I was put in mind of Dad after his head injury, but this... this was my fault, in large part. What on earth did you get up to? Crystal asked me. You're on probation? Benched, until they can decide how serious it was. They've broken up breakthrough, but they may pull us back in later today, depending on how bad things get. And this questionably serious thing was... Definitely serious. Just a question of whether it was catastrophically serious or regular old serious. It was us diving into the guts of things. Deeper and faster than we thought we would, with more danger into the guts of powers. Why? Crystal asked. Because someone had to. Has to. The bad guys are already doing it. It's like waging a war in the 21st century without considering computers as a factor. And? Crystal asked. And I'm tired. Numb. Freaked out, I said. I don't think I could even begin to explain the scale of it. The wardens are freaking out because of the scale of it, and I think at best they have blurry interdimensional camera images pulled from Kenzie's tech. But everyone's safe? my mom asked. Mostly, I said. That's good. It's something you wanted to prioritize. I nodded. I'd like... She stood straighter, but she wavered a bit. She reached out, and for a moment I almost pulled away. Then I caught her because I wasn't such a horrible daughter that I'd let my injured mother fall. The mother I'd injured. I gripped her arm and I focused on that grip, looking down at my hand at her arm and my hand. The apartment was still relatively dark, lit only by the hallway light and living room light. Through the kitchen, the big window showed the snowstorm outside, 
white snowflakes against black. Why are you pulling away? My mother asked me. It's stupid, I told her. It doesn't feel stupid. Okay, Crystal butted in. What do you say we get some coffee in us, bit of food? Victoria said she wanted to do her physio routine before eating. That's an option, Crystal said, artificially cheerful. Auntie Carol, maybe you and I could put coffee on and prep some food. Victoria can do her thing. I'd rather Victoria tell me what happened, my mother said. Because I thought we were mending bridges, and all of a sudden... She didn't sound like my mother. No sternness, no strength, no fierceness. She'd seemed better when we'd been at the prison in the company of Amy and Mark. It's dumb, I said. An hour and a half ago, I was racing through the guts of the systems that drive our powers, powerless, escaping a bunch of things that looked like the Dauntless Titan, Kronos, apparatuses that extend from powers. I'd almost said they looked like Endbringers, but Endbringer was a heavy word when one Endbringer had killed Eric and... and Neil. Whoever Neil was to me. Scary. Crystal said, her voice still a bit artificial, like she was trying to carry the weight of managing the tone of the three-person conversation. I saw things, I said. I saw things about my team, but that was at a different point, more the thing that can draw people together instead of driving them apart. Some of it drove you apart? Crystal asked. Not me and my team. Amy. Amy's sickness, the depths of it. The fact she's helping refugees, hints about teacher, stuff about my therapist. Amy is a good reason to be touch wary, Crystal said, ever the diplomat. My mom, though, the lawyer, the heroine who could patrol and spot trouble from blocks away in the gloom, her study of me was sharp. You didn't shy away from Crystal, my mom said. Can we drop it? I asked. My mom reached over. I didn't pull away as she touched my upper arm, rubbing it. Apparently you can't drop it, she told me. What? I didn't pull back. But you tensed. You watched, wary, instead of making eye contact. You didn't ease up as you normally might. It's been a while since I eased up when someone wanted to touch me, I answered. You saw something about me? she asked. Hurting a villain more badly than necessary? Making a deal to give a scumbag a pass? What sort of things did these images or figures play act for you? If you tell me, then at least I can defend myself. Or, you know, we could respect that Victoria's not ready to talk about it, Crystal said. That seems like the cowardly way out, my mother said. Cowardly? I asked. I was ready to lash out, to say something, to retort. Not least because it felt like it was my mom who was saying something she had been keeping inside for the last few years. Filters down, defenses down, the brain injury bringing things to the surface, without the poised, perfect, perfectly made-up Carol Dallin crafting every response. Like she was calling the me that had struggled during and since the hospital a coward. I shook my head fierce. Not getting into this. Sorry, Crystal. Crystal looked legitimately scared, seeing the feelings that were flaring up. There's too much going on these days, my mother said. We can't have more and more things hanging over our heads. If this is about my actions as a heroine, I fully admit I haven't been perfect. I shook my head. My civilian life? she asked. Yeah. Can we just leave it at that? My time as a lawyer? It would have to be, she said. Because, believe me, I've spent the last two years coming to terms with how badly I failed as a mother. I tensed. Victoria, my mom said. Every time I think of you, I feel pride. I love the woman you became, as brave as you are. I worry desperately for you, but that's worry born of love. If you want me to tell you that you're right about your sister, I will. She was ill, and I contributed to that illness by treating her as I did when she was vulnerable and lost. 
We went to Shin to help her and guide her. As much as I spend every hour of every day feeling pride for you, I'm afraid for her because she won't accept guidance. Mom, I said, one word to break the flow, to interrupt the stream of consciousness. Would you stiffen if I hugged you now? She asked. Or if I reached out? I didn't respond. Why? She asked. If, I started. And then I couldn't stop. If I asked you, sorry, Crystal. Sorry? Crystal asked. If I asked if Neil Pelham might be my dad, I asked. I looked at my mom. Carol Dallin, lawyer, fierce veteran superheroine. Carol, who had survived three Endbringer fights. Brandish. Tears appeared in her eyes. What? Crystal asked. Twenty-one years ago, they... My parents were together back then, Crystal said, sounding horrified. And you were with Uncle Mark. Sorry, I said again. Tears ran down my mother's cheeks, and she wiped them away. Seemingly angry they'd appeared. I found myself hoping in the moment that the emotional outpouring was out of anger that I'd thought of something so unlikely or impossible. Not your father, Carol said. But I thought once that he might be. He might be, I echoed her. You had so much of him in you, and your power, for pretty much the entire year before your sister triggered. I was in dread. Neil was too. You... She looked at Crystal. Understand, please. It was that I spent so long unable to trust anyone. It took me years to warm up to anyone, years to get close to Mark. But we had our rough patches. And then there was Neil, and I could trust him more easily because Sarah trusted him. It hurt to listen to. Hurt because it hurt Crystal, too. If it had been any hour except ass o'clock in the morning— the pre-dawn hours between the crystal hellscape and this conversation, I wouldn't have said anything. But I knew my mom. Knew she'd read through me, that she wouldn't let this go. You never told any of us? I asked. Did it impact how you treated Amy? Did you think? For a brief while, I thought. Early on, when she had powers, I pulled away. She gave me looks, and I thought she knew something certain but she didn't. And over time, I let myself forget. Something I would think about once in a while, with a lot of regret. Less as... She stopped herself, wiped at her eyes again. So you think I'm Marks? I can't talk about this, she said. Not like this, not right now. You can't give me the one answer, I pressed her. The important one? I can't, she said, tensing up. I can't. Mom, I said. Carol, don't dodge this. The word seemed to sting her. Victoria. Crystal's voice was gentle, the false emotion no longer there. She can't. I looked at Crystal, saw the hurt and apology on her face. The head injury, she said. She really might not be able to. That's not fair, I thought. I'm going to step outside, I said. Okay, Crystal said. Sorry for dropping this on you, for dredging this up. Okay, Crystal said. Mark's your father, my mother said to my back. I paused, then headed through the kitchen. I escaped to the balcony, opening the door. I hadn't removed my coat or boots, so I was going to be warm enough for the most part. Snow was almost knee-deep where it had piled against the sliding door. It formed little hills atop the balcony railing. It was so cold my nostrils instantly froze, the moisture in my eyes threatening to do the same. I could see the distant portals from this high ground, the weather patterns, the sliver of heat on the horizon where the sun was starting to rise and battle its way past the cloud cover of the snowstorm. Verifying one piece of data gave evidence to the rest, and too many of the rest made my skin crawl. My fingernails dug into my sleeves, but found the jacket and the bandages that were still there too impenetrable. Fingernails. Fingernail. 
I pulled my hand back and undid the bandage. I looked at the fingernail with the black of gathered blood beneath it. I gripped the railing with the one hand that had been partially degloved, the hand with the fingernail that wasn't supposed to be there, that marked a violation I had no clue about. Digging my fingernails into the wood of the railing top, I pressed down until the pain stabbed its way across my hand, transformed in shape and intensity, redoubling. As I pressed down more and more, with the nail that wasn't supposed to be there, until the nail cracked, broke, and tore at the bed. I continued pressing down until the last of the nail gave, and my first knuckle scraped against ice-crusted wood, raw nail bed scraping against the flat of the wood, stinging with pain. There wasn't any exhilaration in it. No relief in the dopamine hit. It hurt in the fucking worst way, to the point tears came to my eyes but I didn't have that sign, that mark, that wrongness. My entire body trembled. Blood dripped from fingertip to white snow. I floated up onto the railing, and I moved far enough away that all was clear. Thank you for helping me back there, I thought. I activated the wretch. The snow blew around me, gathering on the wretch's surface, tracing outlines, forming a shape, I could hear my mom talking to Crystal with a raised voice inside, muffled by the intervening door. The wretch didn't grasp, writhe, or swing blindly. The faces it wore weren't contorted or angry. I lifted my hand, and it moved nearby limbs. I turned my hand over, and it mimed me. My hand trembled. The wretch's invisible hand was as steady as a rock. Time to face the day, I thought. At least you're with me. It's going to be a rough one. Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 2 What got me was how fucking quiet it all was. I could look out the window, and except for the highway, I couldn't see the lights of a single car. Snowfall muted everything, and the city wasn't quite awake yet. No work to go to, not enough people around to talk to, the very real possibility there was no future. Only the moments, now. People elsewhere packed up. They got in their cars. They drove to some faraway place. They put their life's possessions away in this new place. They slept a bit. They got food in a horrendous lineup. Their days went on. I stepped away from the window, still drying my hair. My finger without the fingernail hurt like fuck. I got dressed while still in the washroom, then tended to basic don't-want-to-look-sick makeup and other ministrations. I passed Crystal, who floated in for her shower. No sound, no footsteps even. Crystal flew, and I floated just enough to keep my steps light, because I'd overdone my physio before my nap, overextending the underside of the foot I'd cut a week ago. Carol was still working on her hair, which she had been doing before I started my 15-minute shower, finished post-shower ministrations, dressed, and stepped out. Golden hair parted, slicked close to the head at one side below the part, a roller removed from the hair at the brow, where it gave her hair some wave as it swept over one corner of her forehead. Every strand with a place, but the short hairstyle wasn't the sort of thing that required 15 minutes. Her power had nothing to do with steel, but her name and identity kind of did. Brandish. Steel out, steel in the spine, steel in the expression. Unflinching in meeting my eyes, like a swordswoman might not flinch as she crossed swords with someone else in a duel. No, not a duel, not a training session either. Pure demonstration. This was for her sake, and it was for mine but it wasn't an exchange. I had napped, 
taking 45 minutes to myself to try to restore what hadn't been restored by the time in that alien landscape. Carol hadn't rested at all, working out with my cousin that we would be going out later, then immediately starting with her wardrobe, hair, and makeup. All in all, Carol had taken an hour to get ready. My clothes were somewhat rumpled, so I ventured back to the bathroom and called out, Crystal? My voice wasn't that loud, but it sounded deafening with how quiet it all was. Hate being bothered when I'm showering. Give me a few minutes of peace, damn it. The grumbling continued. Can I borrow clothes? Yes, go away. Crystal wasn't a morning person. I stepped away to fish around in her closet when I heard her talking again, which led to me exiting the bedroom to get closer to the bathroom door and listen. Not from the boxes. You don't want me to grab anything you've already packed? I asked. Didn't you hear me? She asked. You're interrupting my shower and you're not even listening. You told me to go away, so I walked away. Your shower's in progress and you have water on you. Nothing's interrupted. Stop being prickly. Stop interrupting my shower and I'll stop being prickly. I'll grab something. Thank you. I'd just reached her closet when I heard her talking again, which forced me back out of her room to get to where I could hear her again. Can check on Mark. What? While we're at the new headquarters, we can check on Mark. They should have a link to Shin. Okay, I said. Stop talking. Shower. We'll work it out after. I rolled my eyes, looked at Carol, and realized what I was doing when I saw how unflinching she was, not batting an eyelash, not really reacting or reflecting what I was doing or what the external world was doing. The smile she put on her face was very much the kind of smile that was put on faces. Nothing wrong with it, but I could tell she was making an effort. Doing okay? I asked feeling like I'd done something wrong or alien by being natural with Crystal when it was my mom who was out of place. Or was it guilt, because the little wrongnesses about my mom were in part due to the head injury, which was in large part my own fault? Doing better, my mom said. It warms my heart seeing you two together. I'm glad you have each other. I'm glad too, I said. My foot hurt, so I picked it up off the ground, drilling the floor with my toe a bit. I felt like a kid with no idea what to do while being addressed by an adult. Coffee? My mom asked. Sure, I told her. Please. Maybe a breakfast sandwich? English muffin? Meat hash patty? No egg? Please, that'd be great. The only sounds as my mom made her way from the mirror in the hallway to the kitchen were the hiss of the shower and my mom's faintly clunky footsteps, trying not to clunk too much, but clunking nonetheless. I had distinct memories from my childhood of those efforts, being up late with Amy, a blanket around us and finished bowls of ice cream on the coffee table, a scary movie in the beta player when Carol came in wearing her costume, giving us a smile that was too ordinary and normal to be anything but a cover-up for the fact that things weren't okay. I grabbed a shirt from Crystal's closet and paused on seeing a sweater hanging up. Not my style, but it looked like it hadn't been worn yet, and it looked a damn sight like it was going to be left behind. It was zip-up, which I knew Crystal had her knee-jerk reactions to, with zipper tags, zipper and the brand name button at the collar all in blued brass. The fabric transitioned in a smoky pattern from red to black, from left shoulder to right waist. It was a lot, but it was a lot in a striking way that a superheroine in her known civilian identity could get away with. I wore my own jeans, pausing to investigate my cramping foot before pulling on socks, then made my way to the kitchen, walking just enough that it wasn't too apparent I was flying. I put it on, then set about braiding my wet hair. I made my way to the kitchen, watched my mom for a minute while I finished the loose braid. Her process of going about making breakfast was just a bit slower, a bit more measured out. I pushed up the sleeves and began helping out my mom with the prep, pouring out the coffee. How are you doing? I asked. Honest assessment. Managing, my mother said. Everything's fine if I concentrate. I'm sorry, you know. I know, 
I raised you. I know you. I'll recover. Don't worry. I remember what I'd seen of my mom and Crystal, my mom not being able to prepare dinner. Don't push yourself too hard. Save some energy for later in the day. No, my mother said. No? I'll push myself to the limit. Reach the point where I feel like I have nothing to spare. Then find a way to dig deeper. She cracked some eggs, putting them in the frying pan, for Crystal and herself. In another pan, English muffins were lying face down in a little bit of butter alongside some mystery meat patties that were frying up. The pan had warped a bit because Crystal had a habit of rushing the heating up of the pans by lasering them, which concentrated too much heat in one place. My mom used the fact the pan naturally tilted to manage the way the butter and meat juice pooled. I cut the lettuce. We wrapped up. Bit of mustard, bit of lettuce, meat patties, egg for Crystal and Mom, toasted English muffins, coffee in industrial-sized travel mugs with lids, like I imagined truckers using. The fact my mom used the travel mugs was maybe the first real tell she had given me about where she was at emotionally since she'd broken down in tears. Crystal floated in. Holy hell, is that sweater mine? It looks great. I turned to face her, eyebrows raised. Oh, zipper front. Huh. Now I remember it. You got it for your birthday, I commented. One of a few things. I remember now, she said. From me. She had the decency to look embarrassed. To be fair, that looks way better when worn than it did hanging in my closet. You could have taken my word for it, I said, looking over my shoulder. I studied her expression. Do you want to wear it? Red's more my color than yours anyway, Crystal said, dodging the thrust of what I was saying. That's not an I didn't even try on the sweater you gave me for my birthday apology. It's as good as you're going to get. You're on probation and you're technically in my custody. I can give you orders, can't I? I pulled off the sweater, passing it to Crystal with a roll of my eyes. She wasn't trying to be nice either. I see, she said. The fabric and texture change a bit when it's stretched out. Which you'd know if you actually tried it on, I called back as I was already halfway to her closet. Everything close to normal. Pretend normal, like the conversation last night hadn't happened. In her closet, there was a bulkier black sweater with a deep groove to the fabric and a hood built in. It had been my first choice to wear, but I'd wanted to make a point with the abandoned birthday present. I reached out and, on impulse, activated my force field. The wretch struck the doorframe of the closet. It was loud, considering the otherwise quiet morning. Vic? Crystal called out. It's fine, I called back. Focus, I thought. Focus without focusing. Calm. We pulled the sweater from the hanger, lifted it up, and I caught it as I dismissed the force field. Clothes had a way of being armor. Walls erected between skin that was made of stray animals, bugs, and rodents, and the outside world where monsters lurked. I had actual armor now, and it wasn't what Weld had helped me make for my costume. It wasn't quite perfect, and it was bound up in a whole lot of negative emotion. But it was armor. Which let clothes be more like actual clothes. I pulled on the sweater and felt its plush warmth against me, hugging my arms around my body. Good. You ready? Crystal called over. Just about, I said. I rejoined them. My mom was already ready with the three travel mugs of coffee with lids, and with three sandwiches wrapped in paper towels, each with a little marking on the folded corner of the paper towel that stuck out. The brandish icon, the laser dream icon, and a star with five prongs sticking out the top. Which was a hilarious way of marking something, no egg. Find something? Crystal asked, trying to find her shoes in the mess of footwear she hadn't packed up. She didn't even walk half the time. I think I found something, yeah, I decided. I gave her a look. Ready? No, Crystal said, unnecessarily. One look told me she wasn't.
There were easily a hundred heroes in the warden's headquarters at ass crack o'clock in the morning, on their way to and from various missions, just like the one my team had gone out for yesterday, controlling villains, getting them to stand down, trying to reduce power uses. There were people who could enter a room, and everyone would stop talking, or the tone of conversation at the very least would shift. Chevalier, legend, narwhal, dragon. There were people who had impacted world-scale events who didn't quite have that presence or clout. I was pretty sure Tattletail was one such person. Some of those people had become what they'd become because the PRT had helped make them into icons had taken the virtues these capes represented and sold them hard. They'd made it subliminal and liminal, marketed it to kids and the elderly, and made things like strength, courage, nobility, caring, honesty, and justice, things that happened to go hand in hand with the heroes appearing. The PRT had boosted social media that sold these principles and the presence of these capes, and had provided deft answers for anything that appeared to hurt these notions. Not that these guys were the type to make those kinds of mistakes. There were capes who'd come close to being big but didn't have the underlying character. Bastion sprung to mind in the time before his death. There was another case, though. Another type. Eidolon, by all accounts, hadn't had that underlying character. A lot of people had instinctively disliked him, even. People reported coming away from a meeting with Legend feeling like they wanted to be better for the next meeting. They had reported coming away from meetings with Alexandria feeling like they'd better be better or else they'd be seeing her again. Sometimes there would be a smile on their faces as they joked. Sometimes not. The joke was sour to even think about now, when it had been reported her downward turn and violent tendencies had been partially because of Seamorg's interference. But. Eidolon? They came away from meetings with Eidolon feeling like they'd never be good enough, not wanting to see him again. In some of the files I'd been given in the big file dump I'd negotiated for, I'd read that a lot of people with sensitive or shaky powers had felt like their powers didn't like Eidolon. Anecdotal evidence said Scion hadn't, even. Thing was, dislike or no, However instinctual or proud or resentful that dislike was, one couldn't hold on to that after that one video of Eidolon holding a bridge up during a disaster, too preoccupied to stop a building from falling down nearby, then shore up the bridge, reverse time to save the building and its occupants, shore up the building, and move on like it was fucking nothing. Didn't watch Eidolon taking one shot to execute a supervillain the king's men had been trying to keep occupied for an hour, not three seconds after appearing on the scene. Most of that had been early in his career, but it counted. He wore the deeds like some wore capes. Dislike or no, you knew if the man was in the fucking building. My mother and I were aware of something on that scale. Crystal too preoccupied to be immediately aware. People left one hallway, glancing behind them. They made comments to people in passing. My mother touched Crystal's arm, indicating. Crystal Clear emerged from the crowd, and some of those eyes followed him. It wasn't Crystal Clear drawing the fuss, though, obviously. He was just the messenger. We met him halfway to get the message. This way, he said. How are you doing, Clear? Crystal asked. I hear you're doing pretty well. Wardens like you. Foresight likes you. I keep hearing your name and thinking people are wanting to make sure I'm paying attention. Crystal Clear rubbed the quartz-like chunks that jutted from his head, smiling. Sorry, Laser Dream. It's all right. We wove between the groups and individuals of the crowd. I was noticing, and this was a relatively minor thing, but capes were really bad at getting out of the fucking way when it came to foot traffic. Like the sidewalk situation where the six-foot-tall guy in a suit seemed to expect people to get out of his way, talking on the phone and not making eye contact, like he got a fucking half-chub from the minuscule power trip. Except here, it was a good one in three, and sometimes included the teenagers who didn't even come up to my collarbone in height. I helped my mother a bit, steadying her. I was tempted to fly over, but I was supposed to be avoiding any of my power use while they were evaluating me. You, uh, you nervous? 
Clear asked. Really nervous, terrified. Do you have any advice? What to expect? We're having a lot of these meetings, because we're thinking this is going to be an all-hands-on-deck thing. Based on what I've seen, read with my power, and heard, keep expectations low. Okay, my cousin said, looking like she was going to say something else. She didn't, letting the word trail off. We walked through a bit more of the crowd. Thanks, she said instead. Here, he opened the door. Valkyrie. That presence that had turned heads when she hadn't even been in the room was at the far end. Wings that could have been projections or creations of light were partially wrapped around her, hiding much of her body, and the shadows of her helmet would have hidden her eyes, but something shone within her eyes and made them apparent. She knew exactly how those shadows fell on her face as she moved her head slightly, looking up at us. Aunt Sarah sat in a chair at the end of a long table and stood as we entered. Deep purple eyes, younger, wearing a costume that was darker than her old New Wave one, but it was clearly inspired by it. The starburst icon at her chest had lines that extended out from the icon and around her body, but the lines had more flair to them, and the starburst icon was framed by two faint wings. I'm not sure what Crystal Clear told you. Valkyrie spoke with more than one voice. The voices that weren't hers had an echo quality to them. I have been going to some effort to bring back some of those lost in Gold Morning. The Wardens wanted their families and teammates to meet them and acclimatize to things before they started appearing in a more active capacity. You don't ask the families for permission? My mother asked. I ask them, Valkyrie replied in her faint chorus of haunted voices, indicating Sarah. She asked me before bringing me back, Sarah confirmed. Beside me, Carol folded her arms. I didn't miss the slight movements of muscles at the corner of her jaw, the way she looked down and away, back up, clearly fighting her emotions. Those emotions weren't her being upset. The process isn't perfect, Valkyrie warned. Victoria forewarned us, my mother said. It's... The parts and memories of the person the powers were most interested in, I ventured. And then whatever that person has been able to scrounge up, rebuild, connect back to? Sarah looked like she was going to say something, looked off to the side, where whiteboards were marked with rows and columns of rectangles, some filled in with color. The notes suggested it was about refugee allocation within this base. The silence seemed to draw out attention in Crystal like she couldn't move or breathe. Sarah nodded. Yes. Crystal visibly reacted to the voice. Tension broken, a relief at hearing the voice, a bit of emotional pain at the confirmation. Valkyrie added, You're appraised. Good. Some have felt the need to castigate me, ask questions of me, say things. If you need me for any of that... She left the invitation hanging. Crystal? My mom asked. Crystal shook her head, blinking rapidly. Sarah put her arms out. No. Aunt Sarah put her arms out. Crystal flew to her, in a hug quick and fierce enough it would have bowled her over if Sarah hadn't also been able to fly. You must have other things you want or need to be doing, my mom said, a bit of emotion breaking into the otherwise professional, concise words. Don't let us keep you. Crystal was so still, hugging Aunt Sarah, like she thought anything would break the spell. Aunt Sarah stared out, and I could see the shimmer of moisture in her eyes. She reached out with a hand toward my mom, her sister. My mother put one hand on the table to steady herself as she made her way over, clasping that one hand in both of hers. Aunt Sarah's other hand pulled away from Crystal to give me a little wave, and the break in that bit of contact broke the spell in Crystal, who moved her head slightly. She went still again as the hand went back to where it was, hugging her. I could have gone over, but Aunt Sarah was my aunt. I'd already reached out, had my reunion of sorts. My mother and cousin were the ones who this reunion was for. Valkyrie walked down the length of the room on the other side of the table. She stopped next to me. Thank you, I said. I should thank you. Your team went to great lengths 
and your teammate Swansong gave her life to save me and other members of my flock. It's thanks to her that some of them were able to have their reunions today. I nodded. Did you... She didn't want me to. I nodded. I wasn't sure how to feel about that. I couldn't imagine making that decision, and yet, at the same time, I couldn't imagine handing over my whole being to be imperfectly translated. Just the thought stirred up some faint feelings of panic that could have become overwhelming feelings if I was willing to let them. How much is she... Sarah Pelham, I asked, quiet. I don't know. I would have had to know the real her to have something to measure against, Valkyrie told me. There weren't as many echoes in her voice as she said it. I nodded. It made sense. Ninety percent, maybe? Eighty percent? Seventy? I nodded again. I didn't trust my voice if I spoke. I would tend closer to ninety, now that I think about it, Valkyrie said. When I was talking to her, prior to bringing her back, I remember she talked about flying with her family. Her heroics were intertwined with her love life, her family, her work, the face she wore every day. If it's not ninety percent or more, it's going to be easier for her to get there than it has been for others. I nodded with more vigor this time. The hug had broken. They were exchanging words now. I could have gone over to talk, but it would have felt like I was intruding. I do have questions, I said. Do you have ten minutes? I do, but... Valkyrie let the last of the echoes die away. When she spoke to me, it was as a singular person. I am suspicious they have to do with what you were up to last night. Yeah. The crystal world. The guts of this alien system. If my colleagues asked what I was up to, and I told them I was encouraging what you did by giving you more answers, it wouldn't earn me any favors. It was suggested that it was either losing the favor and resources of the wardens, or keeping it but being in trouble. It sounds an awful lot like I'm getting the worst of both worlds. Valkyrie smiled behind her helmet. Only the section of her mouth beneath her nose was visible, but I could see the teeth showing the crinkle in the eyes that suggested she was closer to my mom's age than mine. I saw some other things, I said. I hesitated. You were the one that found the wardens and the people who were lost in the portal attack? Who are you interested in? she asked. Bonesaw, I said. I met her glowing eyes. Jessica Yamada. I could see there was something in how she reacted that drew a direct line between those two. My heart sank, and not because I could guess her answer. I can't give you the answers you want. It would betray confidences, as well as classified material. Jessica is around, I think. If you wanted to ask her, she might be able to tell you. Okay, I said. I couldn't even imagine having that conversation. I think you're very close to where some of us stand. It's a dangerous place when you know too much, but you don't know enough to keep yourself safe. That's why I'm asking. I'm trying to close that gap. The halting conversation on the other side of the room had become actual conversation now. Crystal was crying as she talked, not even trying to wipe away the tears now. Aunt Sarah reached out to give it a shot, and Crystal stumbled over her words. Carol rubbed Crystal's back. Valkyrie spoke up again, but it was only after my extended family had exchanged three or four questions and answers with some elaboration. I'm told Vista came back from patrol earlier. Could you find her? Bring her to the garden bridge for me, the one on the third floor? I'd use my powers, but you can understand how concerned we are about power use in fragile areas. I know her phone number, I suggested, shrugging. That works. I'll see about giving you some answers, in a way that won't breach anyone's trust. Thank you. That would be great. We're on the same side, child, she told me. Child. It did not feel like the first, second, third, or anything on the way to the tenth descriptor that I felt suited me. I'll let the wardens know Vista will temporarily be the one keeping tabs on you. 
Don't detour or they'll worry. All right, I said, still weirded out. She let herself out of the room. I let my family know I was stepping out, then made my way into the busy hallway, noting the direction Valkyrie had gone by the reactions that seemed to follow even thirty seconds to a minute after her passage. I pulled my phone out, messaging Vista. Me. Are you available? Want to meet. Valkyrie sends me. Vista. Little V. Am, kinda. If Valk sends you, then I can make myself available. Dormitories at X Teach HQ. WTF you doing talking to Valk? Me. Aunt Sarah's meeting Crystal and Carol. Vista, little V. Oh shit! Dorm room 22-9-19-20. Catch me up then. If I'm not there, wait. Won't be long. I started walking. The organization system took a bit of interpretation, but I had the general sense of it from having to find Byron's hospital room. People milled this way and that, and as I got closer to the dormitories, I saw more people in civilian clothes, including refugees. The refugees were easier to walk among, even though they were arguably the group I identified with the least. Maybe the Victoria who had been part of Patrol Block would feel more at home among them, but that had been a long time ago. But I got out of their way, they got out of mine. The urge to fly and expedite the trip was a dull itch, without being a physical pain or outright strain on my patients. I wanted so badly to experiment, to test my power, to make sure that the control I'd managed to forge wouldn't slip away from me due to hours of neglect. I wanted to do more small exercises like the clothes hanger and sweater, to figure out where I needed to be or the mental state I needed to avoid those impulsive, uncontrolled movements. But I couldn't. So... I bit my tongue and held on to the positives. That Crystal had the chance to hug her mom, or someone close enough to her mom to count. To talk to her, to ask questions. Section 22. I found row 10. Close. 22, 10, one row over, good. Then column 22, 9, 15, 22, 9, 18, I carried on down the corridor, turned right at 19. 22, 9, 19, 5. The intersection was more like an apartment building, rooms marked with their individual number code, with doors facing out. A ramp led up to the second story of dormitory rooms. The lights in the hallway had been dimmed, and a few screens along the way urged me to be quiet. Members of the latest patrol were sleeping. I found the room and knocked softly. No answer. I knocked again, a little firmer. I let myself in at the lack of a response. My eyes adjusted to the gloom, and the first thing I recognized was a poster of Gallant on the wall, which was hilarious. The second thing? Sudden movement in my peripheral vision, a yelp. And I had to restrain myself from yelping too before I turned and fled the room. Okay. Wow. Fuck. I heard Vista. Shit! I'll be right out! Her dormitory neighbor banged on the wall at the noise. I opened my mouth to reply, and words failed me. I just stayed where I was, back to the wall, door to my left, reflecting on life, the passage of time, and exercising what were now years of experience in not letting thoughts or mental images settle in my mind's eye. I'd relax, surrender the scene to the natural flow of thoughts, and refused to allow the image to be committed to memory. What felt like an interminably long, silent period of time passed. I heard laughter. Don't laugh! Vista snarled. The laughter got louder. Tristan emerged from the room. My eyebrows went up. Apparently my brother doesn't want to do the walk of shame, so he's given me my turn. He's doing better, huh? I asked, my eyebrows still raised. Vista stuck her head out the door, shoulders bare. It's not a walk of shame if we didn't do anything. How had she not pulled on something by now? Was she just sitting on her bed, facing her hands or something? Tristan laughed more. Vista slammed the sliding door in response. The neighbor banged on the wall yet again. You're okay with this? I asked. They didn't do anything, Tristan said. 
She made a pass at my brother that was awkward, but forward enough to get through his thick skull. They negotiated it with me. He's doing better, then? I asked. Yeah. If he was a one before, he's a three or four now. Not very mobile, but last night helped. I glanced at the door. Rain's dream, Tristan said, smiling. The world beyond it. And we've got cheerleaders encouraging him to put in the effort. He pulled out his phone, showing messages from Kenzie that included input from Darlene, Chicken Little, and Candy. Go get her ice cream was the latest message. I smiled. Can I talk to him? I asked. Is he okay to sit or stand or... Probably, Tristan said. He leaned back against the wall, then blurred. Byron replaced him, slumping down a bit, in part because the strength and coordination weren't all there, in part because he'd been caught. You good? I asked him, keeping my voice down for those who were sleeping. Mm, he grunted. He was naturally quiet, to the extent he didn't have to change much to account for the sleeping patrollers. There's no answer to that question that doesn't sound wrong. If I say better, it sounds like I'm being clever, and I'm worried you'd hit me. If I say I'm not feeling good, I'd be lying. He trailed off. She good? Not right this second, but yeah, Byron said. In general, I think, good. Good, I said, stern. You realize she's a friend of mine. She deserves all the good things. You hurt her. You and I aren't going to be on good terms. He nodded. I wouldn't want anything else. He looked so weary. I almost felt bad. These things the chicken tenders are telling you to do? These things, at a glance, seem good. Teasing and obviously weird stuff aside, do them. Vista doesn't seem like the type to go gaga over flowers, Byron said. Would you want flowers? I asked him. I suppose I'd be touched. There you go, I told him. He ran his hand through his hair, pushing it out of his face. Okay. Sorry, by the way. No apologies, providing everything's good. But if it's not, you're going to need big apologies, because I'm going to be pissed. Got it, Byron said. But for what it's worth, I am sorry. I feel like she's a friend of yours. I should have asked, but I'm still not 100% there. It was early. He mumbled a bit more at the tail end of it. Why don't you swap back to Tristan? Thanks for being cool, he said. He paused. I really like her. Then he blurred out, like he couldn't even look me in the eye after admitting that last bit, running away. Tristan just smirked, enjoying himself too much. I'll get going so Vista can come out of hiding, Tristan said. And in contrast to Byron, even trying to be quiet, the pitch and volume of his voice were on the borderline of what I'd consider tolerable. You sure you're good? I asked him, stopping him before he could walk off. Absolutely sure? My brother deserves good things, Tristan said. If it's another human being being close, nothing rude, that's just human contact. It's human contact with someone I like and respect. He's willing to extend me the same allowance. We'll figure it out. I nodded. Later today, I'm seeing this guy I knew, Nate, catching up. That's great. We'll see, Tristan said. The smile dropped off his face. He disappeared after my attempted murder. Byron says he'll put in a good word, reassure Nate, but I don't think that kind of betrayal and surprise is something a guy just gets over. Good luck. Yeah, thanks, Tristan told me. He looked back at the door, then smiled again, chuckling under his breath. He left, and I waited a good minute before the door slid open. Vista didn't emerge. I ventured inside. The lights were on now. I didn't think you were close, Vista said, accusatory. She had the phone in her hand, like she was trying to decipher the texts and figure out how things had come to this. What? You said Photon Mom was seeing your family, not your family seeing her. So I thought you were somewhere else. You'd have to travel here, and you can't fly because you got in trouble, right? We were in the conference room near the main lobby. Fuck, Vista said. I'm so humiliated. I thought there'd be time to sleep in another ten minutes, take him back to his dorm room while chatting with Tristan, come back and meet you. I knocked, twice. They knock constantly, 
whenever they're trying to round some of us up for an errand. The person next door thumped. Let's go, she said, quieter. Coat, I pointed out. We're going outside, garden balcony, third floor. She got her coat, bulky and covered in patches. It made me think of Rachel Lint a bit. What was the terrible pickup line you used? I asked. We can't forget this whole episode happened, Vista asked. Just making conversation, I told her. I'm backing you two. I know, I heard some of that. Thank you for telling him to get me flowers. That's the sort of thing so dumb I wouldn't know how to hint at it. I'll look forward to that. She was fidgeting a lot. I walked with my hands in my pockets. He said he really likes me, she said, quiet. Vista, who was still petite, even after growing most of the way up, who had taken up a vaguely grungy, tough look with the black eyeliner and patched jacket, looked outright bashful. You realize what I said to him about not hurting you goes for you, too? He's recovering. He's vulnerable. I know. Tristan's really helpful there. He'll tell me if I'm being dumb. I nodded. He was getting better, and they needed the hospital room. So he has a dorm room. We were talking, and I suggested, uh, my room's closer to the hospital room than his new room. And skinship, skin-to-skin -skin contact, it's apparently good for mending. Wow, I said. Wow. Didn't actually need the details. Shut up. And you did, because if I didn't tell you, you'd wonder or worry. Tristan said you were forward, but... Shut up! And it wasn't a dumb pickup line, because it worked. Tristan even said it was the right line to get through to Byron. We went to my room instead of his. We cuddled, we napped. That's all it was. Anything else has to wait until he and Tristan figure it out and Byron gets better. She was blushing and furiously trying to suppress it and hide it, messing with her wavy, dirty blonde hair by combing it with her fingers, arms up near her face, hiding most of it. But I could see that her ear was pink. Valkyrie said she'd have some answers about the weird interdimensional stuff, but I had to bring you to her or whatever, just to let you know what's what. Fill me in. What even happened last night? I filled her in. Broad strokes. The general details of what we'd done. Why? what we'd seen and done. We navigated our way down a floor, then off to the side, to the garden balcony, which was an extended ramp that stood out from the side of the building with a number of planters that had bushes, trees, and flower beds on it. It was covered more in frost than snow, the plant life withering in the cold. Vista pulled on the coat she'd had under one arm. Valkyrie wasn't there. Two others were. I belatedly connected to what Valkyrie had intended when she'd said she'd wanted Vista. She was still arranging the meetings. Dennis's red hair didn't move in the wind, and there was a faint lensing at the very edges of his face, like they might at the corner of a chandelier, except more dark than light. He wore a coat over a gray costume with clock faces worked into it, Valkyrie's wings at the clock predominant at the chest. Chris, Kid Win Chris, had hair that was more gold than blonde, and definitely not brown. There were more changes than I'd seen on either Aunt Sarah or Dennis, and I had no idea if he'd added cyborg parts or if he'd just come across that way. The back of his neck, the ridges of his ears, and his eyes all looked more like technology than flesh. Vista barely flinched. No shit, Dennis asked. What did you do, Missy? Went and grew up on us. Vista snorted. You went and died on us. Much ruder. Dennis smiled. He looked at me. You've barely changed. You hardly know, I told him. I'm glad you're better, Kid Wynn said. His voice was deeper than I remembered it. I assumed it was because two years had passed before he'd died, more than anything about his current body. I shrugged. You don't seem surprised, Kid Wynn told Vista. He indicated me. She does, a bit. I get it. We look weird. A bit surprised, I said. And you don't look that weird. I looked you up, Vista said, jamming her hands in her pockets. Came to terms with it. Figured your... whatever Valkyrie is. She'd introduce us when the time was right. Look at you, Dennis said. I can't get over it. I remember when you didn't even have all your adult teeth. Now you're... grown. Kind of. Vista glanced at me, like she thought I'd say something. I pursed my lips together. 
grown enough to chuck you off this ledge. I've mourned you once, I can do it again. You're a lieutenant to one of the top wardens or something? Narwhal. Sometimes Cineral. That's crazy, Dennis exclaimed. He took her by the shoulders and shook her. Crazy! You do realize that? Yeah. Congratulations, Kid Wynn, who wasn't even a kid anymore, told her. Thanks, Vista said. Something in her seemed to relax. My parents never even congratulated me. I don't think they even really get it. Still living with the parents? Dennis asked. At least... He stopped as Vista shook her head. You're living out on your own? Dormitory now, but basically. The whole world went and moved on, huh? Dennis asked. That's what happens when you die, you fucking moron, Vista told him. You're a lot more abusive than I remember. You guys left me all alone, Vista shrugged as she said it, like it was a passing comment. You deserve the abuse. Well, Dennis replied, a full one-word statement. Couldn't really help it. The mutated hair looks cool, at least, Vista said. I bet it's a pain in the ass. You have no idea, Dennis said, touching hair that might as well have been time-stopped. It was so unmoving. I can't wear my usual style of helmet. But that's enough about me and creepy changes. Let's talk about you. Catch up. You can explain this whole punk, grunge, angry little Vista. Little? Vista asked, arch. And angry, see? Angry enough to toss you off the ledge. I'm not even kidding. I'm still so mad you went and died on us. Couldn't help it. The world ended. I managed it. You're ridiculously powerful, Dennis protested. He looked at me. Please tell me that our little Vista found a gallant to use as a release valve. Vista puffed up, pink touching her face and ears again. She shot me a glare, daring me to comment. You do! That's amazing! Who? I backed off, staying where I could fly after Dennis if she really did toss him. Kid Wynn approached me. Was he like that, around Gold Morning? I asked him. Kid Wynn shook his head. He was like that at different points, jokey, teasing, on the battlefield, when on the defensive. Yeah, I remember a bit of that. The back and forth between Vista and Dennis went on. You're quiet, I said. I know that's a dick thing to say, but I'm not very me, not whole, he admitted. Not yet. I won't hold it against you. Thanks, he told me. We watched the arguing continue. Valkyrie said you wanted details? Do you have details? About the agent's territory? The crystal landscapes? Some, kind of. We've been... talking about stuff. Doing some training, digging into memories, experiences, stuff from when we were gone. I nodded. She figures we're going to have to be prepared to fight on that level, or at least deal with things on that level. We. That we felt different. Yes, we are, I silently agreed. I wondered if my agent heard me, the wretch. Tell me what you can, I told him. Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 3 Where the hell do I even start? Kidwin asked. I never was much of a teacher. There used to be those school events every couple of months where the top students and most improved students would each get one-on-one -on -one hangouts with the protectorate or the wards for the day. I don't know how much attention you paid to that stuff. Little superhero-obsessed Victoria? A lot. There was actually an issue when I won the one year. I was supposed to partner with Challenger, but people thought the girl with superhero parents didn't need the experience. Kid Wynn snorted. What happened? I don't even remember Challenger. I gave up my spot. Then I went home and cried. Oh no, he said. In my defense, I was eight or nine. I remember wondering what kind of experience Armsmaster gave the kids, Kid Wynn said. He was always kind of... grumpy. 
Start out with a ride on the bikes the Protectorate had, including riding on the Forcefield Bridge out to the Island HQ. Visit the workshop with what I have to imagine was a gruff, Don't touch anything, I don't say to. Trying out a bunch of Tinkertech gadgets. Then patrol with another member of the team pre-clearing the route. Maybe a crisis point if the kid was old enough and the situation minor enough. Almost always the same formula and routine. But he was good at executing that. Huh. I think they were very selective with who they sent his way. Kids they thought he could get to. Serious kids. I have no idea what selection process they used for me. Probably that clock would be a bad influence. Aegis and Shadowstalker were jocks, I think. Gallant was more sensitive. I looked off to the side. Which I'm not. It's fine. You were saying? Kid Wynn looked at Vista, who had settled down and sat on a box enclosing a bush of what looked like Holly talking to Dennis. He dropped his eyes back to the ground. His eyes were strange, and the way he held himself now, he didn't embrace the strange. There was a focus to him that I didn't remember him having, but a new weakness, too, because he wouldn't meet my eyes and seemed to keep looking down or away, maybe because he was embarrassed of how he looked. I saw some red-tinted sunglasses in one of his coat-breast pockets, but he didn't wear them here. How much did he change if he had them on? Would he more or less look into my eyes? He answered me. I think they picked the kids for Vista's sake instead of picking Vista for the kids' sake. And I got the leftovers, a lot of the weird kids. I smiled. The fact you figured out there was a sorting system means you were capable of seeing what the weird kids needed. I don't know, Kidwin told me. I wasn't very good at it. I had the impression Pigot or Armsmaster or Miss Militia wanted to cultivate something in me for leadership or whatever. But then the leadership changed around, or the city changed, and expectations changed with it. Nobody ever had the chance to follow through. Now Valkyries asked me to do this thing, and I don't know how. Well, you're kind of touching on it, I said. The wind had changed direction, so I pulled up the hood of the plush black sweater, where the material of the hood felt like it was an inch and a half thick. So you remember all that stuff? I think because it's superhero adjacent. But you don't consider yourself very... you? He shook his head. I want to know who and what we're up against. I want to know who and what I'm working with. If you're... closer to the agents? Is that a sore point or touchy subject? More for clock than it is for me, Kidwin said. Let me know if I get insensitive, I told him. What filters through? What doesn't? What matters? Give me a starting point? Day-to-day. Day-to-day activities? I remember daydreaming about tinker stuff in class, the stress of not doing well in my classes. Actual time at school is a haze, but here and there I had some good ideas or epiphanies, and I can remember those. I can relate back to the school stuff that I used to inspire tinker work. So you don't remember, say, math class? The old me didn't think of math class as anything except a constant feeling like I was struggling to tread water with weights tied to my ankles. But you remember that feeling? Oh, yeah. Is it mostly negative? I asked. What about good memories? Hazy recollections of returning to the base after a fight we did okay in. Camaraderie. Being promoted. Legend complimenting me. That one's sharper. Are those all when you were around more parahumans? Stronger parahumans? If you're trying to gauge by that, well, Vista kind of skews the results. She was one of the strongest wards, and she was around a lot of the time. I nodded. Fair, good point. And no, some of the hazy good memory is around family. We did this one, um, it was a crisis point. No powers involved, but they sent me, Gallant, and Battery to talk to this woman who had been attacked. We were supposed to make sure she was okay, show our faces, give support, and make sure no powers were involved. Not pretty, but a bit of a softball for two teenage guys and experienced hero, right? Sure. It wasn't a softball. She was psychotic, vulnerable, broken. People with mental illnesses get preyed on more than they prey on others, and she said a whole bunch of stuff. Got to Gallant, feeling what she felt. Got to me, hearing the things she said, wrestling with what I was wrestling with at the same time. 
Really scary. Really sad. This is a happy memory? I asked. I could remember Gallant bringing that scene up back then. I hadn't known Kid Wynn had been there. That sounds horrible. I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, so I was pretty shaken. Battery ended our night early. She said she'd do the paperwork. I called home for a ride, and I didn't sound okay. I was feeling rock-bottom worthless, scared, and felt a bit like there was no future. I couldn't shake the idea that ending up where she was right then would be far more likely than being okay or living a normal life. I nodded. An unexpected hit straight to a weak spot at the worst time. Yup. So my dad picked me up. I freak out a bit in the car on the drive home. We get back to the house, and we talk. Maybe for the first time in my life, my dad was a support, talked to me like an adult when I started the conversation feeling like such a kid. We talked until it was ridiculously late. I vented about some of the stuff that was getting to me, school stuff. He offered me a beer, and I said no, and he accepted that. That's just the kind of guy he was, the beer thing. He took off work the next day, I took off school. We slept in, went out for lunch at a pub and played pool, we went to an arcade and he showed me his pinball skills, then I went to the HQ for my evening shift. I was a little bit surprised by the strength of my emotional reaction to the little story, especially the late night talk he described. I blinked a few times in rapid succession. That stuck, huh? Gets a little hazy towards the middle of that day off. What's your line of thinking? Is it negativity adjacent? I asked. What stays? What goes? Why? What can we pull out? What can we focus on? How does it connect to what we already know of powers? They fluctuate when we're in certain mental states. Can we use new knowledge to control that fluctuation? Kid Wynn nodded, but I could see the slight changes in his expression. Tiny creases, small tensions. I went on. I ask because last night I found a new connection to my power, one I want to hold on to, and if I need to, I want to be able to intuit and deal with other powers, including any situations resembling last night, or could be it matters for what the thinkers say is coming today. Ah, Kidwin replied. Off to the side, not quite in earshot, Dennis said something and Vista had a giggle fit. This okay? I asked Kidwin. I don't feel as much like an experiment under the microscope if you're using it for yourself. Using a good part of it for myself. Using more of it to just figure out how this all works. Last night, I was in the midst of it all. Earlier in this conversation, I used the term... What was it? Negativity adjacent? Sure, I think so. I'm thinking a lot about what's next to what, how it all maps together. I had glimpses last night, and I'm still digesting that. I don't know if it's like looking at a lot of fine art or listening to a lot of music and getting an intuitive sense of things, but I leaned pretty heavily into intuition when I became... I trailed off, not quite sure about the words I was grasping for. The greater connection to your power? He guessed. More like I became Victoria adjacent. Twice. I was horribly burned. I found a different facet of me inside that vast program of alien biology, and then I was fine. I threw myself off a cliff, and I just about died on landing, except I shifted to another facet of me. You might be more experienced with this stuff than I am, Kidwin said. Might be, I said. But Valkyrie's been training you guys in this? Talking to you about it? Having us meditate, having us pay close attention to our powers and what they're telling us. Easier for some than others. I don't know how long you've been back, but I've been more or less wrestling with this for the last... four hours, it seems. I'm pretty sure you've had more time to digest it. Dennis and Vista had stopped chatting and gravitated closer. I was aware they were listening now. You said you became Victoria adjacent. Which isn't even the right way of putting it. It's like if Victoria lives at 343 Tower Crescent Avenue, and Glory Girl lives at 342, and Antares lives at 345, and there are connections tying one to the other. I'm still me, but the center of who I am is living at a different address. Antares went to that place you describe. 
Kidwin said. You said you changed twice using the language of that place? Language? How would you put it? Physics, superpositioning, reflections, facets? I'm so glad I missed the first half of this conversation, Dennis commented. Shh! Vista shushed him. Kid Wynn barely seemed to notice them as he thought about what I'd said. Sure, works. Question is, is the Victoria who went in the same Victoria who left? I had to think about it, considering who I was and the various aspects of that place. Did I feel different? Yes, but not because of that. Up until I entered that room, I didn't have control, and a huge aspect of this world felt massive, untouchable, out of reach. I saw a broken trigger where a man described being a small figure at the mouth of a volcano. You can't beat the volcano. It swallows you up and you have no chance. And sometimes it's the next person's volcano. I'm sorry I didn't visit you, Vista said. After... I shook my head. You have control now? Dennis asked me. I think so, I answered. I thought about it some more. Yeah. Part of what motivated me to go there last night... Interrupting, Kid Wynn said, rushing the word, holding up a hand. I paused. Whatever you say to us is going to be repeated to Valkyrie, he said. Full disclosure. Valkyrie might be ticked you said that, Dennis pointed out. In the moment, he seemed more the somber, almost morose Dennis I'd known. Let her, Kid Wynn answered. I'm fine, I said. I wanted to ask her questions. Now I'm asking you, and if you're her proxy, same end result. I don't want to betray your friendship with us or the people we used to be, Kid Wynn told me. I nodded, taking that in. How much of my openness was that? How much was I willing to tell Valkyrie? I wanted to think I'd be open, trust that she might be the most accessible parahuman to me who knew this world, but would I change what I said in the face of the small changes in expression? The particular word choice? You're a good guy, Christopher, Vista said. Mm, I don't think I am, but thanks. Why don't you think you are? Vista asked. You've been a hero as long as I've known you. You're here and you're being friendly even though it means potentially upsetting the boss. The only dick move you'd pulled was dying on me. We couldn't help it. Dennis said automatically. Vista snorted. I'm not saying I'm not good, Kidwin said. I'm saying I'm not sure I'm a guy. Human. Humans have childhood memories. One experience layered onto another, with things emerging from that. What are you now? Vista asked, quiet. An end result. A fabrication. The only lasting impressions from the past are the essential ones that made me into me. I thought about that. The wind picked up. I turned my head so the hood would protect me where it was colder. Vista hunkered down a bit, and Dennis took a step to the side so the breadth of his upper body blocked the wind for her. I feel the same way, I think, I ventured, not sure of what I was saying as I said it. I feel like the bad days left their disproportionately deep marks in me and who I am today. Too many days of the past few years are a haze. I'm not going to say it compares, but I don't think we're that far apart. I was talking about my dad earlier, Kidwin told me. That one good day? I'm supposed to meet him later, you know, but I don't have all of the memories of him. I, I don't remember his face. I don't remember his voice. Whatever part of me he was trying to support or hold on to that day, I don't think it's there. You can salvage it, Dennis said. All the data's there, except... Sorted differently, I said. Something else's filing system. Something else's priorities. Yeah. Eyes in a tinted red metal glanced downward, pupils a gold light that emanated from the inside of the orb, the tracery of etchings around the pupil bearing a similar effect. I'm sorry, Christopher, I said. I hope it works out okay and that he's understanding, and that it's mostly painless... If nothing else, I can't imagine he won't be happy to have you back. A part of me, Kid Wynn said. And I don't hope it's painless. Painless means I'm not human enough to care. 
I saw Dennis nod a bit. Point conceded, I said. Sorry about comparing us. That's pretty damn heavy. I'm not looking for concessions, Kidwin said. I don't want to make this a competition. I think we've all had to deal with heavy. Dying and coming back, Dennis said. Dealing with everyone else dying, and... He stopped as he looked at me. Family stuff. Family stuff. Yeah. He said, wrinkling his nose, snorting a bit. It was meant as a deflection, a little joking acknowledgement, but it felt like a profoundly sad moment because it wasn't how the Dennis I knew would have responded. I resisted the urge to look at Vista to see how she'd taken it. She'd talked to him long enough to pick up on it, and she'd known him far better than I had. That family stuff? I spoke up. It gets into the control I was talking about. Having the tools. Having the knowledge to tackle all of this. My entire family consists of control freaks and people who have no control, who got swept up in life and powers and everything else. Ugh, Vista made a sound. I can guess your mom's the control freak. Your dad's swept up. Amy's swept up. Crystal's swept up, I said. Distinction being that they're not totally helpless. They do have choices. Crystal made good choices. My dad's making pretty neutral ones, or non-choices. And, for the record, I'd say my Uncle Mike is a control freak. Strict lines and rules. Family disappoints, betrays, or seems problematic. He cuts contact. That's present tense. He's still around? Vista asked. Alive. Retired from the cape life, yeah. Cool. Given the choice of control versus derailment, I want the control. I will fight for the control, because it feels like it's a choice between being greedy for that control and having none at all. Not just for me, not just for my family. So, I want to move on to asking questions about getting that control, as far as this whole thing goes. I saw Kid Wynn and Dennis exchange glances. Is this control motivation why you went where you did last night? Vista asked. I shrugged. Does it mean you're going back? Vista asked, quieter. If the wardens allow it. If I go back, it'll be on terms that help the wardens and help this city, and I think we have to be ready to handle that stuff. That stance won't win you any brownie points with the warden leadership, Dennis said. No, I replied. I glanced at Vista, who looked noncommittal but serious. But it'll work for Valkyrie, probably. Good to know, I said. I was tense, even hearing the answer I'd been kind of hoping to get to. If Breakthrough continued on this course, we wouldn't be entirely alone. Vista abruptly turned, walking away. There wasn't any snow, but there was a lot of wind. We were on the third floor of the base, but considering the scale of the building, each floor had areas with ceilings high enough that buildings could fit within. Vista walked up to the edge of the balcony, which had guardrails for the vehicles that might travel up and down it in different circumstances. Do you know why she... I started. The boys didn't know. Clear enough on their faces. I'll be back, I told them. I walked over to where Missy was, head ducked down so less of her neck was exposed to the cold, wearing her patched jacket, a sweater so dark a blue it was nearly black that looked like it was cut to show off her shoulders and rugged, forest-green pants with boots. A stark contrast to the light, airy look she had as Vista. She leaned against the railing facing me, watching as I made my approach. The wind blew wavy blonde-brown hair across her face, and she didn't push it out of the way, instead bringing her hand up to her ear, covering it. This okay? I asked. Me coming over? Little V? Sure, big V. Her expression cracked slightly, a faint smile. I made my way over, leaning against the same railing she did. You walked away all of a sudden. I wasn't sure. I'm still not sure if you want space, I said. You coming over is better than the alternative, Vista said. What's the alternative? I asked. You staying over there? Okay, I said. Dennis is weird, she said. A bit. They're both different. But Dennis in particular. Christopher is. He says he doesn't remember everything. 
He looked at me when I first walked up, and it was like he was looking at me and trying to remember the particulars, and maybe he failed because he looked embarrassed when he saw I saw him looking. He doesn't remember his dad. He's quieter, more introspective, but he's... He feels like someone who could fill in the gaps and become the Christopher I knew. Yeah, I get that. Could be the tinker power is always running, so it picked up a good grounding from a lot of different places and times. Dennis is weird. The inner voice that he had, that looked at this fucked up world of ours and laughed at it and called attention to it, that started everything by questioning the situations we were in, being skeptical of people until they proved themselves, that's his outer voice now. And his old outer voice, that was cynical and frustrated because he asked those questions, he challenged and he adapted, he got hurt and tired and heartbroken, that's the inner voice now. Like there's something dejected but stubborn at the core of it all, and that's where the jokey quips and skepticism come from now. I remembered what she'd said about Christopher, what she wasn't elaborating on with Dennis. Makes you feel like he might not make his way back to being the Dennis you knew? Vista shrugged. Feels like it. But who knows? Maybe they're talking among themselves and Dennis is telling Chris how little Missy is different, that I'm bitter, I'm pricklier, I'm more arrogant, I don't know. People change. I think that happens. But from where I stand, first of all, I think you're great. I can't imagine them bad-mouthing you. You're too cool for that. Psh. I don't know of a single person that doesn't like you. Rachel Lint likes you. But I'm different. Yeah, I said. I inhaled. We all are. Sucks. In its way. But I'm optimistic when it comes to Dennis. I've seen the way things are laid out, how things are set up, the information stores they have, the way they store every detail of our lives, sorting it. Creepy. Yeah. But comprehensive in the midst of that creepiness. The individual pieces are all still there. Give him time to sort it out. Vista was very still, staring at a point in the wall above the boys. I might have thought she was using her powers, but we were supposed to avoid powers in this building, which was a bit different from Breakthrough being under a general restriction. That, and there was no reason for her to use them. She didn't seem very reassured, or even like she was listening. I waited because I couldn't think of a way to speak up or approach her that wouldn't make me sound uncannily like my mom. There was a nervous energy to how the boys interacted. Kid Wynn stretched and couldn't stand in one place for long. Dennis talked. Both avoided looking our way. We're facing the end of the city, possibly with greater ramifications. We're ill-equipped. They know it. They're bearing that burden. I've worked damn hard. I looked in Vista's direction. I meditated, practiced with my power, pushed it to the limit. I did everything the power testers said could make you stronger or more in tune with your ability. It wasn't just power, either. I hit the gym three times a week. I go out for walks. The bosses need a volunteer. I put my hand up. Burns you out, I said. I don't burn out, Vista said. I got into this early, you know. It's part of how I think. It's part of how I move. I wake up in the morning, and I'm up. Force of habit since I was ten. Girls my age went to dance class or soccer, or they slept in and grumbled. I was finding things to do because home sucked. So I'd train. I'd read up on stuff. Then I was doing it because I had a crush on this guy I knew was too old for me, and I wanted to impress him. Then I was doubling down on it because I had teammates, and I didn't want to be treated like a kid. Then I tripled down on it. Could you stop if you had to? I asked. Or is it that ingrained by now? Ingrained. As much a part of me as those mountains on the horizon are a part of this place. Do you know why I was working that hard toward the end? To make up for the ones who were gone, to ensure you wouldn't lose more. Vista sighed. I've treated you to this rant before, huh? Less of a rant, more of an idle thought. But you mentioned it, asked me questions. I still lost the people. Now I'm here. I almost let myself think the added power and physical training would count for something. And now you're talking about a completely different playing field. I shook my head. No, Missy. That training matters. 
the connection to your agent is something you've developed, and it 100% applies. The physical training is your connection to you. You feel far away, Big V. Like you're more with them than you're with me, and you were getting more distant by the second. Ah, so that was it. Come with, I offered. I meant what I said. If this stuff ends up mattering, that work you've done will put you head, shoulders, and tail above the rest. Can't. Made myself too essential to too many people. It's not necessarily one or the other. It might be. Vic, they were talking about reporting to their bosses. I've got to report to mine. What do I even say? That you seem eager to dive into this? That I don't know if you'll ignore orders? The truth. That I think this is pretty darn important. I have questions I want to ask those guys, and I want to piece together some of the puzzle. Important? Do you mean essential? Important feels like too weak a word, and if it's essential, it implies you're willing to break the rules to go do what you did last night again. And if you keep that up, one of the handful of people who I knew before gold morning and like might disappear. I might feel like I'm obligated as a warden to report it, and I really don't want to do that as a friend. She stared down at the ground, lips pressed together, and I was reminded of the girl who'd disappeared around the time Dean had introduced me to his team as his girlfriend, to get a handle on her emotions where nobody would see. And then she'd marched back, expression controlled, and looked me in the eye. Right now, she couldn't bring herself to look at me, but she had that exact same fierceness combined with the apparent resentment at having to be fierce. Even then, she'd been working so damn hard to work at becoming a stronger, better person. Now, if it weren't for a neutered media apparatus, or if we were back in 2013 without the end of the world on the horizon, I could believe she'd be one of those capes who could alter the state of conversation in a room just by being there. And I was disappointing her. Not essential. Inevitable, I told her, quiet. She looked up at me, gaze level. I don't need to break rules because I think this is coming no matter what we do. It's happening no matter what we do. So I don't need to rush it. It's coming. A breaking down of the walls? They're coming through to us, is what the leadership says. A breaking down of everything, I told her. They are us, at least in part. They're rooted throughout the city. There isn't anything that isn't touched by them. They're here. We need to figure out how to deal with them. Vista heaved out a sigh. Do you think I'm wrong? I asked her. No, I wish I could. You should go talk to them, get the answers you wanted. Come with. You don't have to betray your bosses and mentors to come and listen, and you can tell them everything we've talked about. I only realized after saying it that Vista might have wanted to hang back for the same reason she'd stepped away after Gallant had introduced me to the wards. It was too late to take back my offer. I need a promise, she said. Don't leave. Wasn't planning on it. Don't get so far away or disconnect so much in this whole complicated mess that I don't see you again. I've got people to look after, I told her. Jessica Yamada asked me to look after them. I'm still working on that. I have no plans to go anywhere. You stay, Victoria Dallin. You don't dive so deep into the waters that you emerge out the other side and the inside parts of you are out and the outside parts of you are in. Dennis is going to be okay, Missy. I really believe it. She gave me a glare of a look, a warning. I promise. At the end of this all, you can call me Big V and I'll call you Little V. She didn't look convinced. It's part of what I'm after. I mentioned the volcano. I want to work around it, use it, without losing myself to it. Everything I'm doing right now is to avoid losing to this phenomenal force we're up against. I want control of myself and of things in my reach. I don't want to be Mark or even Crystal, though I think Crystal might be a little less disorganized and lost after today. We'll see. Will we, though? Vista asked. I don't want to be Amy, I said. I don't want to be Amy's monster, either. In the report, I only glanced over it. They said you destroyed Teacher's Crystal, and it was dangerous? I'm pretty sure it was safe. The entire thing was reckless. 
Then aren't you contradicting yourself? Vista asked, hostile now. Not doing anything felt more reckless. If Teacher had won, and he was about to, we might have lost control of everything, forever. Vista nodded. She cracked her knuckles. I watched her. Saw her nod. We good? I asked again. We're good. 99% of everything else is kind of balls. Vista smiled at me, but behind that smile was that faint, vaguely resentful expression. A smile for me, resentment for everything else. Yeah, I agreed. Hold on to that one percent that isn't, then. I was, she muttered, until you barged into my room way fucking earlier than I expected. I smiled. She looked up at me and smiled a bit, too. Not quite so resentful. I was a bit jealous that she had something that could alleviate the pressure, distract, and give her a release valve, as Clockblocker had put it. The boys were sitting on the same planter box when we rejoined them. Kid Wynn had a tool in his hand and was working on something that he'd perched on his knee. He looked up and smiled. All good? Yeah, Vista said. Some background stuff. Where were we? Kid Wynn asked. What stays, what goes, communication, I said. Valkyrie said she talked to you before bringing you back to life. I barely remember, Dennis said. I remember the conversation, vaguely. She asked for details about who I was, and I had the impression she saw, but she asked, too, and it mattered that I told the truth. Did anything else communicate with you? I asked. Teacher had control over agents in there. I'm not sure if he's in a state to report on what he was doing now. We talked to one another. Our agents did, too. It'd be like being sent as a messenger, bringing over a share of myself, my memories. Like flashes of lightning? I asked. Yeah, that works. Some were more talkative than others. There'd be stuff like Kid Wynn. His agent would reach out to me to verify details or see them from another side, everything forming a giant web. When someone triggered, it'd reach out to everything, Kid Wynn said. Good, okay, I said. My head's spinning and I'm not seeing where this is going, Vista admitted. I want to open lines of communication, I said. I kind of did, last night. I called for help, and the r m my agent answered. And you said you have more control, Kidwin said. I want that for everyone, I said. Everyone on our side. Can you tell me anything that would help? Ways to close the communication gap so we can reach out? The boys exchanged looks. What? I asked. Equipping you with some more general information and filling in the blanks is one thing, Kidwin said, quiet. He fixed those red eyes with glowing gold pupils on me, where he'd previously held a posture like he didn't want to meet anyone's eyes. Giving you that kind of information would be... a lot. If that was even a thing, Dennis cut in. I didn't believe him. There was something. What can you tell me? I asked. I'm supposed to tell you that you need anchors, Clockblocker said. You need things to hold on to. Things from your past. Your family. Yourself. Fuck that, Vista said. The others are striving for control, Kidwin said. Teachers lost his thrall horde and they apparently took him prisoner, but the tools are out there. It's a question of the arrangements he made. Your sister... I winced. Kid Wynn blithely continued. She's up to something, with Lab Rat. It looks like a play for control. We haven't been briefed on the situation, but leadership looked worried. I didn't want to think about it. On so many fucking levels, I didn't want to think about it. Valkyrie is on the side of humanity, Dennis said. I hated to ask, but... How sure are we? I know you're biased, but... Kid Wynn answered me. She had access to monsters like Bakuda and Eidolon. She hasn't called them out, hasn't given them bodies. Only heroes, only the people fighting for the right causes. Vista picked up on the sentiment. I nodded to myself. Kid Wynn pulled his phone out of his pocket. He showed me. A list of letter and symbol codes, each with three lights marked beside them. Green lights most of the way down, four yellows, mostly consistent. 
A number of lights had black circles in the middle. Amy was orange. Is this tinker data? Because I can't... It's not, Vista said. She showed me her phone. The same display. Contessa, Dinah Alcott, and other thinkers are updating with their best guesses about threat levels. Green is good, I hope. Green is good. Green is saying the threat level is negligible. Icons suggest if a team is currently handling or suppressing them. Can you see the distinction between green and lime? I had to tilt the phone to view the shades in more nuance, given the ambient light. Sort of? Suppressed or temporarily handled. It's working, Vista said. What the wardens are doing is working, Kid Wynn explained. Smaller threats like Little Midas and the Machine Army are out there and not handled, but they're yellow. Your sister is the one big threat we haven't fully dealt with, and the danger she poses is getting worse over time. Holy shit, Vista said. She glanced at me. When? Last half hour, Kid Wynn said. I was tense. What the fuck, Amy? They might want you to help, Kid Wynn told me, his voice quiet if they can trust you. I stared down at the phone. When so many things seemed okay or manageable, when I finally felt like I had control, I might have to deal with the one person who could so easily make me feel like I'd never have control again? The notion made me feel vaguely nauseous. They sent refugees to her, I said. Kid Wynn nodded. And something happened in the last half hour that destroyed all trust we had in her, Classified, apparently. I was silent, digesting, interpreting. My phone buzzed in my pocket, and I almost jumped clean out of my skin. I pulled it free. Vista peeked. Narwhal. That would be it, Vista said. Speak of the devil. The devil is right, I thought. This would be about Amy. I took a few steps away before pressing the phone to my ear. We need their trust if we're going to handle this whole thing. If Breakthrough is to get together, if we'll have the resources we need, and if Valkyrie's flock is willing to divulge the tools or communication methods Clock and Wynn hinted at. Just needed her trust. Hello? What part of do not associate with other members of your team do you not understand, Antares? Norwal was pretty notoriously hard-nosed. This was apparently that. I could see Vista wincing because she could hear the tone, even though she couldn't hear the words. You'll have to refresh my memory. Capricorn. You and he were in the same place, I hear. He told me one story. I don't think I believe him. I'm hoping you'll be more convincing. I shut my eyes. What was I even supposed to say? I caught your subordinate sleeping mostly in the nude with my teammate? I thought this would be about Amy Dallin, I said, trying to deflect. In a way, it is. Capricorn just lied to me, I think. I could dig out the truth myself, but that takes time, and there are bigger things at stake today. Tell me, can we trust you? I opened my mouth, then shut it. This felt like a trap, or a trick, or a prank. No, not a prank. But it felt aggressive, and I felt off-balance, and I hated being off-balance. No, I ventured, even though I wasn't sure why. I just felt like yes was the wrong answer, and a delay would be worse than either. No? Narwhal asked. I saw Vista flinch a bit at the tone again. The thoughts connected. Tristan. Amy. Trust. I knew what Tristan had told her and what she was getting at. Master Stranger Protocols. I warned my team. He didn't lie about that, at least. Would you be willing to come upstairs, help us with the situation? We'll work on your Master Stranger issue while figuring out how to handle the situation. That... it sounded okay. I think so, I said. Your mother will be here. We'll invite your old and current therapists in to vet you. Oh. Oh, fucking great. That was three people and about ten associated individual conversations I didn't want to have waiting upstairs. Will do. I said, though the wind had gone out of my sails, and my voice felt like it lacked any strength. Bring Vista, if you're still near her. We'll want everyone ready. The thinkers think the situation will go critical tonight. We want to be ready when it does. Got it, I said. Thank you. 
she said, hanging up as she finished. Leaving me with what felt like a ringing in my ear, not from her volume, but the sheer stress that I'd taken from that phone call. Fuck! The thought lingered as I tried to gather my composure. Vista touched my arm. Stuff's happening. They want you too, I told her. Got it. We said our brief farewell to the boys. Something in Vista seemed lighter walking away from the reunion, as heavy as everything else felt. What are you doing, Amy? And why the hell does it feel, deep in my gut, like this isn't the thing we should all be worried about? Are we overlooking something or someone in that long row of green and lime green lights? Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 4 Vista's dorm room was on the way. Every person we walked by looked stressed, busy, or were trying to get out of the way of the people who were. We were the busy ones. Reaching her room, Vista stepped inside, handing me her coat and bidding me to come in. I remained in the doorway, my back to her, my hands going out and back to hold stuff or hand stuff to her as she got changed into her costume. I took note of the gallant poster again. No Vista-specific stuff on the walls, but there was an image of the Brockton Bay wards and an image of the old protectorate and the wards, each image no bigger than a sheet of paper from a printer. A postcard of the Brockton Bay's namesake bay, including the floating base a postcard of an artist's rendition of Glory Girl in a minimalist style, stuff like that. By the bed, she had a music player with headphones perched on it, and a grid of art slips from CDs and vinyls stuck to the surface with a tack. I recognized a few as ones Weld had recommended, which were amusingly ones I'd gotten because Weld had recommended them to Sveta back in the day, and she'd recommended them to me. Artists so minor that I doubted they had much traction. Or, if they did have traction, Weld might have been one of the driving forces. Vista gave me her visor, having me hold it, while she arranged stuff. I kept my back turned. Gonna be just one second. Not a problem. Spare folded laundry on the top of the shelf by the door included a visible Vista logo. Dean had had the exact same thing. Was that a thing the wards did, ironically or unironically wearing the themed merch for local teams, normally reserved for kids and superfans? She came up to my left and leaned over her desk as she fished for stuff. A comb ran through her hair, drawing some relaxer or counter-agent for the stuff she'd put into it before to make it wavier, fuller, and shaggier in body. She plucked the visor from my hand, plugged in an earbud that dangled from it, before pulling on ear protection over it, with an attached visor and headband for hair that was now straight and parted. My go bag is under the desk, Vista told me. Can you grab that? I did, moving the chair aside. It was a heavy gym bag with a strap. I wish I could use my power, she complained as she took the bag from me and unzipped it. I hate being in a room feeling like I'm holed up while the problems are mounting outside. It always leaves me feeling like the walls are closing in. Understandable. I could exit, giving you some more space. I'd rather have your hands, if that's okay. And we should talk. Not to strategize, that sounds weird, but I'd really rather not get on Narwhal's bad side. My hands are available, I said as she draped her cape coat over my hand. Meant for Vista, not Missy, matched to her costume's colors and style. It had armor and bulk that would get condensed down to something more manageable, but for now it was expanded. This gets tricky if Capricorn did lie, and I'm supposed to figure out what he said. We should check, Vista said, absently. She put the helmet and then her cape winter coat into the go-bag. As she worked, she glanced back. Laptop, let me in. 
The laptop illuminated at the voice command. Text appeared. Oh, God, I said. You've got the PRT-style login. I hated those. What does it say? Vista asked as she fought to get her coat in the bag. I motioned like I was going to help, but she brushed me off. I wouldn't have been contributing much. Quote, Six shots. The screen. Correct. Mom or dad. PRT. Correct. Childhood, classroom on the left. Dumped water on her head. You're in. Open the browser for me. Dial into messages. The browser had one of those customized multi-panel home pages with different panels having different information, the kind that adapted to the user. In my search for the search box, I saw the recent pictures as a panel so predominant I couldn't help but browse past it. Topless boy, upper body viewed from the side, light brown skin beaded in moisture and textured in goosebumps, muscular but not cut with muscle. There was some specks of blood and small scratches here and there, and the head was cut off by the framing of the shot. Scale mail laid across a lap or surface at the bottom half of the screen, similarly beaded in moisture, with the red of specks of blood contrasting with the dark blue tint of the image. The Reach logo was visible in the top left corner. The faint silver Capricorn design worked into the armor at the bottom right. The Click to View in Full box at the right of the panel blocked off the accompanying text or ad. A selfless shot. Someone had been looking someone up. That was... it was healthy, right? People looked up pictures of the boys they liked? The blood and battle damage was weird, but I could almost... sort of... kind of understand that working in a way that made the image more visceral? I didn't pry. I didn't go looking for more images, and I didn't comment. I found the search box, dialing into messages. Messages, yep. Yeah, dial into Vista, recent? I did. Each dial reduced and sorted the messages. Some catch-up, briefing-style stuff on the Amy situation, nothing else. No messages from Capricorn? No. Shit. Hoped he gave us some pointers. We could call. Better not. If they catch us asking, it looks bad, Vista said. Okay, grab this and let's go. I took the go-bag for her. She set to adjusting straps and settings on her armor as we left her dorm room behind. I don't want to hurt your career, I told Vista, adjusting the heavy bag's strap where I'd slung it over my shoulder. I know Narwhal's tough. Narwhal is tough in the same way Rachel Lint is gruff. You're understating things. And breakthroughs very much not Narwhal's style, I think. Agreed. Vista said. If I had to guess Tristan's intentions, he wanted to protect you, figuring it'd be better to hurt Breakthrough's standing than to hurt yours. Yeah, well, that's just him. And I think if I quizzed the rest of Breakthrough and asked them about the situation, they'd agree. Sveta and Kenzie would agree we need our friends happy and healthy and successful more than we need Breakthrough to sail smoothly. If Tristan lied, I could see why. Which doesn't help us, Vista said. No, I agreed. I'll... Vista started. We'd rounded a corner, stepping into a new hallway. My mom and Crystal were there, in earshot. No Aunt Sarah. Vista didn't finish her thought. I don't know where the situation room is, Crystal told us. We were called. Me too, I said. I saw my mother press her lips together, inhaling, bracing. Yeah, I'm with you there, Mom. This way, I'll show you, Vista said. And I'll take my bag. Thanks for carrying it. I handed it off to her, my injuries twinging in the extension of my arm, the weird angle, and the weight. The stairway up to the command center stabbed upwards at a diagonal through the complex, set up so it could be locked off, forcing a circuitous navigation. For sieges. And to keep prisoners like Cauldron's old victims trapped within for longer, should an escape attempt happen. Solid, 
fortified, all built to last through the end of the world, to sustain itself against an alien stronger than many gods we'd conceived of. There were entire sections, Sveta had said, which were secured by columns of solid matter, poised to drop down like giant mallets, or by water, which would pour down in seemingly endless quantities. My mom had always felt similar, prepared, fortified, unassailable, endlessly stubborn and dangerous. If she broke, the impression I'd always had was that she would be right as rain soon after, because she didn't brook weakness. My mom needed a hand from me to get started on the stairs, and once she had it, she kept relying on it, leaning heavily on my arm. How did your visit go? I asked. It was nice, Crystal said. Not perfect. There are some parts of it that felt really alien or weird. It was hard to meet her eyes. Yeah, I commiserated. Did you ever have a conversation with someone who works too much or leads a really one-dimensional life? Crystal asked. I'm thinking specifically of a professor who tutored me in the year I took off from school, and Donatella's mom. Donatella? Vista asked. My childhood best friend. Homemaker. No hobbies, no work, nothing except her daily routine and having a lot of kids. You know when you meet someone like that, and you try to have a conversation, and they drag every conversation back to this really small, comfortable territory for them? My tutor did that with history. My best friend's mom did it with her kids. There was a boy in my high school who might have been autistic, who did it with Earth Aleph nerdery and video games. But my best friend's mom was the one that always stuck with me. Whenever I thought about quitting a club or extra class I was taking, I'd think about her and keep going. I've had conversations with people like that, my mother said. It's not uncommon. I might be that type, Vista muttered. No, hon, Crystal said. Really, you're fine. I've never had a conversation with you that felt that way. Nor I. I added. Because you're both easy to talk to, Vista said. I don't think that's precisely it, my mom said. The kind of behavior Crystal described stems from a place of insecurity or deep anxiety. While I'm sure you have your worries and anxieties, Vista, I think you're stronger than that. Every time I've talked to someone who knew you and your name came up, whether it was Dean talking about paired patrols while having dinner at our house, running into Miss Militia on patrol and catching up with her, or even the staff at the Heroes for Healing charity drive, they came away with a strong impression of you, not a timid or defensive one. Uh, thanks, Vista said. I'm a bit surprised by that. By all accounts, and I'll stress that I've seen people champing at the bit for chances to give their accounting, you're a capable young woman, Vista. Don't devalue yourself or reduce yourself down. That kind of means a lot. Thank you. I kind of wish my parents picked up on that sort of thing. Your parents are asshats, Carol Dallin said. What? Vista made a sound, like she wasn't sure how to respond. They're your family. Love them unconditionally. Stay by them through thick and thin. But I think you should listen to the people who sing your praises, not the people with their heads halfway up their asses when it comes to valuing yourself. Any parent with a lick of sense would be proud. I looked over at Crystal, who had gone quiet, a little introspective or caught up in her thoughts. My mother was maybe a little less filtered with the head injury. It was hard to say. Not in the sense she was drunk or impulsive, though that image of her crying last night might stay in my mind's eye until the day I died, but that the things that made her her were less obstructed by things like deeper considerations or context. We'd launched into this from a conversation about Crystal feeling abandoned by her mom, and my mom had found her way to coaching Vista and being a bit of the mom Vista maybe needed but never had. You were saying about one-dimensional personalities? I asked Crystal. Crystal came back to the present reality and time, stirred from those deep thoughts. She met my eyes. My mom, 
That woman, I have no idea what to call her. She felt that way. I didn't want to spend most of the time talking about war stories, but we ended up talking about war stories. She didn't used to be like that. I'm sorry. For what it's worth, it seems like they can get back to who they were. It's just going to take time. Crystal nodded, smiling a sad smile at me. Her fingers adjusted her hair over her bad eye. We missed you being there, Victoria, my mother said. Orders are orders, Crystal said, more tense and defensive about my departure than I'd expected. Can we ask, Victoria? Valkyrie brought Clockblocker and Kid Wynn back, too. She wanted me to get Vista and take her to see them. How are they? Was it a good reunion? It was nice, Vista said. Weird, a bit one-dimensional, and that dimension wasn't the one I would have said seemed Clockblocker. But I got to say some stuff I'd been holding on to, so it felt cathartic. Crystal smiled. I agree. I feel like a hole inside of me is a little less big. Cathartic is a good word, even though I didn't really vent. My mom was leaning on me more heavily as we ascended the stairs. It didn't help that there were so many. Kid Wynn and I talked, I said. I remember hearing he died and wishing I'd talk to him more. I got to talk to him today, and it was interesting. If he wanted to hang out and chat in quieter times, I think I'd welcome it. What do you two even have in common? My mom asked. We connected on some of the childhood stuff, pre-Cape, kids being sent to visit the PRT. I asked some stuff about what they remember, what they don't, what might be recoverable, intuitive understandings of powers, how things connect, what's hazy for him and what isn't. Crystal looked intrigued. That sounds an awful lot like all the questions I wanted to ask my mom. I could have shaken her, begged her for answers to those same questions, but it felt like I shouldn't. It would have disturbed the good parts of the moment, and I thought of Donatella's mom. If you took her kids away or put her in a situation where she couldn't talk about her kids, would there even be a person there? If I pressured this version of my mom, would she collapse like a Christmas tree ornament? My mom answered. Angelou Morris, Donatella's mother, was in our book club. Really? Crystal asked. She approached the books with a hunger. I personally loved it. People surprise you, Crystal, especially when it comes to matters of enduring. All right. I guess that gives me some hope. Can I ask what Kid Wynn told you? You can. He described it as a haze... Sorry to interrupt, Vista said, but we're here. Here was a branch off the side of the staircase. The warden's choice of location for situation room wasn't teacher's old one. Then I'll tell you after, I promised Crystal. And I'll get more answers, and we'll compare notes. Thank you, that sounds good. We took the detour, and without the need to climb the stairs and more carefully place her feet... My mom didn't have to lean on me. As we drew closer, I could see more capes that were second- or third-string wardens, capes like Naptha and Gollum. Vista opened the door, and we stepped into the situation room. I couldn't help but feel like movies and television shows failed to capture the situation room atmosphere. Even at the PRT headquarters, when the wards and I had been getting briefed on the likelihood that the Slaughterhouse Nine were in the city— there had been something missing, and that something was distilled a hundred times over here. The situation room was often the hardest room to get to in the building, if it wasn't in a seemingly unintuitive spot, like the ward's meeting spot being in the PRT basement. It was the room in the center of the building, with no windows, thick walls, and a resulting claustrophobia. Take that claustrophobia, add people, in a quantity where there aren't enough chairs and some have to stand, but where it's not crowded exactly. Just awkward in that sense where that too small space couldn't ever be comfortable. No movement could be made without some consideration for who might be in your space. Those people would include people you've never seen before. 
because things are intense enough that there need to be intern-level clerks and secretaries to run to grab something from a printer, filing cabinet or office, and people to take notes, and others with specialized knowledge. Making the awkward the awkwardness of the unfamiliar, of class and power. Take those people, then, and account for the fact that some don't know where to stand in this space that doesn't feel like it gets enough air for the number of people within. Police officers or scientists who have never been here, but aren't high enough status or enough a part of the meeting to get a chair. Interns who've never been in a situation like this. For the people who do have chairs, who do have places to be, take them out of their seats, Because they've been here long enough, they can't sit anymore. They're stressed. They're pacing or standing behind their chairs. People in suits have pulled off their suit jackets. People in masks who've decided they're in trusted company have removed those things. All gathered in a space that feels like it's smaller than the concrete and steel insulating and protecting said space from the threats outside. Like dolls in a shoebox diorama, surrounded by a foot of concrete on every side. That was the atmosphere here, that the televisions and movies hadn't ever captured for me. One long table, like a conference table, with chairs all around, except at the end, because they needed to be able to see the screens at the front of the room. There were four desks split between the two sides of the table's length, each with that teacher-base cauldron aesthetic of being set in concrete, each with too many people crowded around. Narwhal was there, standing with arms folded. I saw Armstrong, sitting at the long table, papers in front of him. Off by one desk, there were two of Goddess's clustermates. Gollum's girlfriend, her name escaped me in the moment, Dinah Alcott, stood by one of the other desks, a man in black beside her that could have been Warden's security or her security. I saw Jessica Yamada and Darnall, off in the one corner, talking to other warden employees. I saw, on the big screens at the far end of the room, a giant of a man with gray skin and brutish features, holding the torn-off top of a car in one hand. It looked less like a distinct image and more like the faces one might see reflected in a window at night, shadows and glimpses overlapping. He'd already armored himself in part, He walked, holding car roof and construction materials, and the two overlapped, pressing in together, steel girders becoming fiberglass, then car roof becoming an arrangement of girders. He stopped, bent down, and twisted the girders so they fit to the curvature of his leg. Then, touching more armor, he blended existing armor to new armor, translating and combining aesthetics, making it uniform. Pelvis, butt, and crotch, Three-quarters of his legs had already been covered, and arrangements sat under his feet and between his toes like sandals. With the new addition, he was armored from the waist down, pretty much. Boots to be filled out, the rest encased. He turned, head roving as he checked his direction. Heads, plural, as he refracted, each head looking in a different direction. The refracting carried down to the armor he wore, showing off different aesthetics. Everything distilled to a different form as he began marching in a direction, bending down to pick up a dumpster, holding it in one hand. On the next screen, a giant of a woman was wreathed in a draping of flesh so thin it looked almost translucent, with veins webbing through that flesh the webbing of veins more than any flesh itself protecting her modesty. In a radius around her, naked figures crouched and stood, all human and human-proportioned, but only halfway between her height and an ordinary human, which put them at about ten or twelve feet in height. I saw a man crouching, fists pressed into the ground like forelegs. A man stood, askew, head resting against the side of the building, like standing up straight was too much effort. There were enough of them that I couldn't see much around the woman, but the camera moved slightly, and I could see the front of the crowd, where an obese, naked, ten-foot-tall woman sat on an obese, naked man. The ground around them was flesh, 
and hands were tearing that flesh body from the far side, groping, pressing their way up and out. As the flesh tore enough, I could see below, see the glistening face, and the muscular contractions of an extra-dimensional space thrusting the woman up and out. One of the men helped her crawl free. The aperture squeezed shut, like a sphincter closing, the closing pressing juices up and out until they washed over and obscured the view. As fluids found holes to drain back into, another space opened, a sphincter covered by glistening skin thinner than paper, a foot sticking up and out against it. The giant woman who had just emerged, I saw, was pregnant. Most or all of the women were. All of them, it was hard to tell at first because many were moist from having emerged in the recent past, or they were crusted in frost because the moisture had frozen, were glistening from inner thigh to heel. The men were violently erect. Like, stab one of those things with a pin, and I imagined the resulting blood spray could cut you in half. They were still unmoving, except for the occasional figure shifting its weight or getting comfortable. A third screen showed Dauntless, Kronos, the Titan. The Seamorg wasn't on his shoulder, but flapped lazy circles, flying in a way that didn't feel intuitive with the flaps. Dauntless was moving. A screen below that image showed the plotted paths and positions. Four marks on the screen, black circles with red crowns, were placed on maps. Two in Shin, two in our city, one of those two with a dotted line marking its course. One mark, Dauntless's old symbol, a helmet framed by a ring of lightning bolts, and its own dotted line moving to intercept. We took it in, watching, seeing what was on the screens, how the people there reacted. Swears felt out of place in this formal setting. Conversation was hard to initiate. The more I paid attention to the little details, the people who were standing alone or sitting alone, like Armstrong, the more I felt like this wasn't so comparable to the Situation Room meeting about the Slaughterhouse Nine back in Brockton Bay. At least there there had been a sense that things would be horrible, but we could get through it. Narwhal spotted us. She talked to my mom and Crystal first. It's unfortunate that you arrived with Victoria. Why? my mom asked. Because Victoria is a security concern on three fronts at the moment, and by associating with her, you're a concern too. We're in communication with Flashbang, who is acting as mediator, and we'd be happy to have you step in to talk to him. Now we can't. Three security concerns? My mom asked. Her activities last night, for one, against Warden Council. We can't enforce hard laws, and the warning was brief and not elaborated on, but discussion on the subject of breakthrough and their actions is pending. With distractions, it seems, my mom said. In addition to the concern about reckless action, we can't know for sure how that experience affected her. Defiant debriefed them, and Dragon reviewed limited video footage of the event. Post-traumatic stress is the least of our concerns on that front. Is that the second issue? my mother asked. It's still the first. Issue two, overlapping with the other issues, is that Victoria came into contact with Amelia Levere and cannot account for some of that time spent. She suggested Master Stranger protocols on herself. Those protocols were never resolved. Now we are dealing with Miss Levere in a confrontational respect. These are her? Crystal asked, aghast. Individuals curated by Amelia Levere to pattern match to specific individuals, injected with drugs by the villain Cryptid, also known as Labrat, bringing out the full capacity of those powers. They are now under the joint control of Amelia Levere and the Shin government. Her name is Amy Dallin, my mother said. I wanted to snap at her to say something. Then I saw her expression, stricken, shocked. 
Was I the only one who wasn't? I didn't feel shocked so much as I felt impending doom, despair, and disappointment. Under Master Stranger protocols, yet the only person in the room who got it? If I call her Panacea, will that work? It's... My mother shook her head. The Red Queen. It's the name she's using most now. My mom looked like she wanted to argue, to debate or lawyer her way to getting to what she wanted. For the woman who had made those things to be Amy Dallin again. But she couldn't argue against the name Amy had taken for herself. Vista said the danger was this evening, I said to refocus the discussion. It was. It may be sooner. One of the creations is moving. It has our full attention, and the attention of the dauntless titan. We're moving to intercept. For now, please sate my curiosity. Victoria Dallin, you were remanded to the custody of Crystal Pelham, pending warden investigation. I was. Valkyrie told you to fetch Vista and take her to a meeting with the two former teammates. Vista would take over custody of you. You were expected to go straight to Vista, with no detours or distractions. I did, I said. Capricorn, when quizzed about his whereabouts, indicated he had gone outside for an extended breath of fresh air. We checked cameras. He had not. Instead, a passerby says you and he talked, despite being told not to associate until we had finished investigating breakthrough. My mom was giving me a curious look. We only talked briefly, I said. It wasn't about anything too serious, nothing about current goings-on. I think we only briefly touched on what happened last night, and even then, only to say we were a bit shaken and reeling, not to strategize or associate. Mostly it was about acquaintances and seeing if his brother was okay. The fact he is somewhat mobile and alert is... great. It is, Narwhal said, without a hint of a smile or trace of good humor. It was a chance meeting. Then Capricorn did lie to me. I don't know. Defiant threw me a curveball last night by lying to me and saying our activities killed people to double-check something or test me. I don't know. I don't know if you're doing the same, or if this is part of your extended Master Stranger procedure, but I'm telling you the truth. I don't play games, Victoria. Understood, I said. What was the context of this accidental meeting? Narwhal asked. Narwhal, Vista said. It looked like it took her some active work to summon the courage to speak up. She hesitated as she noticed Jessica and Darnall making their approach, and then pushed forward. I was the context of the meeting. Narwhal's crystal-studded eyebrows went up. That makes me more concerned, not less. He still lied, which leaves me suspicious about him, while casting your behavior into a questionable light. Jessica's own reaction was one of mild surprise as she caught the last part of the conversation. Vista clenched her fists. I was, um, with Capricorn Blue. If his brother lied, it was to keep confidence. If there was any doubt she was telling the truth, then the doubter would have had to explain the pink ear tips and flush. Vista wasn't that good an actor. That neatly explains a lot about this, Narwhal said, but her tone didn't soften. I remember you were distracted by your association with Capricorn at the raid on the Mather's Fallen compound. Yes, Vista said. I spoke up. Distracted is the wrong word. It didn't interfere with her performance. Hold on, Narwhal said. I held on, tense. One thing at a time. We'll unravel the individual issues, which releases those involved to join the handling of the greater crisis. Vista's actions and distraction at the time concerned me, and I filed it as such. Let's leave it at that. For now, Vista can leave with just a parting comment from me. I believe Cineral is on the line at Terminal 2. 
Have you briefed yourself on all the materials we sent out twenty minutes ago? Not yet, Vista said. I see, Narwhal said. She gave Vista a sad look. You have so much promise, Vista. You're almost eighteen. The wardens have been talking about elevating you to a higher position with a team to lead of your own. This is something you want? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. We don't do that for most capes your age because we can't trust most capes your age to be level-headed or to handle the responsibility of three to ten other lives. Teenagers act like teenagers, and I had really hoped you would be the exception to that. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. You knew the Red Queen? Only in passing, Vista said. See what Cinderella needs, and if she doesn't require anything else, you can join us for the ongoing conversation with the Red Queen and Shin, or you can wait outside with the others on standby. Your decision. We'll revisit this when we discuss team leadership after you turn 18. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to say something. But with Breakthrough's current standing, I wasn't sure I could get away with it. I felt like I'd hesitate to say anything with both of my therapists looking on, and the only things that came to mind were actively hostile. Because how fucking dare Narwhal dress down Vista in a public setting? Vista, my mom said as Vista escaped. Hmm? Vista turned. Yes? You just came back from patrol? Not just, but recently. These are the hours you'd be recuperating, showering, sleeping? I don't think anyone is sleeping or recuperating at a time like this, Vista said, glancing at the screens. Um, I was sleeping. Just with him. Actually asleep, nothing happened. He's recuperating? Better, but not at his best? I'm not interested in debate, Mrs. Dallin. Narwhal said. I'm not interested in debate either, my mother said, just asking and commenting. And delaying us from getting to the matter at hand, Narwhal said. I'll be brief. You were with him, you were woken up, went to see Clock Blocker and Kid Win at Valkyrie's request, and then came straight here? Yes, Vista said. Did Byron go with you? No, he's still healing, Vista said. She looked nervous, if only because it looked increasingly like she was stuck between Narwhal and my mom. An injured cape and a young woman fresh off her patrol taking the opportunity to sleep seems very sensible and healthy. And if you can look after each other in the process, then that's even better, my mom said. I like Capricorn as a match for you. He's an excellent cape with a great record as a hero. He had a fan base and Team Reach was very good about taking the money he earned them and reinvesting that money into his training as a cape. If you gave me the opportunity, I don't think there are many I could suggest as a better match for you. Yes, ma'am, Vista said, looking dangerously pleased with what my mom was saying, considering Narwhal was standing right there. Vista ducked out, escaping the conversation. Narwhal gave my mom a look. I said I'd be brief my mom said, to effectively shut down the conversation. Narwhal studied us before pulling out her phone. She checked something. Jessica, Mr. Darnall. The wardens will feel most comfortable working with Victoria Dallin if we can address the standing issues, the master-stranger effect, and the pending review. We'd be comfortable letting her be involved in the current crisis if we can strike one of those things off the record. Do you think you could have a conversation with her? We could, Jessica said. Yes, Wayne Darnall said. The lingering memory of Jessica strangling Bonesaw made me feel like a whole other set of Master Stranger protocols were needed. Narwhal continued checking something on her phone, but her demeanor suggested she was still here with us, just doing something complimentary. She didn't look up as she asked, Victoria Dallin hasn't discussed the Red Queen with you in any meaningful capacity? No, we don't talk about her when we can help it, my mom said. You received healing from the Red Queen? Partial, yes. Crystal Dallin, 
Have you been healed in recent memory? Not by Amy. Any concerns of memory manipulation, emotional manipulation, self-reports of unusual behavior? No. Good. Then are you comfortable corroborating and challenging your mother's, sorry, your aunt's accounts and advice on the topic? Of Amy? Yes, I can work with her. Then would you go to console two? Talk to the team. Let us know how Mark Dallin is. Verify if we can trust him. Tell us what you can about the Red Queen. Gladly, if it helps, my mother said. Thank you, Narwhal told her. Will Victoria be joining us? As soon as she's cleared, Narwhal said. You good? Crystal asked, touching my arm. I think so, I said, even though I felt adrift in all of this. Crystal gave my arm a squeeze. She and my mom left. We had three concerns about you, Narwhal told me. Her eyes were piercing, unflinching. Now we have two. If your therapists, past and present, can testify to your well-being, we'll have no objection to your supervised involvement in this conflict. Yes, ma'am, I said. I'm sorry about this, Narwhal said, not really relaxing as she said it. I'd rather do things strictly by the book in situations like this than do otherwise and regret it. Totally understandable, I said. I wasn't sure I'd have been able to say it like I did if my mom hadn't spoken up on Vista's behalf. As soon as she's done, she can join the current situation, Narwhal told my therapists. Do you need anything? No, Jessica said. All right. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Narwhal stepped away, because two people had drawn close in the last minute, hovering and waiting for her to be free. She had barely finished talking when she was turning away, addressing the next thing. And I could kind of breathe. This fucking shoebox in concrete space. Fuck. I was just glad Vista had come out of it okay. By all reports, Narwhal was pretty cool in downtime, but in crisis mode, she was as unyielding as her force fields. That didn't mean she was unfair. She'd dressed Vista down in public, and she'd remember something like this for weeks or months, like she'd remembered casual chatter with Capricorn back at the Fallen Raid. But I didn't think she was the type to hear something like what my mom had said, and not take it into account, out of spite or anything. I looked over at the monsters. The minions of the nursery-like monster were spreading out a bit, not aggressively, but finding spots to sit or stand. Around each, in a loose circular radius, there was a faint haze with a dusky rose tint, and the surrounding environment transformed. Where multiple gathered, the transformation was sufficient that things moved beneath that ground. Large masses like a tongue licking at the inside of a cheek. "'What are the other key monsters?' I asked. "'The monitors show two, plus Dauntless, but there's four markers on the map, two in Shin.' Only Jessica and Darnall were close enough to me to answer. People had backed off, and people from the nearest desk were at the table. We had something approximating privacy, if not four walls surrounding me so onlookers couldn't glance my way." Jessica answered me. One of them is derivative of Bianca, the woman in blue. Her power works through media and enthralls capes. There's a separate room of strictly non-capes who are monitoring her. And the fourth? We think it's Christine Mathers. When the creatures appeared, tens of thousands in Chite reported seeing a tall, thin woman with silver hair and pale skin. These images of the woman aren't doing anything except standing on the horizon, unmoving. How the hell did she get to Chite? Teacher. Apparently, Christine Mathers visited Earth Chite as a guest of teacher for massive festivals and parades. His co-conspirators in government had no idea what they were dealing with. The wardens are considering discontinuing the sedation of the real Christine Mathers, but, as you can imagine, that's not an easy decision to make. So that's Chevalier, Nursery, Goddess, Mathers. All of them people Cryptid was able to sample. Makes sense, 
I said, quiet. He'd pick powers and capes that insulate him against surveillance. He would, Jessica agreed. How do you feel about that? I asked. I wish I'd done better. Not that I'd done nothing at all, Jessica said. And what about Bonesaw? What did you do to her? I looked over at the screens, folding my arms. I'd like to let Dr. Darnall take point in our review, Victoria. Had I not already been here, I wouldn't have agreed to come test you. I don't think I'm in a position to, and I've given Dr. Darnall the outline to follow in reviewing Master Stranger influence. Unfortunately, it works best when there's a long-standing relationship between therapist and the supposed target of the influence, Dr. Darnall said. My irregular attendance at appointments comes back to bite me in the ass, huh? I wouldn't phrase it that way. You prioritized other things, and that's fine, he told me. How are you? I'm about as good as can be expected, honestly. In some ways, I'm better. Hard to explain. Hopefully, I can help you with that explanation, he said. How are you? I asked. Your first time here? It is. It's... Daunting. Interesting. Can you tell me about the better? I drew in a deep breath, and I glanced at Jessica. Before I do, I started. I was aware of the noise from elsewhere, and broke off to look. Babble, and back and forth. But I couldn't pick out the how or what of it, and nothing seemed to have really changed on the screens. I looked back at the pair, at Jessica. I thought of what I'd seen last night. Before you do, he prompted. Full disclosure, I said, not taking my eyes off Jessica. I swallowed. I second-guessed myself, changing my mind about what I was going to say. I reviewed the protocols and questionnaires. I read about how this goes, the kinds of questions you ask. I don't want my answers to seem fake or crafted, because I know what's coming and I am unconsciously crafting them. I can adapt, Darnall said. Thank you for letting me know. That was the part about making the patient comfortable. I visited the agents last night, I told them. Went to one of the places powers stem from. I think I figured some stuff out. I'm tired. A little shaken from a near-death experience in the middle of it. Flutters of panic. But, uh, my power's been broken for a little while now, as part of what happened to put me in the hospital. And now it's not. Or it's a lot better. People mention my sister, and I don't feel like my heart is going to stop beating or like my brain has slammed on the brakes and pulled the steering wheel hard left into dangerous roads. That's a pretty extreme change, Darnall said. It absolutely is. Don't get me wrong, I still hate her. I still feel like, if she died in the next five seconds, I would feel relieved first and bad second. She said once that hate is the emotion closest to love, but I don't feel any love at all. These changes started when she used her power on you? Darnall asked. Can you elaborate on the scenario and timeline? Jessica added. I went to Shin, to negotiate, to help. We were imprisoned as a political play. I was hurt. The doctor then drugged me, knocking me out. I came to, and I was... There it was. That feeling like my heart could stop. The feelings crowding in my chest until it felt like there wasn't room to expand in my lungs. I'd spent the last week trying not to think about that scene, that room, and how very helpless I'd been in there. My arms were already folded, so I squeezed them against my body, hard. Captive. That must have been terrifying, Darnall said. We had a conversation, I said, controlling the tone of my voice. I shrugged and I couldn't relax my shoulders enough to unshrug, so I leaned against the wall instead, like I was finding a different posture. They say, um, the unknown is the root of all fear. Maybe the conversation helped, because it made a lot of things known. What she's willing and able to do? She used her power on me. To do what? Jessica asked. I don't know. But you know she used her power. 
I thought of my conversation with Defiant, the lie detector. I don't know anything, but I'm 90% sure. I was missing a fingernail after the attack that put me in the doctor's control just before... captivity, I said. I looked away, devoting a lot of my secondary attention and processing to the study of a manufacturer's sticker on the side of one of the chairs. I had a fingernail after. Shin's medicine isn't that good. Is it possible that was the extent of it? Darnall asked. No, I said, studying that sticker. Where had it come from? What language was that? You sound sure. Ninety percent sure. I know her, or I knew her. I have a sense of her. I have a sense of what she does. Like, I wasn't surprised at all that this, the monsters, the violation of the people who those monsters came from, even fucking Mama Mathers didn't deserve to be made into something like that. Even a tyrant like Goddess. You think she did something more? I'm 90% sure she did something more. I was entirely at her mercy, and she wouldn't hold back. I think she would touch me. I think she would alter me according to whatever twisted fantasy she had in that moment, then put me back to normal. I think she'd, um... I couldn't bring myself to inhale, but I'd run out of breath to talk with, so my words kind of faded out into a breathy strain of a whisper. They didn't interrupt. I found my breath again, a intake of air with a shudder to it, my skin crawling. I blinked rapidly a few times, looking back to that sticker. I don't know, I summed it up. Worst case scenario, she cloned me. It's apparently something that was on her mind, if she was making another goddess and a Mathers. Okay, Darnall said. He wasn't following the script at all, barely touching the questions. I think it was bad, I elaborated. It's an awful lot of unknown. But you feel better? he asked gently. In ways, I said, feeling at risk of letting my voice fade out into a strained whisper again. It's easier to hate her, and that makes it easier. I think I understand her motives and mind more than I did. I can see how the person I knew became the Red Queen now. Before, it was a big, scary question mark, and that kind of question mark just appears and the questions appear in front of it. Is she going to appear around the corner here? Surprise me? Is she targeting me? Is she sorry? Is she going to do something to make amends? When? And I lost the words again. Elsewhere in the room, people bustled this way and that. It would have been nice to have a private space, but at the same time, I could understand if there wasn't anything conveniently close, and I didn't want to move away in case I could just have this fucking conversation over with and jump straight back into stuff I wanted and needed to be doing. She's an exclamation point now, not a question mark, and it's kind of really fucking viscerally satisfying that those exclamation points are appearing over people's heads now, when I was fucking trying to warn them. I couldn't help but glance at Jessica, glance away. Do you think she affected your mind, emotions, or memories? Darnall asked. I don't know. I wouldn't rule it out, but I haven't noticed anything. Did feeling better, as you put it, start with that captivity? No. I got a taste of control during the teacher raid, but it was... A teammate died. Swan song. I looked at Jessica. Guilt seized me, but she was impenetrable, too hard to understand. She didn't give me accusation any more than she'd given me any signs of guilt earlier. I went on. I was closer to Teacher's Gate. I found the wavelength with my agent... Later, I'd chase that wavelength and find it to hold on to it. I welcome Jessica stepping in to clarify matters of powers, but is it possible it started you on that road? Days passed, no. I know my power, I know my control, and no. I've experienced the transition, or the way one switch flips when she uses her power, and the dominoes start following. Thought patterns and the familiar changing to the different, the unfamiliar. This doesn't feel like that. It feels subtler, different focus, different playing fields. 
You don't think she could have learned subtlety? Based on what I know of Cryptid, he's a great believer in secrecy and secrets. It's too long-term, too soft. Amelia Levere dwells in the moment. She'll dwell in the past if you give her cause or if she's given herself cause, but she doesn't look to the future. Hell, she won't look to the future enough to keep her arguments straight over a single conversation. She used to be annoying about it, but she's gotten worse. You don't think she has that capacity? She has every capacity, but she doesn't have that intent, that planning. The danger Cryptid poses is that he'll give her the slippery slope with long-term ramifications, and she'll take the moment to leap off that slippery slope. People will get hurt in the end. You sound sure. Ninety-five percent. She didn't alter my power to have some creeping effect or long-term change. She didn't affect my emotions that way either. Not that subtly, when she's a sledgehammer. But you're still concerned, he said. You said it's possible. Trigger phrases, in case I cross her and she decides she has no other way to have me? She'd put something like that in. A tweak to memories? I've gone over stuff, nothing jars, and I remember the PRT worksheets and guides on resisting master influence. Nothing stands out there, but it's possible. By the timeline, I don't think she had me long enough to do something comprehensive or take her time with me and then erase memories after, but possible. I felt like I was ranting, rambling, trying to keep my forebrain fixated on stickers and environmental details, and away from mental pictures or imagining the full ramifications of a given statement, while the rear half of my brain was the driving force, pushing the cart from behind. My fingernails dug through plush sweater into my arms. Five on the one side, four on the other. The empty nail bed was a source of raw, pointed pain, throbbing with my every heartbeat, which was racing like it would if I engaged in a hard run to my very limits. I looked up at Darnall, and the man seemed to be at a bit of a loss. I was describing a monster who could do anything, and I had my proof on the far side of the screen. The poor guy might have felt like he was in over his head. Unfamiliar space, unfamiliar dynamics. Do you want to take fifteen minutes, return to this? He asked. No, I want to get this over with so I can go over there and fucking help. So just, you know, ask the questions from the list or rule me out or whatever. I have been asking questions, in a roundabout way, he said. Had he? Maybe, if each question was a bullet point on a list, if he was going from the grounding, degrees of conviction, coherency of timeline and memory, giving cause to make contradicting statements. I shook my head, feeling tense. I hadn't ever relaxed my shoulders from that shrug. My arms were still folded, my fucking missing fingernail still fucking hurt like fuck. Victoria, Jessica said, her voice soft. If the Victoria of three months ago met the Victoria of now, would she be concerned? Straight from the list of questions. I drew in a deep breath. Probably, but I'd be concerned about her. Why? Follow-up question, right from the list. Because I would barely be recognizable to her. Because she's, to the me of right now, paralyzed, trapped, secretly terrified of every dark corner and going back to that terrifies me. Would the Victoria of five years ago be concerned? I relaxed my shoulders. I think we'd both be a bit disappointed in each other. Why? Because I see her as a brute, a barbarian, someone who hurt others because she thought of it as justice. Why would she be concerned about you? Jessica asked. I thought of Vista's room, of Vista underwear and gallant posters, of her having a boyfriend, her music album art on the dorm room wall. The lines were super blurry, and I related to those blurry lines. The old me would have related. The me of now didn't, really. Maybe because I'm only living half a life, and she fought too long and hard to maintain that half I'm ignoring despite everything about how we were raised making it so much harder to maintain, I said. Is that getting better or worse since that meeting last week? Still close to the script. 
black text on white paper from years ago. Reassuring. Out of order, though. It was supposed to be a follow-up to another question, but I could see it working as a prompt here. Worse. Way worse. Vista commented on it in the midst of a conversation. It spooked her, maybe. I think Valkyrie even noticed it, the way she was talking. Do you think you're ignoring something vital? You'd hate it, I said, my face twisting. I met her eyes, and I remembered seeing her strangle bone saw. I couldn't push that image from my mind. I looked away. Ignoring the civilian side? I tried going the other way before breakthrough. Now I'm embracing the power. Getting deep, really deep into the powers. Trying to understand the world. Getting glimpses of secrets. Details about people I didn't really want to know, but... Things make more sense. At least I have control now. Is there a way back to Victoria? Jessica asked. A way back to being Victoria. No costume, no powers, for the occasional day. A day you don't plan, where you just happen to not use powers or not get in fights. Where you're you, and you pursue your own interests, romance, friendships, family. I was never, ever that Victoria, I said. Even before I had powers, they were a part of my life. If that's your line where things are okay, then you're going to be so horribly disappointed in me. Jessica nodded. I'm not disappointed, she said. Does that have anything to do with this... this? I asked. Do you think I'm showing signs of being compromised? Jessica parted her lips, but didn't speak. I'll rephrase, I said. Do you think Amy compromised me in a way that interferes with my ability to jump in here and give advice and direction? She glanced at Darnall. I don't get that impression, Darnall said. But I'm worried for other reasons. So am I, I said. There's a thinker we can ask who looks at biology, Jessica said. It's possible he can vet you. My head shook a little with the nod I gave her. That'd be pretty huge, a relief, big. Okay, she said. I agree. I don't think Amy is that kind of planner or subversive element. Supervise me? I asked. Then I remembered the strangling. Imagine how she didn't want to be a part of any of this, but she probably thought she had to. Or Darnall, or... Of course, Darnall said. But I want to see you more regularly. Tonight, to start with. And I think you want to see me. Yeah. I started toward the front of the room, my foot not quite touching the ground as I hesitated, waiting for the go-ahead. Darnall followed, and that served as the all-clear. Approaching the front of the room, Terminal 2. Vista was already there. So were my mom and Crystal. Narwhal, off to the side, hands resting on the back of a chair, peering past white hair with faint crystalline hues. My dad on the speakerphone. Amy's voice in the background. I couldn't approach my family or friend because there were too many people. So, I approached Narwhal. What's the situation? The machine army, Narwhal said. No questions about my mental well-being or the vetting. I was here, so she assumed all was well. Purely professional. I looked up at the map. The dotted line put the giant chevalier on a course to the portal to Earth Bet. Home. He's going there? And the Kronos Titan is moving to intercept, Narwhal said. Shin is concerned that if the machine army attacks the city, there's nothing to stop it from rapidly disseminating itself across the city and reaching Shin. Is there anything? I asked. Not enough, Narwhal said. But they want to address the crisis now, which means we now have that same crisis in our lap, because it involves our territory, our border, our safeguard that they're about to trample through. Victoria's voice? The question came over the speakerphone. Amy. Yes, I said, loud enough that she should hear me. You're there, my dad said, through the same phone. Yes, I said again. 
There was a pause. I looked at my mom, at Crystal, and at Vista. People who got this. Will you help? Amy asked. Negotiating? Handling this? I feel like you might listen to me when others don't. I stared at the screen, nine fingernails digging into my sweater. All right. Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 5 To recap again, Amy's voice came through the screen. On our side of the call, we have myself, Flashbang, Marquis, and two gentlemen from the local government, who I'm told you have met, Victoria, Luis and Gavin. Fuck you, I thought. My mother answered. On our end, to name people familiar to you, we have the family, Vista, Narwhal, and two more people from the Wardens. Oh, I didn't know Vista was there. I hope you're doing well, Vista. Fuck you, I thought. This isn't a social function. I'll be happier when we've ensured everyone's safe, Vista said, a little more terse than she had been earlier. We can work on that. Amy sounded encouraged when I wouldn't have told her to be, given Vista's tone and pure focus on the business at hand. The situation is that you've got the machine army on your doorstep, and it's been there for a while. Shin has serious concerns about Gimmel's problems becoming their problems, because you guys don't have the best track record of keeping your messes contained. You don't have the best track record of keeping your own shit contained, Amy. Who the fuck do you think you are saying that? Having a giant with interdimensional powers stomping through the city and our quarantine hurts the containment of our mess, Narwhal said from ten feet away. Narwhal's response had been loud enough that the microphone apparently caught it because Amy responded. Essential traces of the person he was are still intact. Chevalier wanted to take care of people, protect, hold the line. So does the Giburim Knight. That's all he wants. Is that because you brainwashed him? Multiple heads turned my way. I didn't look at them, instead staring at the screen. I don't brainwash people, Victoria. That implies there was a brain to wash. He was a blank slate. We brought out the traits and aspects that make him want to work with us. My mistake, I said. You're right. Fuck you. I had to resist mouthing the words. The screen showed four giants of Amy's creation, one giant from the past, Dauntless. A marker showed Chevalier's team on the map, making his own approach. I had no idea what even an elite team of wardens could do, but they were apparently planning to get involved on some level, or planning on being there to mitigate the damage. Borders are sovereign, Narwhal said. We're in a state of emergency, and I know for a fact that you know that, because you helped us arrange accommodations for more than a million refugees. You can't move a massive power that you have untested control over through our city. Evacuated city, Amy said. Partially evacuated. And still sovereign, sensitive territory, Narwhal retorted. The diplomats are talking, my father said. One moment. Of course, Narwhal told him. Amy started to say something, but someone put them on mute, or took them off talk. Nobody asked or signaled to put us on mute. We stood where we stood, all of us gathered around the one desk, sitting or standing by chairs, leaning against a wall in Narwhal's case. My mom sat off to the left of the desk, partially in the aisle. I looked up at the screen. The Giburim Knight was there, still fashioning its armor, still trudging forward. It had built boots to cover its feet, which had been sandals before, and was building cross straps for its chest. The expression it wore was a focused, determined one, even as its face broke apart into three transparent versions. The snark isn't helpful, Narwhal told me, her voice low, too quiet for even the people at the desk to hear. Snark? 
I asked, matching her in volume. I thought back. No, not at all. I wouldn't play games. I certainly hope not, she said. This is diplomacy. I kept my voice quiet. Amy wants to hear that she's right more than she cares about the accusation. This isn't about her. This is about the very real, present, and unknown danger to the city. Please. It's the same thing in my view. She stood straighter, which was imposing given her height, build, and the way she was covered in a winter coat of force field crystals. Not in the sense of a jacket-type coat, but of an animal's thicker fur. And I would prefer to keep them as separate focuses. We compartmentalize, isolate the problem, and fix it. I understand wanting to do that, but I'm pretty sure you won't be able to. I was acting preemptively. I'll avoid doing that. I'll be quieter. But if my instincts are right, we'll reach a point where things get messy. Signal me if you want me to try to curb the messy. Can you? she asked. She's a damaged individual with a lot of power and one thing she wants that isn't in line with what Shin... We're back, Mark said. We're here, Narwhal said, turning away from her conversation with me, folding her arms. I would summarize their stance as a very pointed, Gimmel established a precedent, with our cape concerns and business trampling their sovereignty and security. I just got two signals of confirmation from them. This is willful and dangerous. We've been on good terms in recent days, some minor incidents aside. We're interested in continuing the trend of recent days, Amy said. Shin's desire has been to make things more fair from a power standpoint. You guys were happy to throw your weight around with powers and theoretical military might. You had the ability to send special forces out to handle crises elsewhere, in places that weren't the city. Now we can do the same. The diplomats are nodding their heads, my dad said. They're in agreement, Narwhal asked. For right now, can you stop it? All power use, all movement? The dauntless titan is mobilized, and we have no idea how threatening it is. It might be picking a fight, tapping your giant knight for power, or creating a confluence of power that disrupts everything. Stopping it could be more dangerous. Let's get him to his destination, and he can begin his work. We think he can cut back the machine army in a way you guys haven't been able to. If the Dauntless Titan fights him, isn't it better if it happens in the Old Earth than in your city? At the edges of a quarantine zone? Narwhal asked. No, not at all. If this fails, we have other options. I can use my power. A disease to infect the machines and sweep over our Old Earth and the machine army. Narwhal approached the desk, leaning over it, and looked over at Carol. That makes no sense. A day ago, you probably would have said the Shin Defense Initiative made no sense, Amy rebutted. If you recall, Red Queen, I've named at least three good reasons why your giants make no sense and are exceptionally dangerous in the current predicament. The government on our side feels differently, Amy said. You seem very intent on charging forward with this. Is it to provide a proof of concept? A demonstration of strength, assuming the giants were safe and totally out of control, pretending for the moment that the Dauntless Titan wasn't on the approach, and assuming a hypothetical where the machine army was an immediate and present threat, an equal power relationship would involve discussion and compromise. Not equal, Amy said. Fair. On her side of the call, no doubt harder to make out than Narwhal had been for them to make out, I could hear a male voice. I imagined Louis, the smartly dressed black man with the umbrella who had been in Goddess's company, who had kind of fucked us over with the Shin prison thing. Him or the other guy? Louis says just, Amy translated. Fuck you. Can you elaborate on your stance? Narwhal asked. If you give me a second, I'll translate, my father said. Thank you. I had a bad feeling. It was hard to put my finger on. If I had to, if I was challenged to, I kind of felt like the way Amy had said just 
was the kind of way the old me would have said it. The old me who had faced down a human trafficker that had coerced and sold teenage girls into prostitution and knocked his literal teeth out. Just was only a good word if the person leaning on them felt like they were making the concession. I want to see her die burning, but I have to grudgingly admit that would be wrong and barbaric. Ten years in prison and a course towards rehabilitation is just. Justice. But if it came from the top, from a place of paramount power, from a place of satisfaction, then just changed from justice to justification. Justification for revenge. Justification for wrongs. My dad explained. Lewis says he speaks for the rest of this world with this. The Wardens, Megalopolis, and Megalopolis government have had years now to demonstrate how to act when holding the reins of power. Now they intend to use this as a model. This is their justice. We have four giants, and any one of those giants could be a match for one of your teams. We have six more on the way right now. They'll be done in a matter of four hours. By this time tomorrow, we can have ten. By the end of the week, it'll be fifteen. He sounded a little awed by what he was relaying. No doubt he had Amy beside him, looking confident. Was it only now, sinking in? What are you doing, Dad? What are you thinking? Narwhal strode over to another desk, leaning over to talk to a tech. Are you there? Amy asked. Yes. Narwhal's voice came over our speakers as she spoke through a microphone at the other desk. On the screen above, the map of Shin changed, indicating more icons like the ones we'd used for the giants. Each had a timer above them. Give us a moment, my mom told them. Of course, my dad said. I saw the mute button appear on the monitor at the desk. Brandish, Narwhal called out. Yes? Miss Militia's notes say Shin places a high emphasis on family. They do. I saw it when I was there. If you can have a pleasant conversation with your husband, and if you're comfortable being open in front of this many people, I can. It wouldn't be out of place for a businessman to break from business to tend to a child, or to call a wife about an errand. It would even make them appear stronger. It's part of the reason Flashbang is on the call. I'll do that. Only do it if you can keep it pleasant and positive. Understood. The mute button disappeared. I've missed you, Mark. You've missed things. Was my mom thinking about last night's conversation? Sins of decades past? I can imagine, my dad said. Packed up and moved for the evacuation? Our things are packed. I'm staying at our niece's apartment. We're packing. We saw my sister this morning. A pause. Through Valkyrie? Valkyrie. We had a very emotional conversation, reuniting. Crystal was there. Victoria, too, but she had other reunions, too. I... I have missed things. What do I even say to that? Wow, I heard Amy say. I didn't think she'd finish that project. Was it just me that felt like that line was so alien, intrusive, and out of place? Vista turned in her chair giving me a brief, weirded-out look. Thank you, Vista. You're a gem. I appreciate you being freaked out by that more than I can tell you. Well, she did, Carol said. I'm sorry you both missed the reunion. Was Mike there? No, they weren't able to get in touch. I would love to have you and him there for a future meeting. You're doing good work there, Mark. Amy's voice cut through. How was she, Aunt Sarah? As well as could be expected my mom said, considering her death and rebirth. I wish I could check on her, on all of you. Fuck you, I thought. There's no need, my mother said. There's some need, mom. You're still not better. You left abruptly to look after Victoria. Victoria? I wanted to jump in, deliver a biting line about Hunter, asking if she'd healed her yet. I wanted to attack Amy, to tear her down, get past all of those layers of defenses, with the benefit of the fact that she couldn't reach me here, and that I didn't have to look at her, shout at her, scream at her, point out her flaws in logic, put her on the defensive, and put my metaphorical boot through that defense. I'm here, 
What is it? I asked. Is Mom walking without difficulty? Is the head injury healed? That's a bit personal, I said. Please? We're being personal already, talking about reunions and rebirth. She's strong. You wouldn't know something's wrong unless you knew what to look for. I saw my mom smile slightly. No, Victoria. You said you'd help me. That means being honest, Amy said, her voice touched by the stress. Narwhal was working on stuff at the other desk, phone at her ear. I could look up from the screen that was tracking the ongoing call, and I could see the map below the image of the Gibberim Knight. More teams were being deployed, in addition to Chevaliers. There's a ways to go, I conceded. Exactly, see? I know you have your war wounds, Victoria. I could have healed them on your last visit if the circumstances had been different. Dad has his head injury. Uncle Mark, Eric, and Sarah all died. I'd rather not talk about them, Crystal spoke up. But listen, what if we don't have to do that anymore? What if Labrat and I brew up the means to tackle the real emergencies and disasters? Villain warlords, machine armies, out-of-control powers, rifts in reality? We create something like this. Incredibly strong, durable, and ultimately victimless. And we weren't talking about family anymore. Amy had twisted the conversation back to her agenda. An aggrieved-looking narwhal patched back into the conversation. We have zero guarantee that this would be victimless. This has complicated our situation with Dauntless, and lives may be lost from that alone. You're assuming a degree of control over these things that hasn't been tested or proven, and if you lost control, it would clearly be catastrophic, both for Shin and for the Megalopolis. I'm in control. Even if we assumed 100%, I've been working on it with Marquis, and I did pick up some things from associating with Glastic Wenye and growing up with superheroes. Even if we assumed 100% control, there are other risks. That someone could control you and control them through you. Don't those risks apply to Dragon? She has her AI. Dragon has oversight. Her partner, other wardens. We know her well enough that we could handle such a situation. Do you? I was told it was a bit of a revelation that she was an AI. Not to the higher-ups, Narwhal said. I have oversight too, don't worry. Family, a colleague, protectors, a small army of loyal parahumans who have defected to our parahuman-only state, and the rest of Shin. I'm protected. I know I'm protected, because I know I'm inconvenient enough to your power base that you'd want to remove me. She sounded high. I felt agitated, deeply uncomfortable, with that dark and paralyzing cloud of panic creeping in. I didn't think drugs were involved, but... I approached Narwhal, but she was talking. That's not how we operate. They know what they're working with when they're working with me. Someone who doesn't buy into the superhero stuff, who knows from personal, visceral experience what kind of things can happen. I indicated I wanted to speak to Narwhal, and she used a force field to lift a pad of paper my way. An employee handed me a pen. We're running out of time to act, Narwhal said. Something visceral will happen if you keep stalling. Is that what you want? I'm not stalling, even in the slightest. I'm laying out my points, and you haven't really answered any of them. Fuck you, I thought. My hand was shaking too much to clearly put pen to paper. I hadn't realized I was that affected. Fuck you too, pen. With a jagged letter S to start, I wrote, She's high, not drugs. Riding a rush of optimism, feeling powerful, feeling needed, hopeful, and above all, she is at the center of family. You can knock down any argument and any individual feeling, but she will fall back on the rest. You won't stop it without knocking down all at once, but this will lead to pos breakdown. Manipulate her. I hesitated before handing it to Narwhal. I turned, then handed it to Darnall because he was a step closer to me than Jessica. He and Jessica read it, and he whispered something into her ear. She nodded. I felt somehow more nervous about that than I would about handing the pad as it was to Narwhal. He held out his hand for the pen, 
wrote something down, and then handed me pad and pen both. He'd added a line to the bottom. This isn't working. Y, D. I handed it to Narwhal, who was talking. Question of control is something you have to prove with us, not something we have to prove you lack, especially with something this grave. What proof were the wardens supplying to Shin? On the core wardens' team alone, our chief members alone, we have more than two hundred years between us of reliable public service, years of showing respect to law and order, restraint, courage, and virtue. And you trusted me with supervision, Narwhal said, finally reading the note. You trusted me to supervise. With supervision of your own, Red Queen, Narwhal said, you don't have those same decades of public service, and you do have some glaring marks on your record. You guys let the world end. How can you get more glaring than that? Amy raised her voice. You were there as well, and you played a complicating role there too. And I'm sorry, I need to step away. Something's happening with the greater situation. Do you want to stay on the line, or should I call? I'll stay. Narwhal motioned. A tech put the call on mute. Greater situation? Cineral asked from the sidelines. I'm not technically lying. It is happening. Narwhal indicated the map. But we're getting bogged down. We're no closer to resolving this, Cineral said. Chevalier is close enough to observe. His squads are in position, but we're holding off until other squads arrive. And Tari's provided me with a note, suggesting another track. I know we're definitely on the wrong one. Who or what is Y.D.? Me, Darnall said. I can't confirm because I don't know Amy, but I can say this reminds me of a video I watched of a Munchausen syndrome by proxy patient. What Antares described to me seems apt. Is this Munchausen's? Crystal asked. No, but there are parts of it I recognize. Victoria describes this as a high, if I can explain. Go ahead, I said. A rush of optimism, validation, hope, delusion, and a need to feel needed. MSBP patients will lie about someone being sick so they can be the savior. Here, we have a situation misrepresented, and she's put herself forward as savior. It validates her feelings. Victoria says that you can't knock down one side of her argument because the remainder will hold her up. And if you do knock down the one wall, by the time you get to the second or third, that first wall is back up. Arguments conveniently forgotten, I said. My welcome Vista, Crystal, my mother, and the therapist arguing me down here. She didn't used to be like this, Crystal said. She totally did, but the stakes weren't as high, I told her. The thought processes were like that. She was, stubborn's the wrong word, fluid? No backbone. Let's stay focused on the matter at hand, Narwhal said. Two ways forward, I said. Break her or manipulate her. I know that sounds awful, but we've kind of tried being nice. If we could get her into custody and get her treatment, that would be best. Or prison world and remote therapy. That's not doable when she's secured herself as the source of Shin's power base. To say you'll break someone sounds horrifying, Crystal admitted. Especially someone we once saw as family. Can you? Cineral asked. I think I could, if I had to, I replied. I think I got close in the Shin prison when she cornered me, but there was a very real risk she would use her powers on me then. God, it felt so fucking weak saying that when I didn't have the context. With all of these people listening and watching, I could smash through walls. I was invincible. I had my aura. But there had been context there. My teammates' lives on the line. The hostages. I desperately wanted someone to chime in, to point those things out, like my mom had chimed in for Vista. But no, just hung out there. Breaking someone like Amy could be disastrous, Narwhal said. It might not mean breaking her down 100%, I replied. It could mean shaking Shin's faith in her. I can see the merits, Cineral said. I can't, Narwhal retorted. The risks are higher. 
especially when you are having to make them concerned enough that it outweighs their concerns about us and the cultural fears and concerns that stem from goddess. But the long-term benefit is Shin realizes this is a stupid idea. What about manipulation? Narwhal asked. She has so much of what she wants, but she wants me, her sister, maybe more than all the rest. I caught Jessica's expression changing as I said it. I looked away, and I looked at my mom, and that didn't make things better. What the hell was I doing here? Was it possible to feel like I was the only person who could handle this? And simultaneously, I was the last person who should be here? I swallowed. Just by being a part of this conversation with her, I'm sticking my neck out a bit. But if it takes her mind off her current goals, I can distract her. Saying those words gave me a feeling like a sinking feeling but in every direction. A quiet, crawling horror. And then I didn't feel connected to the body or the voice that was positing that idea. I could imagine it being like what Darlene did, remotely in a body, managing thoughts, but not owning those actions, thoughts, or that body. Every second I experienced it, it was worse, colder, more quietly horrifying. I would prefer the distraction, Narwhal told me. Okay? I said, still feeling like I was a very here kind of far away. I can do that. Our goal is to divert the Titan. Delay? I asked. We would accept a delay. Okay, feel free to start us up again. I'll jump in. If I'm unsure about something, I'll give you a note. You stop if I signal. You listen to any instructions I give you. Got it, I said. I'll be in contact with Chevalier. Cineral said. The screen colors changed as the mute indicators disappeared. We're back, Narwhal said. Any issues on your end? None, Amy said. What happened? We have less than ten minutes before Dauntless meets your gibberim knight. This is a fight that seems bound to happen, unless you pull back. We can't do that in good conscience, Amy said. And I'll remind you, you were the ones saying I was trying to delay or buy time, but you took a good few minutes just now to handle your issue. Don't say there's a time limit like it bothers us. We're confident in what we're doing. You're the ones fretting. Shin is concerned about the threat the machine army poses. We have a decision to make about what the venue will be for that intersection of two powers. A critically sensitive quarantine zone, or a city where any power use could be what sets off a multi-world disaster. We should consider the city. No, the quarantine zone. I know the knight's capabilities. Do you know Dauntless's? More than you would think, Amy said. Then reassure me. I've used my power to study people representing key pieces of infrastructure among powers. I can understand powers fundamentally, by touching people close enough to powers. That's how I can do this. With Labrat's help to precipitate things, I can create vessels that take the person out of the power and leave us with incredibly powerful tools. I believe you, I said. Narwhal stepped back, giving me a look of barely restrained patience. I could tell she just wanted to convince Amy, and she'd keep trying it given the chance. I hope you'll believe me, Amy said, with a huff of a sound that might have been a short laugh. You've touched it. I've walked it, I said. What? I went there, last night, to the place the powers come from. One of them, apparently. Breakthrough, damsel of distress, tattletale. What the hell are you doing associating with tattletale? That doesn't matter, I said. Focus, Amy. I've wondered where you get some weird ideas in your head about me, and now I find out you've been associating with the queen of head screws? Kind of really does matter. Amy, I said, believe it or not, I'm giving you the one damn thing you've been asking for. I'm kind of on your side. As of last night, I've been there. I've seen what you've seen. I'm pretty sure. Stop fighting me for five seconds and accept that fact. There was silence on the other end. Assuming you're telling the truth, Amy said, more subdued now, you guys are desperate. Is Tattletail there? No, I said. We're getting sidetracked, Narwhal said. 
I leaned forward, hand on the desk. Point is, Amy, she gave us some insights. You knew Swansong. You sort of know Damsel by proxy. You know Swansong was being paid for her insights into the powers and the place they come from. Damsel was there. And now you're going to tell me that I'm wrong. I don't get it. You think you know more than me after, what, a day there? Half a day? Hours? Amy, stop. You asked for my help. I'm giving it. I can't believe I'm doing it, but here we fucking are, so stop. The silence was tense. Had I pushed it with the fucking? I could see it being too informal, when this was technically a diplomatic meeting. Listen to your sister. My mom's voice. I looked over at her. What do you want from me? Amy finally spoke, more subdued. Let's talk about this one workable bit of common ground. Remember how I was super into studying powers? Of course I do. Still am. I've got a bookshelf filled with my collection of power texts, capes files, notes. Narwhal motioned for me to hurry up. And I studied a lot while I was in the hospital after... I trailed off. I know, yeah, Amy said. So you know your thing. I know my thing. Explain. Let's talk about your chevalier. Okay. Chris stole a scan of his DNA during one of the back and forths with the wardens. I used that scan to make something close enough the power could reach back, leaving the floodgates to power open. Chris forced the connection and gave it a body that could handle the power, like a lot of the broken triggers can't. But why him? Why is he the one you're sending? Because he exists in multiple states at once, and the machine army, I'm told, does the same thing. They compress seeds of their material into dense matter, and when they have something big and dense enough, even a boulder, they use them to house interdimensional pockets. The biggest machines and installments have those same pockets. If you nuke the area, the pocket leaks out, and before you know it, you've got an infestation again. He can get past that and do enough damage. They have other tech, other countermeasures. Is your knowledge of the machine army limited to what Dot told you? Your goblin? No, Amy said. Hello. Hello, Dot, I said, my voice tense. Are you looking after Amy like I asked you to? Uh Uh-huh, kinda. I was briefed on the machine army in some depth, Amy said. They wanted to see if I could do something that would clear them away. I had to make pathogens that would stay long enough to capture the leak or be able to get through it. Narwhal wrote something on a note. They said no to that. I read. Yes, but that was then. Good to know. Is he going to punch his way through it? Overturn every stone? This is a replicating robot threat that infests, recycles, and adapts. He can. At least in a swath around the portal. He can cut them back. And if they infect him? We know they can operate interdimensionally. They can plant those seeds. He can chew them up. It's his domain and focus. It's like saying they have blowtorches, so they're a threat to a burning continent. They have blowtorches, and they got those blowtorches scarily fast. It's like saying those people who learned to make blowtorches with amazing speed might learn and adapt to that burning continent, given enough time. I don't intend to give them time. You said a swath around the portal. A secure area? Yes, but that's for now. I wanted to reassure you that this was going to be quick and painless. In a matter of hours, we'll have other strong powers, other clones. We have tools. Amy, you're fighting me again. Are we collaborating on this or not? I'm not fighting you. Are we collaborating? Come on, time's getting shorter. Is there a world where you're with Shin, I'm here in the city, and we work together to find a solution that makes both sides happy? I kept my voice level, but the look in my eyes was a steady glare. The feeling in my stomach, a stew pot of indignation and disgust. And my body still didn't feel like it was my own, in the eeriness of the moment. Like a tiny, healthy part of me had fled or pulled back so it wouldn't have to hear her voice, or hear mine putting words together like collaborating. We already ruled out compromise, Lewis said. We didn't exactly, Amy said. If it comes down to compromise or Shin backing down, we won't. The call cut off, muting. 
I drew in a deep breath. My fingernailless finger dug into the soft part of my thumb like I could stab it. I didn't look at the others present, the entirety of my focus on this. Mark? My mom asked. Is this doable? There was only silence. Their side was still muted. I looked up at the map. Four minutes until interception. Until Dauntless met Chevalier. The Chevalier had paused at a stockpile of construction materials, gathering more things. A weapon. A shield. Armor for the chest. Armor for the face. The interception time didn't change much as a consequence of his stalling. He was wholly focused on his mission. I was wholly focused on mine. Mark, my mom said, can our girls do this? Ah, that was why she'd spoken up. She'd wanted to get in that our girls bit. My skin felt uncomfortable against the meat of me beneath. I felt betrayed, even though I knew exactly why she was doing what she was doing. We can, Amy's voice came through. Shin won't back down on this. We won't trust you to handle everyone's crises, and the machine army is a big enough threat that it counts as everyone's problem. We want our chevalier out there. Where's the collaboration in that? I asked. Our forces standing next to your forces. I manage the Shin defense initiative. You handle your side. Ongoing relationship. I don't see the relationship there. That sounds like you doing what you want and expecting me to go along, I said. You'd be free to do whatever you wanted. I'm not trying to control you. I saw Darnall move in the corner of my vision. He was staring at me. I racked my brain, thinking about options. The pieces in play. I preferred talking about powers, I said. You would, Amy said, like she was familiar with me, and we were having a casual conversation. Nah, I said, and it was really hard not to inject a terminal amount of venom into the negation. This is about you. You were never that into the boots-on-the-ground cape stuff. You never imagined yourself as team leader of a cape team. No, I never did. But I kind of stumbled into something way bigger, she said. But you don't enjoy it. You don't go straight to the capes and how you can use them. You're more introspective. Sure, she said. Yeah, so? It's not possible. We can't possibly lead our individual sides. Her voice got more bitter toward the tail end. I don't think it's possible for a lot of reasons, I told her. But I think there are other possibilities. Knock down a wall, erect another. Narwhal was looking impatient. What possibility? Problem solving? Inventing solutions? Putting our heads together? Gag. The silence was always telling. Like Amy was digesting, processing, and testing a possibility against every damn possible contradiction she could come up with. Did it challenge anything essential? Did it threaten a fragile worldview she was holding up? Was it a trap? Sure. What are you thinking? I looked up at the screens. The Gibberim Knight, the Nursery Agent, the Dauntless. Two more. Many more pending. Two of those were immediate concerns. And the timer was ticking down. Interception imminent. Don't send the Gibberim Knight. Victoria, that's not... Fucking listen to me, you miserable, deluded little monster! I snarled, with the venom I'd been suppressing a hostility that seemed to surprise more than a few people present. Fucking listen for five seconds before you reject an idea, or I swear! Narwhal put a hand to my shoulder, holding me back. My volume dropped, the venom scaling back. The stakes are too high. You either stop, slow down, and listen, or that's it. Last effort you'll ever get from me. I'm offering you a solution. Ultimatums are manipulative, Marquis's voice came through. I could have killed him if he were actually present. Fucking right they are. If anyone but you speaks, Amy, or if you give me a refusal instead of a hearing out, that's it. I'm walking out of this room, 
and I'll drop something massive on you from a place so high up you can't even see me before I even allow myself the chance of reaching out to you again. Decide. I had probably alienated so many people with the outburst, hurt my standing with good capes. I had tears in my eyes, and I hated it. I gave so much of myself to reach out, for the sake of others, and even for her, to extend her small graces and benefits of doubt, and she didn't even give me a spare thought. It wasn't that she didn't reach back. It was that she didn't even think to. Okay, she said. The nursery creation, it produces life forms? Yes. Out of imperfect meat? Like most power-created life? It does, yes. It spawns things that produce the aura, area-altering effect? Yes. She hesitated before each statement, being careful, holding herself back. Can it produce life that doesn't have the interdimensional effect? The spawn it makes can. Then can you have it send a stream of its minions to the quarantine site? Have them file in, dig things up, push things around, and fight the machines. It should be single file, past the danger area where an ongoing fight would disrupt quarantine. I can't. I tensed. But that's not me being unwilling. It's the control over the lesser minions I'm worried about. I... Amy hesitated. I glared at the screen. I could go. I'll give individual instructions to each spawned giant we're sending to the quarantine zone until we have enough there or we find another option. Does that postpone the creation of the other SDI soldiers? I could hear a shin-accented voice. Lewis's colleague. Possibly, but we're ahead of schedule, Amy said. I looked at Narwhal. She didn't look happy, but she was nodding a bit. Delays, at least, were a bit of sugar, making an imperfect compromise a bit easier to swallow. The other problem is that they're strong, but they'll lose eventually. How is this any better? Power-produced materials don't make good building materials or supplies. It was part of what slowed down the city rebuild, why we couldn't feed the masses with power-generated flesh. If the machine army tries to make or fuel anything with the meat, then that will degrade or suffer for it. It poisons their well. Keep your gibberim night and nursery away. If Dauntless is pursuing them, pull them back. Bait him out of the city. You get your presence at the quarantine zone. Shin gets to be needed. We get both of the immediate threats resolved. No, Lewis cut in. I turned away from the screen, ready to leave. The only reason I didn't was that I met Jessica's eyes. Yes, Amy called out. Yes, pulling back the gibberum night now. I'll send the mother of mothers minions in shortly. I could hear the exchange of words. Lewis was pissed. We'll work it out, Mark said. The call cut off. I could believe he was the one to do it, seizing the moment. Maybe he'd pay for it. For shutting off the call, making things harder, not playing along like a little kind of prisoner of shin. Nobody really commented, except for an exchange of words murmured between Cinerol and Narwhal. People focused on their work. Only Crystal, Vista, and my mom glanced at me. My mom was the only one who held that eye contact for more than a second or two. The timer sat at two minutes, twelve seconds, and it began to increase. Not increasing as fast as it ticked down, but the time stretched out. Someone input something, and the clock updated. Seven more minutes remaining. The Chevalier cloned agent was retreating. We have to direct it, Narwhal said. Send it out of the city and away from any refugee settlements. Get in touch with Shin ASAP. Was that okay? I asked, quiet, not taking my eyes off of the screen. I know it's not how you would have wanted to do it, but... It was, Narwhal said. We weren't getting through. You did. We'll take that for what it is. You could really use my team on this, I said, still quiet. Subdued like I was a lesser person in the aftermath of it all, despite my best efforts. Holding them back doesn't make sense. Lookout can keep an eye on Shin, and we really need one. 
Precipice has gotten past Mathers twice, and he was the one who got her. Mathers is, I'm guessing, why the precogs aren't on this. Her and the goddess clone. We can talk about that shortly. It may be best to stick to the schedule for that review by Warden's leadership. It is slow, but less complicated, and we could do with some less complicated, Narwhal said. I nodded. She turned back to the screen, but the hand she'd laid on my shoulder earlier was still there, shifting to a resting one as she turned in a quarter circle, more reassuring. It remained there for a few seconds, before someone needed her to take a tablet with some team information on it. Excuse me, I said, feeling hollowed out. I need a breath of fresh air. My mom wasn't fast enough out of her seat, and I motioned for her to stay down. Crystal didn't follow. Vista had her duties. Darnall and Jessica intercepted me, like the dauntless titan and accompanying Seamorg seemed intent on intercepting the chevalier. A matter of seconds for them to intercept me. A matter of seven minutes for the titan to meet the giant. They met me out in the hall. All of us were dead silent as we walked past Gollum and Cuff, past two members of the flock. I probably just validated every fear you've had about the Victoria from teacher's documented diary, I said. Jessica didn't answer. Do you need anything? Darnall asked. I shook my head. Can I call someone? Half the people you could call are in that room and saw that. The other half I'm not allowed to talk to, I said, bitter. And I could understand why it wasn't allowed to talk to them. But fuck. And I didn't like Darnall. I respected him, but I didn't like him. And I couldn't look at Jessica without imagining her strangling her patient. How are you? Darnall asked. Would you rather Jessica step away? We can have a chat? I shook my head. I wanted the opposite, despite those intrusive thoughts about the strangling. I don't know what else I could have or should have done, I said. I'm legitimately scared, because I gave her implicit permission to approach, to get closer to me. I feel gross and hollow and shitty, and I can't... can't take the feeling and tie settings to them and connect them to the origins. Except I know I hate her. So much. I hate that she makes me feel like this. I hate that she won't go away. I hate that I want to get far away from being the Victoria who took satisfaction and relief from beating up Nazis, and at the same time, all I want right now is to fly away, ignore the restrictions on power use, and do what I said earlier about dropping something on Amy, while she's processing those giants for the quarantine zone. I hate it. I hate that I'm walking away feeling like this might not have been worth it, because I can't shake the feeling that this isn't the thing that breaks the city and sets everything off. I should step away, Jessica said. This is more for Darnall than for me. I'm okay with sharing it with you. I know, but I'm not your therapist, and I can't be a support in this moment. Because of Riley Davis, I asked, angry. Bone saw? She stopped. I saw the emotions, like so many of the ones I'd just tried to explain in a ramble. No hate, no anger, but sadness and shame. Feelings so weighty and consuming that she could have ego crushing feelings about those feelings. It was a horrible moment, my own stomach wrenching with a regret that I'd said it like that, for those reasons time seemed to crawl. And in the midst of that slow, horrible moment, people started moving, like a starter pistol had gone off, but no pistol. Voices getting louder, people running, doors opening fast enough they banged against the wall. I pulled away, heading back to the others, to a point in the hallway where I could see through the situation room door as people rushed out and squeezed in. The timer was still ticking down, Four minutes on the clock. But Dauntless was attacking, striking out with his lance from miles away, to carve out chunks of the Chevalier, sending him crashing into a building. The Chevalier got to his feet and continued to retreat.
Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 6 Dauntless continued his assault, striking out repeatedly, with a spear of lightning that curved and arced around clusters of buildings. There were a lot of buildings, so each attack had to be timed. The knight kept its heavy shield up, retreating, enduring strikes that sometimes sent him skidding back a hundred feet. Sometimes he fell with the impacts, tearing up road and toppling heel overhead, always getting his shield up and in the way before the next strike, always keeping the shield at an angle so he would be driven down and back and not purely back and away. When intervening buildings provided cover, it ran, shield over its back. Glass fell from nearby windows with every heavy footfall like the world wept with its passing. Fucking Amy. Dauntless only advanced. He didn't walk, his body more a pillar between sky and ground than a body. He flowed forward, scraped past the city, navigating a path that favored lakes and water, parks and open spaces. Some buildings fell, but the damage to the city proper was minimal, all considering. Had he been moving in a straight line, he would have caught the knight already. His weapon remained extended, a spear of light and lightning, with fat, blob-like sparks larger than cars dripping off of it as its energy reached capacity, then exceeded it, waiting for the next clear shot. And the Seamorg stood on the back of his hand now. Back straight, wings spread, hair blowing in the wind, the golden light of the weapon itself suffusing her reflective silver skin. Like she was an extension of the weapon. The cameras they were using zoomed in on her, and the image began to distort. Someone made the call to exclusively use the camera behind Dauntless, which viewed the scene from an angle where his body mostly blocked 90% of the Seamorg. Only a few wingtip feathers were visible past his arm. Sensible call. There were more people in the situation room that I didn't know now, and far less in the way of familiar faces. Less capes, more civilians. My family had departed, and so had Vista and Narwhal. Only Cineral remained. I stood to the left of the door, my back to the wall, my hip resting against a protruding vent at the wall, where someone had left a coffee and a small pad of papers. My new vantage point for watching things crumble. Monitors showed the monsters and their respective journeys, with numbers in the corners going up as teachers' tech continued to track the threat and chance of things breaking. My new vantage point because I'd just moved a minute ago. I'd been standing with my right elbow touching the doorframe before. I'd moved because the monitor showing nursery had included a new set of guests, my sister. And I really didn't want to look at her. Moving meant a jutting bit of ductwork blocked off most of that image. That was reason one. Reason two was that Darnall and Jessica stood to the right of the door. A part of me had hoped that by moving, leaving a void to my right for someone else to stand in, Jessica might approach. Instead, they talked in low voices, unintelligible, not that I tried to listen in. I paid more attention to the flow of the room, the degree of agitation, and the tenor of conversations that I couldn't make out. I told myself I was being aware without being aware, existing in that state that was supposed to work with the shard space, just in case I had to go back. My empty fingernail bed pressed against my upper arm. It burned like it was on fire, if fire was sharp. Pay attention to the beats that land, the moments of impact, the key elements in the flow of it all. Tension, agitation, people writing things down, Cineral leaning forward, taking over the comms. What little I could make out of her voice was more familiar, casual. It made me think more of me talking to a member of Breakthrough than me talking to Natalie. My eyes went to the screens just before they changed over. 
all screens now displaying different angles of the same event. Chevalier in his new armor, black, white, and gold, bearing a sword that looked similar, grown large, the blade carving a furrow in the street behind him as he ran. As he reached an intersection where he had more room to navigate, he hefted the sword, treating it as feather light despite its massive scale. It batted through two traffic lights and grazed a memorial stone that lined the main street as it came forward, came down. He vaulted, striking the ground, lifting himself up, until the cannon blade was directly below him. Both hands on the handle, one foot on the trigger guard, he scaled up the weapon, extending its length, carrying himself up. It couldn't quite grow long enough to get him to where he wanted to be, but the camera showed him reaching into the handle with a shallow flicker surrounding him up to the shoulders, just like the kind that surrounded the distant night. He fell for a moment as he swung his blade overhead, cutting into a building. That cut was his point of leverage to use the blade to carry himself to the roof of a ten-story building that hadn't yet finished construction, blade extending, carrying him back and out, lurching slightly as he adjusted before landing on a partially finished rooftop surrounded by yellow-painted girders and beams. Two of the three screens I could see showed him. The screen in the middle showed the dauntless titan and its uninterrupted approach. A shift of the image showed the speck that was Chevalier standing on the building, easier to identify by the framing of girders and beams around him than by his silhouette, and the distant titan, Dauntless. Chevalier adjusted his grip on the blade, raising it up and away from the building it had cut, bringing it overhead to where snow swirled around it, then letting it swing down, sweeping within a foot or two of the building's face like a pendulum blade. Getting a grip, or deciding on a course of action before he moved the blade and extended it across the street and down, into a parking garage, a diagonal bar across the Titan's path. One screen to capture the two of them, with some distortion from the Seamorg's presence in the picture, a slash of silver-white against a brassy gold and the hard, dark angles that formed the Titan's lower body. Chevalier closer to the image, yet so much smaller. His sword was large and comparatively ornate, a barrier across the four-lane road. The entire situation room was holding its breath as the Titan continued its advance. The distortion got worse, with heavy artifacting across the middle of the image. Come on, come on. The Titan continued forward until it was so large in scale that it couldn't be fully contained within the image without zooming out so far that Chevalier wouldn't be visible. The image remained zoomed in on Chevalier and the cannon blade. He moved the cannon blade, lifting it, swinging it out to a point at the Titan, at the Seamorg. The Endbringer took off, flying skyward. The Titan ceased moving. After a long pause, it lowered its spear. Chevalier reported in, saying something over the comms. His voice was almost entirely static, and only the cadence of that static suggested it was speech. Almost understandable, in the same way an abstract painting could be understandable if one fuzzed their vision enough. Cineral straightened, adjusting a few key pieces of her costume, hand touching her hair. She made her way to the door which would make the people who were present and who I knew in any capacity just Jessica and Darnall. Cineral stopped as she saw me. What can I do? I asked. Stay put. Don't contact your team for now, she said. Be patient. If what you did yesterday was dangerous, we don't want to chase that danger. If it was useful, it's going to be more useful after things break down than before. I wanted to respond to that, to counter that those weren't mutually exclusive. But where Narwhal was the kind of militant, no-nonsense, all-business leader who I was pretty sure would bow to better arguments, I wasn't positive Cineral was anything like that. Cineral was allegedly unfair, unreasonable, in training, expectations, her lack of patience, and her propensity to hold grudges. 
I kept my mouth shut, nodding instead. She wasn't necessarily wrong. Even if I could help with both this current situation and the one we might be dealing with later tonight. Pulling together a meeting with everyone in one place seems difficult, Cinerol said. Eric! Death and rebirth were on my mind so much that I felt a sudden emotional twinge at the notion that it might be my kid cousin. A bit of pain at the realization it wasn't. Eric was a suit roughly my age, jacket already removed and sitting on one of the nearby chairs. Good-looking in the way that the features that weren't classically good-looking added rather than distracted. In his case, it was a pronounced Roman nose that was maybe one half-size too big, with a flat bit across the bridge suggesting it had been broken once and never set right. Tan skin, brown hair with blonde highlights, a light purple dress shirt, black tie with a pin, black slacks, and nice black wingtips with a bit of scuffing at the toe, like he'd kicked something or nudged a dirty door open with his foot at one point. She didn't take her eyes off me as she said, Eric, look after Miss Dallin. I have a brief set of pending questions I was going over that I'll send to you. Run them by her. Get any final statements from her, if she has anything to add outside of the notes she gave Defiant. Transcribe them. Stay close enough that she can ask you if she wants something. Send us your notes in the next ten or fifteen. I glanced at him. In the process, I caught him sizing me up. Bandaged hand, scarred hand with a wavy burn along the back. Traveling across my chest for a half second too long, back up to face. No trace of embarrassment or shame. It was so hard to put my finger on just why I held it against him when Byron had done something similar on our first meeting, but he'd glanced away. I wasn't sure there was a strict set of rules for judging that kind of thing, only gut feeling and instinct. And my instincts were bad. I frowned a bit. He smiled to match the frown in intensity. I wanted to talk to Mark Dallin, if that's okay, I said. And to Jessica, but... Semi-officially, there are only two others I trust to give me a fair assessment of what's going on over there. Chris Elman is the other? Cineral asked, eyebrows raising. I could have laughed, but I was pretty sure that laughing in Cineral's face would earn me that grudge, and I wanted to be in her good graces if it meant working with the wardens. There were too many resources and too many people I respected tied into their group. It was too important that we share information. Dot, I told her. Amy's goblin, or imp. If the conversation earlier had gone a bit differently, I would have brought her into it. I have to go, or I'd ask, so Eric will have to be the one to ask you why. We won't be more than an hour, Antares. We'll exchange emails and messages while traveling. I looked. Chevalier had retreated from his perch. Dauntless remained where he was, surrounded by tall buildings, each and every one of them smaller than him. Good luck, I told her. I don't believe in luck, Cineral told me. We work hard to let opportunities happen. Can't argue that, I answered, clenching my burned hand for a second, feeling how tight the skin was. And she was gone back into the fray, leaving me with Eric. I looked back and saw Jessica following Cineral out. Jessica, she paused. I'm sorry to spring that on you, and I know it might not be my business, but it's kind of my business? Didn't make sense. Cineral was out in the hallway. Eric was here. I was being studied, analyzed. My career, such as it was, was in the balance. But other things mattered more. Jessica's expression softened in a way that didn't really equate to being happy nor calm. You're right. Can we talk? I've been asked to give access to some files. I need to find the right ones, to preserve confidentiality for the rest. I'll be no more than ten minutes. Okay. And that was that. Armstrong was gone, Jessica and Darnall were gone, Cinerol was gone, and I literally knew nobody here in the Situation Room. 
except for Eric, who I'd been introduced to a minute ago. That sounded important, Eric said. It sounded like none of your business. It was, I think. It's going to be a minute before she sends me the questions I'm supposed to ask, Eric said. He smiled. I'm supposed to ask about Dot, your sister's goblin. Maybe that's a starting point? Not really. Talking about Amy is a really shitty start to any dialogue. She's unfiltered, I said. Keep it business. Her views aren't human views. Neither is her perspective. Really low-to-the-ground perspective, I have to imagine, Eric said. She's tiny. Was he cracking a joke? It was hard to tell his regular smile from his joking smile. He hadn't won any benefits of a doubt from me. I didn't return the smile. Huh? No. Alien perspective, I said. Where she's coming from, where she's going. Amy does something wrong. Dot thinks that something is interesting. Amy tries to defend that something. Dot admits it happened. You get to see behind the curtain. You spend a lot of time thinking about this, huh? Eric asked. He looked away in the direction of the screen with the nursery thing and the monsters. I've had to. The way you talked to your sister, a lot of history? The wardens know that part, I said. Out of curiosity, I looked for and spotted the sticker I'd been looking at during harder conversations earlier. If they could talk to Dot alone and keep the conversation friendly, I think she'd admit to a lot of Amy's crimes and wrongdoing, if only because she doesn't think of them as crimes. That's basically it. You immediately think of crimes and wrongdoing? I gave him a look, meeting his eyes again. I saw him studying me, looking at my neck, up to my face, but not in the sense that he was making eye contact. Not for a half second there. He saw my eyes and locked eye contact again, unflinching, unblinking, unabashed, like a dominance thing, like he was trying to convey with gaze and eye contact that he wasn't ashamed and he was proud to be looking at me or some shit. Definitely no fucking benefit of a doubt now. This wasn't the fucking venue or time. You just seem to be looking for the worst in her. Weren't you watching? I asked. I was. I listened. I heard you. And you're okay with her approach? I think she could be coming from a good place and taking a bad route to get there. She helped a lot of people with the handling of refugees. She honestly saved us by taking in the villains because we had no place to put them. She wouldn't be the first parahuman I've seen who's got a different perspective, as you put it. Was he, like, testing me? Was this a thing that Cineral had signaled or told him before she talked to me? That it was his job to see how fragile or aggressive I was? Or worse, was he doing this because he believed that? How was I supposed to even respond to that? He'd heard it all and was giving her the benefit of a doubt? I have to admit, I said, measuring out my words. I've thought to myself that I hope she can find some good healthy people to be in her corner. I want us all to get through this with a minimal loss of life, and I want her to find someone who sees her perspective and can walk her through things until she's closer to a healthy perspective. An amused look crossed his face. I've always prided myself on seeing things from others' point of view. Okay, fuck this. Fuck him. What's your background, Eric? I asked. You're working under Cineral? Kind of, yeah. I have been for a month. Corporate before that? Again, that amused look. I'm curious why you think that. Because a lot of the other options tend to take a firmer stance on things. Not corporate. More amused. Not PRT, I suggested. No, just a student. I work here days, spend nights studying at Niles. I have to confess, I only get a couple of hours a week where I'm not tied up to go on dates or do shopping that isn't stopping in at the corner store. So you're one of the people who took my spot at the university, I mused. 
If this evacuation is for keeps, you might not have a university to go back to. Well, he said, more time for going out, doing shopping, meeting friends for a match. He was clearly joking, but I couldn't find the humor in it. How many people here thought like him? How many could brush off disaster or act like the giants, Seamorg and Dauntless, were happening to someone else? Purely things on a screen. Was that an artifact of them not having powers? Were there other Erics in the room that never saw a battlefield as anything but something on paper or screens? Safe in a bunker that might survive a second gold morning, he'd been faced with some of the worst of the worst, and he didn't get it. He thought about my boobs. He boasted about considering Amy's perspective in a show of self-indulgence that was, given context, more vulgar than if he'd whipped out his dick and slow-wanked in front of me while talking about his technique. The world was going to end, and he didn't get it. He seemed to assume things would be okay. There would be lacrosse or squash or some other preppy asshole sport, and I was thinking that as someone who liked preppy, clean-cut guys. This was humanity. I'd reached out to Jessica. I'd poured out emotions, even knowing she wasn't my therapist anymore, hoping she was a friend at the very least, and nothing. It couldn't be all of humanity. Gilpatrick, Natalie, Jester, Presley. I'd told Ashley, once upon a time, that we built those relationships for our advantage, that they needed it, and through it we built something in the way of ongoing goodwill. We, if nothing else, got a strategic advantage. Except, floundering, I wanted to reach out for them, because I needed them. I found them wanting. I found them lacking. And I felt so fucking lonely in that moment. I'd thought before about how isolated a cape was in the grand scheme of it all, each of us with our individual powers, but this was more than that. My family gone and outright alien to me, my teammates and friends, past and present, gone or dead, like I could reach out and there was nobody there. I hope you get your match with friends after all of this is said and done, I told him. So do I, he said, chuckling, like he wasn't vaguely off-putting enough to give me an existential crisis. Anyway, I said, feeling very out of place, that's Dot in a nutshell, but we can't talk to her without going through the Red Queen first. Mark Dallin is a better bet for getting the down low, I think. Sure. Let's see about arranging the call, he said. He looked around. Station 3 looks less busy. In the back corner of the room, near where Jessica and Darnall had been standing. The same terminal that had the sticker on it that I'd been fixating on. A guy who looked to be in his thirties was at the computer, working his way through camera feeds, selecting tracts of data and deleting them. He had a very square face and red cheeks, with black hair in a pronounced widow's peak that could have been a receding hairline. His suit jacket didn't fit him. Any chance we could get the console, LaRue? Eric asked. Is it official? LaRue asked. I'm trying filtering algorithms with the digital noise we got. I can't use anything that has Zs on it. I'd really rather use this terminal than my laptop. Semi-official. We won't be long. Sure, LaRue said, smiling. I'll take the chance to take a break, go by the vending and coffee machines on the way back. Thanks. We might take longer than that trip does. I'll manage. Want anything? Eric shook his head, taking the one chair as soon as LaRue had vacated it. Antares? LaRue asked. No, no thanks. It'd be my treat. I shook my head, my arms folded as I watched what Eric did. Thanks, though. Thank you for what you do, the guy said. That conversation earlier didn't look easy. Thanks, I said, meaning it despite my discomfort. Everyone had seen me snap there. Thanks for what you do, too, you know. Fifteen minutes of work on a thirty-second video clip that they might not even glance at or revisit.
LaRue said. Feels like busy work for the civilians to make us feel like we're helping, while you're the ones in the thick of it. I shook my head. You'd have to be on the same team that got the cameras out there. Yep. I didn't actually do the camera part, though. Post-process. It helps, I said. From this vantage point at the back right of the room, I could see the screen with nursery, all the way up at the front, far left. I could see the shape that was Amy, surrounded by shuddering giants who were in the process of sprouting tree-like masses of slick flesh from their groins, greater branches showing how soft they were on impact with the ground, each limb ending in an individual fruit curled up into fetal positions, uncurling, standing, and swelling in size by the second. Amy went to each, touching them, a spot of orange at her shoulder, that it be dot. I spotted Marquis. All the individual things. Glimpses of the monsters before we have to face it for real. That's encouraging. I could fly out there right now. Same portal I used to get to the flight with Damsel and Deathchester would put me close. I could go to her and I could erase her from consideration. And I'd get in trouble. Possibly a long stay in an alternate reality. I'd get some consideration for mental stresses, probably. Darnall would testify on my behalf. All of us got into this business because it fascinated us, Eric said, his attention on the text conversation with, I had to assume, Shin. Hearing the source of that inspiration encouraging us is pretty cool. I wasn't encouraging or thanking you, Eric, I thought, my expression unchanging. You haven't earned it yet. Off to get coffee in a gnarly bar, LaRue said. Catch you after, I said, smiling a bit. Eric reached up and toward me. I brushed his hand aside before it could make contact. My arm and hand hadn't moved in the course of the brushing aside. I'd meant to do it, and I hadn't. It had been a brief, natural expansion of my force field, a brief, natural movement of an arm that had no meat beneath the skin, no bone beneath the meat, and no rejiggered rat or feline DNA in blood, bone, meat, or skin. Above all, it had been a gentle touch. I wasn't supposed to use my powers, and I'd just used my powers. Uh, Eric said, his eyes going wide, the smile falling away, the good humor gone. Don't do that, I told him. What were you doing? Trying to get your attention. None of that dominance now. None of the steady eye contact. You had it. Sudden movement in the corner of my vision. You said you were good at seeing perspectives. Please be aware of mine. I... sorry, he said. Too defensive, I thought. Calm down. I gripped my arms. My missing fingernail really fucking hurt. Was going to say, he's with Amelia. You could try calling, but... I looked at the screen again. No sign of flashbang. Dad. Probably Dad. I felt that pang of loneliness again. Dead silent, unmoving, I watched the screens. I wanted to be out there, helping but we were being penalized for going off on our own. We'd ducked one set of arbitrary, rushed rulings for another set. I tried to tell myself that it was the deal I'd struck with myself, that I'd cooperate, listen. Anything else got messy, and hurt the rest of the team. I could ask you some of Cineral's questions. I'm not sure I could take it, I thought. I'm a bit on edge. A little bit mega proud that I had that much control over my force field. It helped with the feeling of loneliness. Sure, I told him. It's a brief list. Question says she wanted to talk to every member of your team separately. I take it to mean I'm supposed to ask you and just you. Okay, shoot. Tell me about Capricorn, Eric said, leaning back. Vague question. How was he? How is he? This is confidential? Good as, Eric answered. 
I hesitated. But I felt like not answering at all would be damning. When I first met him, he was good. Harder-headed, stricter with himself and, in a way, with his brother. Unavoidable. Natural hero, just thrust into a situation where someone was going to do something disagreeable. They found a middle ground, and given where they stand, I think that's incredible. He's a good leader, capable, powerful, pretty darn sensible, if aggressive, but even that aggressiveness has become something more... tempered, mature. He bypassed goddess in a way the rest of us couldn't. It'd be nice to have him out there. I think you guys need him out there. Concerns? Critical weaknesses? In this moment... I could imagine Tristan feeling much like I was feeling right now. No. Sveta, then? I thought of Sveta, of the images, and the broken-up dream where she'd fallen from the decorative rock in front of the mall to the empty parking space below. Smart, caring, sensitive, with a nurturing side and a sense of justice you wouldn't expect someone with the rest of her personality to have. She knew valuable stuff about this base and the raid, she knows practical stuff about cauldron and power interactions I haven't run into. If you need an expert on weird power-physiology interactions like... I gestured vaguely toward the nursery screen with my bandaged fingers. She's the one you want. She's lived it. She studied it to better care for the other Case 53s. Concerns? Weaknesses? Some of those Case 53s still hold a grudge. She's new to her body, but you guys know that. She's done pretty darn well, considering. Precipice. Rain Fraser. Tough. I've known capes who can take a hit. Ones with powers, ones without. I've known capes who have drive to an extent that they won't let themselves go down. With Precipice? No powers, but he can take that hit. And he won't topple, won't fall. He fucked up, coming from a bad situation, doing something bad. He wants to make up for it enough he won't stop or stop fighting for our side. He's had experience dealing with and circumventing Mathers. If you've got a giant Mathers out there, talk to him. He doesn't believe in himself enough. Weaknesses? He doesn't believe in himself enough, I repeated. Are you even listening? Lookout, Miss K. Martin. We don't know enough. She gets us information. She cares. She wants to do right by society. She wants to be a heroine. She's capable. I have the instinct you guys want to bench her, because she's a kid and she's been a bit off rails. Don't. Or if you do, bench all of us. If you bench just her, then it's going to destroy her a little. She needs the group, and that includes needing her new team. They're good kids. She stayed with you? For a few nights. Has she reached out in any way since you were told to avoid contact with one another? Not that I'm aware. What's the worst-case scenario when it comes to her? That an eleven-year-old girl has her heart broken yet again. I think they meant power-wise. I don't know. Mental breakdown leading to her forcing people to be close to her through blackmail and coercion? Violations of privacy? How likely do you see that eventuality? Not very. She'd have to feel like she has nobody. I don't think she's anywhere near that. Eric nodded. He didn't type or record that I could see. Didn't take notes on paper. I didn't miss the fact Kenzie had way more questions than any of the others. Suspicion about them wanting to bench her reaffirmed. Tattletale? I thought of Tattletale in the trigger dream scrambling to save her brother. I knew that all of us tended to have hang-ups about our trigger visions. It had been part of the reason I'd asked Dean about his. I knew I would maybe forever have a pet peeve about being ignored, trampled. Movers would feel restless. Tinkers would deal with anxiety. It was the way things went. So I could extrapolate, think of that scene and think of Tattletale and her every interaction with anyone she seemed to care about being an extension, in some small way, of that desperate and helpless struggle to save her already deceased brother. Too late, wrestling with the blanks and question marks in the aftermath. I wish she was a hero, I said. 
Can you elaborate? Eric asked. Still no smile on his face. Still no feigned friendliness. The force field had batted his hand aside and dashed those overly friendly pretenses and leers away. She's exactly what we need in terms of information. The ability to tie disparate things together and penetrate to the heart of things. She came last night because of her association with Kenzie's group. She came because she wanted to know what was going on. And I'm on the same page as her there. Just about everything else, I think we disagree. I respect her, but I don't like her or respect a lot of her actions. Uh Uh-huh, he said. And yourself? Hmm? Self-evaluation. I wasn't in a good place to do a self-evaluation. I'd just sort of done one in front of Jessica, a little ways down the hall, and it had been a rambling mess, an outpouring of feelings. And she hadn't been receptive, so I'd said and done something stupid, hurting her and putting her on the spot. I want to help. When we're this desperate, I feel like that's all that should matter. Outside of that... I don't think I can give you an objective self-evaluation. What about an unobjective one? Eric asked. He smiled for the first time since I'd brushed his hand away. I feel like there's too few people who are looking at the big picture, and it's an actually terrible thing that my sister is one of them, and she and I are on a similar page in this. I'd like to think that everything I said about the rest of my team is true about me too. The good parts— To lesser degrees, obviously, but even that sounds like I'm full of myself. Eric nodded. He turned back to the computer, and I had hopes it would be my dad, because it'd be awfully nice to talk to my dad in this moment. But he switched to another window and began doing some typing, summarizing my notes. Looking over his shoulder seemed to be making him self-conscious, and I thought about enjoying that as some eye-for-an-eye bullshit, but I didn't want to make a bad impression. I stepped back and away, so the desk was to my right, and I could only see the side edge of the monitor. Three minutes passed, with a clack of keys, before the claustrophobic nature of the room began to get to me. The procession line of naked people had already begun. The dauntless titan didn't attack them. "'I'll be outside,' I said. "'Unless there's more questions.' "'No more questions,' he said. "'Okay.' I wanted fresh air. I wanted to fly, to burn off energy, to breathe city air in my earth. Bet, ideally, in a universe where it hadn't all been ruined by endbringers and aliens. I settled for the catwalk at the end of the hallway, the railing near where I'd talked to Darnall and Jessica, a drop below. I heard distant shouts and orders, a team getting organized, In the wake of those conversations and that back and forth, I felt like I'd come close to an epiphany, a realization, or an answer. I just wasn't sure what the question was. In a way, I felt more secure than ever. In another way, I felt isolated. The absence of others like a gaping wound, the stump of a missing limb. In a way, I felt like doing something and making a concrete difference in the outcome of all of this was in arm's reach. In another, helpless. If I could take the question and hold it firmly in my mind, then I feel like I could take the sum total of my feelings earlier and put them at the end, and algebra my way to a conclusion. We know this, that takes priority, solve for x. I wished I'd been able to talk to my dad. A small, scared part of me worried I'd lost him forever, because, just like Byron and Tristan, Amy and I seemed to be trapped in a world where it felt like only one of us got what we wanted. Only one of us got a given parent. Only one of us got the Victoria Dallin closest to her heart. Fucking barf. Time passed, maybe ten minutes, my thoughts in a whirl. Moment to moment, I found myself regretting things I'd said, wishing I'd said other things, and being so frustrated I almost used my power to tear that railing out and crumple it into a ball. I could imagine punting that ball of metal railing into the wall with enough force it would embed it into the hard white surface. 
I have newfound power and control, and they're not letting me use it. I want to get out there. The railing squeaked with added weight. Battle damage from the raid on the base hadn't been completely fixed. I talked to Amy Dallin after I talked to you, the day following the attack on the community center. I didn't respond, and I didn't look. There are so many things I could say about that conversation, but I don't want to get distracted. Suffice to say, I told the wardens I was worried. I felt like you were possibly right, saying she was dangerous, and I communicated that. They said they would keep a closer eye on her. The disaster with the portals and the loss of the headquarters no doubt made that difficult to impossible. I nodded. More pertinent to this... conversation? Confession? Is that she told me she saw herself in me. The exhaustion, the weariness, the imminent breakdown. She used her power on me. I whipped my head around, my eyes wide. Jessica looked so weary simultaneously alarmed at my alarm. Passively, she said. There's no sign she did anything. I looked down, away, my heart hammering. Thank you for caring, though, she said. I swallowed hard. It was a penetrating comment at a time I was undeniably overworked, overstressed, and trying to shoulder too much of a workload. It can happen, that the wrong comment at the worst time can devastate you. I'm sure you know, having dealt with Tattletail, who apparently has that as her power. I bit my lip, staring down at the space below the railing. The team rushed down a hallway. After that conversation, I cut down on my work. Delegated. I reached out. I found colleagues who were willing to help. I revisited an idea I'd had about having a guest speaker of sorts come in to talk to my therapy group. I'd brought it up with Weld before. That was because of Amy? I asked, tensing. In small part, I'm sorry. What happened with Riley, Jessica? How did you even hear about it? She asked. When I visited the source of powers, I saw the construction of Tattletail's power. It let me see things if I asked. I asked about Amy a few times. I asked about you once. Why me? Because you're not you? I asked, turning to face her, wounded. Because something clearly happened, and you're retiring? Jessica sighed. What did you see? Your hands around her throat. She hurt you in response. What happened with Riley? After the portal incident, we were isolated. We were trapped in an alternate universe. I'd cut back on my workload prior, started to find my way back to who I used to be, old hobbies, old interests. I tried to hunt down people I knew through the Internet. The portal took me out of that frame of mind and put me into a hostile place with exceptionally dangerous people who were, as long as everything went well, being good. And it was your job to ensure it all went well? I asked. Jessica nodded. I was second in command of our little group. Leader when Van, when the self-elected leader wasn't around or when he was sleeping. There were other, more distant camps, and he'd visit them. The parahumans, who had previously been prisoners or test subjects, were in an isolated camp as well, about twenty minutes away from the main camp. I was in charge of that one making sure they were happy, keeping an eye out for danger. Something happened? We endured. We kept a balance. It wasn't easy. A lot of the foods we experimented with made us violently ill. Fresh water was in short supply. We were cold. We got sick. Riley seemed to have saved us, if anything, by analyzing the food and curing the sickest of us, people I deemed so at risk it was unlikely she could do much. Riley and Jamie Rinka were, to all appearances, angelic, all considered. Some reining in needed, naturally, and it took everything I had to stay on top of it all, especially with my own bouts with illness. But it worked. We'd made it out the other side. How does that get us from there to you strangling Bonesaw? I didn't butt in. 
The other side was Valkyrie's arrival. We talked. Everyone began to pack up, and she plodded the way back with Van. As liaison, it was my job to contact Riley and Jamie. Jamie was happy to go. Riley wanted to pack up her lab and was resistant to my offers to help. Tinkers are touchy. Little things like fingerprints can cause problems with specific tech. I have to imagine it's the same for her work. Or was she up to something? She was protective of her work in a curtained-off section of her lab. She wouldn't let me approach, and my first thought was that we had people in more distant camps who had struck out on their own. Some parahumans, one couple, a jolly fellow who fancied himself a survivalist and who was taking an optimistic view of the situation. He would stop in every day or two, and he hadn't stopped in for two days. We sent out people to get in touch with him after Valkyrie's arrival, and they couldn't find his camp. Worrying? I echoed the sentiment in her words. Terrifying. Crushing. Riley adopted her bone-saw persona, acting younger than she appeared, and with the surgeries she subjected herself to, she'll never appear older than twelve. Laughing off my questions, being furtive. Another superhero team was running down the hall, far below us. Jessica didn't elaborate, didn't explain the whole business. For a moment, I was terrified that was it. I was left to draw the worst conclusion. She was my responsibility. I can say what I might say about workload, stress, the inherent difficulties of that situation, but I could have and should have kept more of an eye on her. The burden of guilt was on me more than it was on one very ill and traumatized young woman in a new and difficult situation. That's not being fair to yourself. Maybe not, Jessica said. But that was what I felt in that moment. In working with people with criminal inclinations, part of my job is to protect society, and working with five people with powers, only two a real and present concern, I'd failed to protect a tiny, primitive microcosm of society. I got angry, desperate. I tried to make her show me, and somewhere in the midst of it she lashed out. I grabbed her, or the other way around. Are you okay? She dug her fingernails into my arm, Jessica touched her sleeve, and used contacts on her nails to manipulate my nerves, trying to make my arm turn against me tensed muscles until they tore from bone. I still don't have the strength I did. I still have constant pain, and that may be a reminder of my lowest moment, furthest from the person I wanted to be. I had a half dozen questions I wanted to ask, but there was no perfect order. Was it? Had she done something? I asked. Jessica shook her head. Everyone accounted for. Everyone checked over. Nothing questionable. If I had to guess, she was protective of her work because it was all she had to show for the prior time frame and, as you say, it was fragile. I'd gone over the conversation a thousand times in my head since, and I think she might have misread my tone, or misread my impatience as my wanting her to leave it behind. And Bonesaw? I asked, quiet. Is she okay? Riley is Riley, Victoria. Physically? Even with nearly every bit of her technology removed from her body, I don't think there's much someone could do to her with physical wounds that would last. I nodded. I wasn't sure how to feel about that. Mentally? Emotionally? Jessica asked. She asked to stay. Valkyrie tried to convince her. They struck a deal that Valkyrie would visit now and then. She was ashamed she hurt me like she did. Oh, I think she's more experienced than most when it comes to enduring betrayals and being hurt by people close to her. But that makes it more of a betrayal that I perpetrated, Victoria. Not less. More of a wrong. And in the doing, I thought, because there was no way in hell I'd say it out loud, you proved my sister right. Tired, sick, desperate, and scared, you perpetrated what you see as an unforgivable betrayal? I can't support or help anyone until I relearn how to support and help myself, she told me. 
I know you want and need me to be my old self, but I need to rediscover her first. For myself first, then for others, if that's even possible. Something about her tone at the end there made me look at her, study her. Did you trigger? I asked. She didn't move a hair. Because I know your policies, and I can imagine you'd be the type to suppress it, do what retired capes are doing, pretending you don't have powers, that a purely civilian life is possible, but... Victoria, she interrupted me. I stopped. She shook her head at me before dropping her gaze to the crowds below us. And hopes were dashed. Jessica was out of reach. I'm sorry that happened, Jessica. So am I. My screen glowed with the text messages from the wardens in the second before I drew a circle, radiating out to another application, which showed a map of the headquarters. Once cauldrons, then teachers, now the wardens. I found the coordinates and the room. I knocked, fidgeted, had a small crisis of confidence. The door opened. Black hair, thick and long, tied back. One eye half-lidded due to injury or birth defect. He wore a gray, marled, long sleeve t-shirt and sleep pants. I liked the way he wore both of those things. Annalise, I said. He studied me, glancing past me to see if my team or anyone else was there. Problem? he asked. I shook my head. What's going on? I looked off to the side, thumbs hooked in belt loops. You've given me hints before that you're interested. Blatant ones, yeah. Why? I'm interested. You and me, no strings attached. You let me lead. We go our separate ways after. Stay friendly. I told myself I wasn't going to fidget, but my thumb plucked at my belt loop. He stared into my eyes, brows creasing. For real? Yeah. And if you say no, I'd appreciate we just forget I made this offer. I told myself I wasn't going to say that either. My thumb plucked at my belt loop again. If you'd rather sleep, I know you finished patrol a bit ago. And that, damn it. No, he said, negating. He looked at me. Yeah, yes. I started forward. He put a hand out, flat to my stomach. Hold up. I remained where I was, frozen, tense, nervous. Boundaries? he asked. Or better yet, why? I could have lied or come up with reasons. I don't want to be alone right now. I want to be the opposite of alone. Okay then, that's why, he said, and his voice was breathy. My hair stood on end. His hand was still flat against my stomach. Boundaries? Rules? How do we go about this? No talking, I ventured. That's easier. Talking leads to thinking, and I don't want to think for the next... 30 minutes. That's harder. There's stuff to figure out part way. There's questions. Do you want... Vigorous? Rough? Gentle? Also, holy shit, thirty minutes. Gentle, I said, barely a whisper. It's okay if thirty minutes is a big ask. Skin-to-skin -skin contact, tender, anything that's... Not alone? He asked. I nodded. My heart was hammering. I was terrified. A whole morass of dark thoughts lurked near the back of my brain. But that other drive won over at least in this context. I don't have protection, he said. I do. Grabbed some on the way over. For what it's worth, it's been... years. I've had checkups since then. I've been checked up since, he echoed me. He stepped out of the doorway, inviting me into the dim room. There wasn't wall art, but he did have a plant, something like a bonsai, and rocks. 
There were some books on the bookshelf, but almost none were sitting up the right way, and most were lying on their side like bricks or stacked up into towers, to make more use of the space. He couldn't have even been here that long. Curious that he'd bring a plant and rocks to a barracks-style dormitory room. My boundary, he whispered. What? I have neighbors. I figured, I whispered. No noise above a whisper. He nodded. My phone was warm in my pocket, the text one gesture away. Message from the wardens, verdict reached. Capricorn, good to go. Sveta, good to go. Precipice, A-OK. -okay. Lookout, cleared provided there was supervision. She would have access to her tech. No word on Tattletail, but that hardly mattered. Antares, benched. Stay nearby, await further instructions. Annalise began to remove his long-sleeved shirt. I stopped him. Silent, his forearms still crossed, hands still at the bottom of his shirt, his abdomen partially exposed. I pushed his hands away, stepping close enough our chests touched. No doubt he could feel my heartbeat. I want to undress you, I told him. No complaints? Let me lead every step of the way? I asked again. Please? Even for stuff like this? I nodded. Got it. I'd compared the situation room to a shoebox in the midst of a tomb of concrete. This dorm room was a tenth of the size, so small I could reach across it and touch two separate walls, a bed, shelves, a cabinet. Two of us, a bit of light, and what felt like a whole world of dark thoughts in the space beyond, like the Situation Room had had its concrete. But he was warm. I kissed him, and it felt both warm and sad. It helped with that lonely feeling without really solving it. I pulled off his shirt, and I pulled off my sweater. He stood there, breathing in deep, looking at me, and I breathed that in, being wanted. I thought without thinking about anything, my brain a febrile buzz. I couldn't reach out. Every resource or ally I had was tied up or gone. I wasn't supposed to contact my team. My parents weren't supports. The warden leadership had its concerns, and even Jessica wasn't available. I had an appointment with Darnall for later, but that did nothing at all for now. It made me feel isolated, lost, and cold. So I held on to another warm, willing body, kissing it, pressing it down onto a cot barely big enough for one person. The approach we were taking as a collective felt wrong. I'd tried to articulate what I wanted, what I thought we should do. I'd tried to pursue that, going to where the powers came from. I had suspicions, but no energy or wherewithal to pursue them. I wanted to be out there, chasing that gut feeling that had been nettling me, but I couldn't. To do so would be a betrayal on several levels. It didn't feel right, but I'd concede to the greater authority. Base animal instinct, much neglected, at least, felt kind of right. It was hard to call it wrong, at least, when it was so far from morality or black-and-white thinking. I tasted his skin, his sweat, and I smelled him. He smelled like herbal tea. I touched the expanse of him, and I looked at him in the dim. Between tasting him and smelling him, nuzzling him, my face wasn't more than a half inch from him at any point. His hair tickled me, and mine no doubt tickled him. I felt the chase of other thoughts, familiar and wrong, and sank deeper into mindless sensation to escape them, drank in the small male sounds. We hadn't even taken off our pants yet. Not that the flannel he wore was a real barrier to me feeling him. I was benched. We'd submitted to higher authority because we'd told ourselves it got us more than it cost us. And in the now, the rule was that Victoria Dallin didn't leave until there were further discussions. That was the law, so to speak, closest we had to one. 
follow the law. When that fails, do what feels right. When that fails, reach out. Above all else, avoid doing what I might regret tomorrow. I wasn't sure how I'd feel about this tomorrow, but I felt like I might regret it. Opening doors, opening the way to being chased by thoughts I didn't even dare come close to, the awkwardness, feeling like I was betraying Dean, feeling like it might hurt my reputation, a hundred other small reasons, and prime among them was the concern that it felt like if I wasn't careful, I could shed tears. I had no idea if they were happy ones or sad ones. But that regret was for tomorrow. He made a noise, just loud enough it might disturb the neighbors. I silenced him by kissing him, taking his hands and putting them where I wanted them, before raising my pelvis so I'd have access to my belt. This was what I needed now. Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 7 I didn't need the shower, in the sense of getting clean, but I needed it for the static drum of water against my head, the way it was easier to think-not-think think in that contained, warm space. Except I probably did need the shower to get clean. Not in a grossed-out, crawling-out-of-my-skin way, not at all. But in a gonna-be-talking-to-capes-I-respect-don't-want-to-smell way, I needed to play field goalie in my own head, fending off intrusive thoughts without turning so much attention to those thoughts I left my flanks undefended. Thinking not thinking was bad for that. Maybe I was trying too hard to pull it all together into a neat package that answered why I was presently the way I was. Put in simpler terms, I could sum up my thoughts as... I might probably have been happier if I'd skipped the shower. I couldn't skip the shower without being crazy with self-consciousness, and I felt fucking weird taking my second shower in a matter of hours. Whatever. My hands pressed against the wall, my posture like I was pushing against that wall and preparing to push it down, water running down my head and back, face aimed at the swirl of water disappearing down a black void, no doubt to be recycled because you didn't have a complex this big, take the trouble to pump water into it, and use that water once. I'd taken the bandaging off, and my fingernail bed was a glaring red with raw, torn skin at the edges. My left hand. My right hand had a swirl texture to it, where it had been burned to different degrees. The skin was thicker. Parts of my body ached in a bruised sort of way, but it wasn't a bad ache credit for that. My heart and body core and my lower belly didn't feel so cold as they might have earlier. Human contact did nourish. We needed it as a species, and I was a member of that species. I would have been lying if I said I didn't feel nourished. Which wasn't to say I was hunky-dory. Ha <laughs> ha, fuck. The thoughts that danced at the edges of my awareness without being fully realized were pressing in to the point that I could imagine I was sharing the shower stall with two other people, trying to ignore both of them despite the stall's confines. Pay too much attention to the dean that stood in the corner behind me and to my right, and I'd have to confront real thoughts about why I felt like he'd be disappointed, why I felt more than a bit disappointed in myself. I'd have to confront that self-disappointment, at least process my expectations, think about whether there was a possibility I could have had any relationship or intimacy at all that wouldn't have come to this conclusion. Pay too much attention to her behind me and to my left, and my skin crawled. Everything took on a darker, uglier shade, and I was reminded of how I'd made concessions to her for the sake of everyone and everything. The longer I dwelt on that, the worse it felt. I focused on the hands that were planted on the wall, the missing fingernail, the burn, the gouge in my forearm, the gouge in my right arm, 
the still healing bruise at my ribs. My injuries, mine, untouched by her. I knew it wasn't good to go down that road, to dwell on that, but it was something. Every last one of those injuries had been incurred because I'd acted for the sake of others. That, too, was mine. What ended up being forty-five minutes with Annalise was mine, too. I hated her. I hated her so fucking much. I hated that she inserted herself into my life, and I had to carve out this territory in my own brain, my family, my relationships, team, and a fling. I wanted her to get it, and I wasn't sure she could. Going down that line of thought was deeply unpleasant. But thinking about ways that were strictly counter to what she wanted, they at least kept thoughts from encroaching. How would she act if I spat in her face? Would that stay with her? Would it play any part in her seemingly unending ability to twist her thoughts around and think there was a chance of reconciliation? What if I just picked up a telephone pole and demolished her legs? Arms too. Spine. Let her spend years in a hospital room, thinking back over all the decisions she'd made to date. Would she get it, then? What if I used Tattletale? Leaned on a power for some biting, penetrating comments. Found the thread of Amy's argument and pulled on it until it unraveled. Or Mockument. What would Amy do if I had Damsel's teammate pull out a monstrous caricature of her? If I forced her to face it? It would be easier than doing it myself, and I was pretty sure I could do it myself if it came down to it. Break her psychologically, as much as taking a telephone pole to her spine would break her physiologically. Given how dependent it would be on finding the right opportunity, and how difficult it would be to get Tattletale to Amy or enlist Mockument's help, it probably came down to the telephone pole or breaking her down with words. It would be unkind. It would be barbaric. It would be ugly. There would be ramifications, both in terms of the oversight from other capes and in terms of what Amy was likely to do. Because someone brought to zero would expend everything they had in a final, desperate attempt to save themselves or restore equilibrium. I knew because she had brought me to zero. I had experienced moments like that in the hospital. Fuck me. This whole endeavor had opened doors. Best to stay away from Amy for a bit, because I didn't want to actually do those things. It wouldn't help, not in the long run. Or was it the short term, with a collective gain in the long run? This thing with the giants was so monumentally stupid. Whatever. I turned off the water, then took my hands away from the wall. Toweling off, I squeezed the water out of my hair, dried it, and began to get dressed, simultaneously braiding my hair. Still there? I asked the void, my arms flat at my side, my hair still in the process of being braided. Good. Might need you. Sorry it's been such a long road to get here. You're just a fragment of a fucked-up, omnicidal alien who happens to have a symbiotic or parasitic relationship to me. You probably expected a different existence. So did I. We're in this mess together. I smiled. I so didn't want to go out there, face Amy even through a screen, or deal with the wardens. But there was a chance I could help people. A chance I could help my team. A chance we could help my team. I pulled on the plush black sweater with the hood, wet a paper towel to wash off a bit of dust from when it had hit the floor, and looked at myself in the mirror. The braid's a little messy, I thought. A few strands of hair escaped here and there. I fixed what I could, but I was resigned to looking imperfect, a bit below par. Fuck, it wasn't like every other hero around here wasn't already stretched thin and feeling worn out. I ran into Annalise outside the showers. He'd rinsed off too, and he had a towel around his shoulders a gold morning armband around his bicep, a knife in his hand, chin raised as he used the knife's edge to shave. 
I was worried the surprise of seeing me would make him jump and slit his throat. Say what you will about teacher, he said, chin askew, still whisking away stubble without the benefit of more than touch. Shitty guy, but he installs good showers. He really does, I said. I looked down the hall. The only other people nearby were well out of earshot. You okay? We good? I'm good, he said, smiling. I was going to take the no strings to an extreme and interpret it as I shouldn't bring it up until you do. Nice memory, nothing more. That's fair, I said. Felt like not saying anything at all might be interpreted as rude, though. Thanks for bringing it up. Gives me a chance to say I'd do it again, on the same terms. Dangerous game, that, I said. Won't deny that. I'd say the same, but... He pressed both hands over his heart. If the follow-up to that isn't no strings attached, my ego is going to take a beating. No strings attached, I said. I'm just not ready for anything. Your ego is fine for the time being. He smiled, wiping his knife with a paper towel that had been jutting out of his pocket, capturing the tiny hairs. Is this the point we make small talk, talk business and cape stuff, or... Or I bail. Check on my team, my lunatic sister. Good luck, he said. We're trial-running Ratcatcher again, because, you know, everything with the city isn't stressful enough. We gotta give second chances to depraved, hilarious ex-villains with a thing for rodents. Have to pile on enough stuff that we're all on the brink of second triggering, you know? That's the big secret plan. Right, right. I'll leave you to it. Good luck with your rat girl. Seemed like she had a good heart. She does. I still don't think it's going to work out, but teacher scuttled her first chance and it won't feel right until we give her another. Why now? I asked. Because there might not be a chance later, and I don't want to leave things with regrets. I nodded. He gave me a salute, knife up to his forehead, then away. I raised a hand in farewell. We went our separate ways. Yeah. It felt like the shadows and dark thoughts that dogged me were nipping at my heels now, clinging to my back, rather than lurking around the next corner. A weight. A constant set of thoughts. Some had to do with Amy. Some had to do with me. Dropping something heavy on her from above. Telephone pole to the spine. Tearing her a new one. All of that felt fresh, new, and constant, like an oven ring with the flame on the lowest temperature. Saying the intensity was low didn't mean I wanted to hold my hand to the ring. Annalise had been the right choice. Was he more than a little weird, asking me out on a gore-streaked battlefield? Yeah. But I could kind of get that, though, when we'd seen enough ugliness that we distance ourselves from it or became inured to it. He was also someone who cared to help out at a physio center. He respected boundaries when a pervier asshole could have taken advantage of the interest of the six or seven interested physiotherapists at the center who'd been keeping their eyes on him, become the center of a tangle of drama. He hadn't. As bad as it sounded, I wasn't interested in more. Not with him. No dating, no relationship. That was a plus. He was accessible and available. Another plus. I was going to regret the shit out of this a week from now, when the dark thoughts were still nipping at my heels because they were way harder to put in the box, and the memories of being close to someone had faded and gone cold again. Already, as he walked away, I felt a bit lonely again. I headed back toward the situation room, shoulders hunched forward, hands in my pockets. Keep me company, I thought. We need to work on you braiding my hair. What impacts that? Is it you drawing on stored memories of me? Reaching for a crystal where you've got some motor memory garbage? Is it drawn from my time in the asylum? Or is it my current manual dexterity with something interfering? Shit. Half my files I could look stuff up in were packed up. Agent parahuman relationships, the things that impacted it. Off the top of my head... There was stuff like Vista had talked about. Meditation, practice, testing limits. 
getting closer to the mindset of the trigger, facing more high-conflict situations. A few incidental reports about dreams, but those were so ambiguous that it could have been capes pulling ideas out of their ass, or extrapolating from nothing. Not that I didn't believe there was something to dreams. A lot of fucky, not-quite-right power stuff surrounded dreams. Like, powers didn't quite know how to handle them, making the rules a little less firm. Annalise wanted to handle Ratcatcher before everything goes even more to shit than it already is, and here I am, with a spark of inspiration and a motivation to dig into something, with no opportunity to do so. The fucking world is going to end again, and I'll die wishing for the chance to read my notes. Hands. No powers, I reminded myself, as I got to the situation room. Too many unfamiliar faces. I did see LaRue and Eric, sitting at the same table as Armstrong, who was back. I took a seat at the table, two chairs down from Armstrong, so I wouldn't be bothering him. One half-screen for the nursery giantess, wreathed by a pile of her creations, the men giving birth to the flesh trees from Anus and Urethra, the women mostly doing so with the more conventional route. Fluids pooled and drooled around the mass, with the flesh trees bowing as their fruits grew by the second, getting heavier. From baby to adult in a matter of minutes. The other half of the split screen showed further down the procession line, Naked, slender figures shambling across the cold landscape, almost in single file, except for the ones who seemed to get along well enough to move in groups. One screen showed the machine army. The nursery-born giants used raw strength, digging with fingers and stolen material, including the wreckage of robots, to till the earth and overturn its contents, to stomp at rocks and fallen trees and pulverize them complete and utter ruin in a widening half-circle around the camp. One screen for Dauntless, who once again had the Seamorg perched on him, resting on the top edge of the shield he carried. "'Cleared your head?' Eric asked, looking over the top of his laptop. "'Yeah, kind of. Next time you disappear, do us both a favor and let me know where you are. Does it matter? I'm benched. Your job was to report on me. You've done your job.' My job was to watch over you. Fuck, I shouldn't have come back. Where the hell was I supposed to go if I didn't come back? I didn't want to dignify his statement with an answer, and Armstrong was watching us instead of working. So I asked Armstrong, Any word on Sveta? We have her on camera. I wouldn't have paired her with Weld, but she wanted to help. They're trying to get access to Labrat's lab so they can assess what's going on. Access covertly, or access... He turned his own laptop to an angle where I could see it. He hit the key to rotate through the windows, and the one he came to arrest at was a video feed. Bureaucratically, I concluded, seeing the scene. I recognized it as Kenzie's eye cam. She was near the nursery creation. So was Weld. So was Slickian. But the heroes were doing their own thing, holding the line standing guard at a perimeter that had formed around the... mess of Nursery and her breeders. Sveta was, I could see as she looked around, in the company of Engel and Egg. Her fleeting glance in Engel's direction made the computer buzz and the screen flare with colors that extended beyond the frame of the live video footage. I felt the emotional punch of it, and I was not ready for it. I scooted back from the table with enough force that I almost fell backward, and I would have flown a bit rather than fall. You okay? Eric asked. I wanted to throw something at him. She does that, Armstrong said. You get used to it. Here, LaRue told me. He spun his laptop around 180 degrees and scooted it over my way. Take it. The laptop? It's only a video feed so I don't think I'm getting in trouble for giving you access. You can control who and what you watch. Lookout gave us the visuals for your team and her kid teammates. What about you? I'll go grab another. It's fine, he said. Thanks, I said. What if I want to communicate with them? Do it through us, Eric said. Really? 
I asked. It makes some sense, Armstrong said. I wasn't part of the review, but giving you the ability to exchange messages with them isn't much different from putting you in command of the team again. I made a so-so gesture. Kind of in command. I know Tristan fancies himself a leader, so I know what you mean. Even so, if they're concerned, don't feed those concerns. This will blow over. I frowned. Okay, I said. Headphones? Eric asked. I have earbuds, I told him, fishing in my pocket. Thanks, though. I plugged in the one bud, navigating to the right window. First, I wanted to check everyone was okay. Kenzie was with her friends, sitting in the center of the back seat, her attention at least partially on a laptop that was placed across her lap. Her legs were crossed, feet up on the seat, hands stabilizing the machine. Her eye darted around, and the camera showed part of her interface as she highlighted seemingly random words that floated against a backdrop, refocusing her vision to look through that assembly of words to the words behind, picked a few characters, then unfocused to pull back two or three more word clouds to pick out more stuff. The words she chose appeared on the laptop. We should finish packing up your headquarters while we're there, Tattletail said. Can we hold off? Kenzie asked. Are you willing to lose everything you haven't packed? No, Darlene said to Kenzie's right. She hit enter with the thumb of the hand that held the laptop's edge. A box appeared on the screen. Distorted video and audio, loud. Snuff, driving, cussed. Turn it down! Sorry, we were listening to music and dancing before we left. Kenzie held down the volume button for a few seconds, until it was quiet enough that Snuff and Tattletail didn't look upset anymore. Such a carefree existence, Tattletail said. Not carefree at all, Darlene said. Right? Right. We're doing important work, Kenzie added. You are, Chicken Little added. Not that I'm complaining. It's your job to protect us when trouble comes calling, Kenzie said. She looked to the side, where Candy was slumped down, headphones on, sleeping or trying to sleep. Darlene just passed her by the car door. It is absolutely not his job to do that, Tattletail cut in. His job, all of your jobs, are to run. Get out of trouble if you find yourselves in any. Understand? Yes, three of the kids said in chorus. Kenzie looked to the other side, where Chicken Little sat with his head resting against the window, a small bird in his hands, his eyes on the world beyond. He was smiling. I liked the music, he said. It's one of my favorites, Darlene said. Kenzie typed on the keyboard now, putting down lines of code while periodically using a keyboard shortcut to switch between windows. Views of the people I'd intended to check in on. The rest of Breakthrough me. I looked up and left, to a camera in the back corner of the situation room. I resisted the urge to wave. When I looked across the table, Eric was frowning. I looked back to the feed. Kenzie was looking down, where a huge as shit bird was taking up the entire floor space between the two front seats and the bench seat at the back, thus the way Kenzie was sitting. But she wasn't looking at that. She was looking at her knee, which was pressed against Chicken Little's leg. Kenzie began humming. No, no humming, Tattletail said, her voice overlapping momentarily with Snuff's grunt of protest. But I'm happy, Kenzie said. And I'm thinker headachy. No humming, please. Yes, ma'am, Kenzie said before falling silent. I switched. I'd seen a picture-in-a-picture picture glimpse of what was on her laptop. Enough to know they weren't embroiled in fights, but I looked for actual video feeds of my team now. The next three video feeds were Chicken Little, a view of the inside of what I presumed were Candy's eyelids, and Darlene's view. Rain was with Gollum and Cuff, chatting. They were near where Amy was, but the view was so distant Engel didn't register, which was a relief. Trying to set me up with her, Gollum explained. Ugh, Cuff made a sound. How did it go? 
Rain asked. Terrible? I mean, what did I have going for me? Fat kid, bad grades, hated everything. No interests, certainly not sports, like my dad wanted. And she's, what, athletic? Uh, I'm not gonna lie and say she was attractive, because... God, it sounds shitty to say it, but... You don't have to qualify, Cuff said. The racist girl is kind of rat-faced. Reminder, I'm using a camera, I'm mic'd. We're probably being watched and listened to by an intern or someone. She was still out of my league, Gollum said. At the same time, words appeared across the camera. She was not, Cuff said. No, even discounting the racist stuff. Sure, but as far as I was concerned then, zero self-esteem? Victoria is watching. Victoria's watching, Rain added. Hi, hope things are going okay over there. Sorry to interrupt, Gollum. It's fine, Gollum said. He was Byron-like in how soft-spoken he was, which was amusing considering he had the kind of height, frame, and physique that would let anyone dominate a room, and the armor only augmented that. She wasn't interested either. I didn't blame her. Where I grew up, interest didn't factor in unless you were a good soldier, and then you got some choice, Rain said. She was a good soldier for the Empire. Sure, Rain said. Wouldn't have guaranteed she was safe, though. It'd make sense to pair up a promising soldier with the son of the group's leader. Scribe would... Rune. She was Rune, then. Rune would have been convinced to go along, got a lot of perks, keeps her close, and gets you involved. Sounds like you're an expert. You could run a cult yourself if you had a mind to, Cuff said. Ha, huh, as if. People have to like you for that to happen. You learn stuff if you live it. I changed the channel, so to speak, over to Capricorn, to Tristan. He wasn't far away, either, suggesting most of the team was on the task of Amy. No doubt because we'd dealt with her and Shin before. Nothing seemed to be going beyond the gates, but there were enough other heroes around that I imagined they'd be forming the investigative body, if it came to that, or they'd attack the morass of nursery stuff if it turned hostile. I could see how Golem's thing about his dad trying to pair him up with Rune had started, Tristan was with some of the shepherds. Moonsong was close by, but she was busy with another conversation. Rune, Scribe, was closer. Hey, Capricorn, Scribe called out. You're still on video, Scribe. Do you want to say something else that's going to make you look bad in front of your superiors? Tristan sounded so tired. I heard you didn't reconcile with reconciliation. Tristan looked over at her. Scribe touched her heart, before stating a slightly overdramatic, shaking her head while speaking, I'm really sorry. That's a shame. I know you were close once. He's a good guy, Tristan said. Deserves everything good. He is, another shepherd said, not one of Scribe's flock. I hear good things. I wish he'd stuck with us. One of Scribe's retinue leaned over to his female friend hand cupped over mouth, whispering something. The friend laughed and started to pass it on to Scribe. Tristan got to his feet, and in that same second, the guy cape who'd just whispered the joke to his friend took an abrupt step away from the wall toward Tristan. There was a swagger to his body language, like he expected a fight. What are you doing? Tristan asked. What are you doing? The guy responded, emphasizing the you. Tristan stared at him. The guy stared back. The other shepherd that had said something kind about reconciliation stood off to the side, actively not looking at the potential altercation. Hey, Pictor? Tristan asked. Do me a favor? The friendlier shepherd looked over. I don't want to get in the middle of anything. I felt such a profound disappointment in the guy. I could almost hear it in Tristan's voice, too. Wave me over when the guys inside the station come back with the response from Cryptid. Can you do that? Okay. The aggressive guy shepherd stared at Tristan, silent, as Tristan turned to go. Tristan shook his head, walking away. 
The group laughed behind him. Tristan put the station entrance behind him, making some movement that saw his arms pass in front of his face before his armor squeaked, straining. Sorry about reconciliation, I thought. He'd been so hopeful. Byron had planned to chime in. Shitty luck. I could relate to the loneliness that seemed to surround him now. No teammates in immediate reach, possibly because the group had been told to keep their distance from one another until further evaluation or checks. No reconciliation. I had no idea how he got on with his parents, but I remembered it being bad last I'd heard. I wanted to talk to him, to encourage him. Even if Vista had been there, I knew she was Byron's, but she was friendly with Tristan, and he needed a friend. He stood outside the station, gaze out on the cityscape and horizon. Turning, he sighted Rain and began trudging off in Rain's direction. Guess you're not being separated that forcefully, I thought. Good that you have each other. I clicked to change the channel. Tristan still in the back of my mind. Which took me back to Sveta. To Engel, still. Even filtered through a screen, the image left me with a feeling running up and down my arms that made me feel like I was smelling a hothouse's worth of exotic flowers. A caress at the face, a taste at the back of the mouth, like Annalise's sweat had tasted. I shivered. That's really distracting. It took me a second to recognize the voice coming over the earbud. Amy. Sorry, Engel said. The sound didn't quite match her lip movements. Kenzie's camera, but not Kenzie's sound. Is it a problem? Sveta asked. You said you were in control. It's not a question of control, Amy retorted, sounding exceptionally annoyed. Go, Sveta. Keep her off balance. Why did you tell me to be quiet when you were working before then? A small voice, high, dot. You said it would slow you down. It's fine. Amy said, terse. Sveta looked at her, and I winced. Amy was touching a kneeling giant, a tall and slender woman slick with the juices of its recent birth from the tree. A flap of what looked like loose skin was draped over her shoulder, but it wasn't skin, something from the amniotic sac that had encased her. The woman stood. Amy stepped back while the woman joined the procession line, and a male giant knelt beside her. If it's fine, can I talk then? I... sure, I guess. Amy had trapped herself in a corner. Great! Oh gosh, you! You're so pretty and amazing! I can taste offal and candy by looking at you! Thank you, I think, Engel exclaimed. I love your colors! Dot leaped over to Engel's arms, clutching onto cloth, and then practically melted into Engel's arms. Her leg kicked and her ears twitched as Engel scratched her belly through her clothes. Yeah! Dot cried out. She got enough control over her leg to point it at Sveta. Her tone became accusatory. You! Me, Sveta said. She sounded so unimpressed. A lot of these people weren't her favorite. I have to say... Dot was adrift in a sea of what had to be wonderful sensations and sounded almost drunk with it. She came out with a reluctant, Nice coat. Almost an aside, like she'd been planning to say something, but she'd had to make the concession to the very cool coat I'd shopped for with Sveta. Thank you, Sveta said. But, Dot exclaimed again, Your arms! When I saw your arms before, they were boring! They're still a bit boring. But you were so pretty before! You were so unique, and then you had colorful arms. I've seen pictures on her computer. Dot indicated Amy. Did you now? Sveta asked, dry. Researching the opposition? Making sure I knew who Shin was dealing with, in case they asked, Amy said, not looking over at Sveta. Which isn't important, Dot exclaimed. What's important is you were colorful, and now you're boring. I'm extra exciting. But it's only for the people who deserve it, Sveta said. She altered her hand, but she wasn't looking at it, so the camera didn't catch more than a bit of it. But what about the colors? I'm going to add colors. Right from the beginning, I've been deciding, see? 
I have sample pictures on my phone of things I like. Dot was reluctant to leave Engel's arms, but she did eventually rouse. Engel made it a difficult process, nuzzling Dot with her face, which Dot seemed to love. But then she lifted Dot up to her shoulder. The little goblin leaped over to Sveta's shoulder, then peered over, her leaf-shaped ear blocking a significant portion of the camera and Sveta's view. Sveta pulled it down and away, hand resting on Dot's head. She flipped through a gallery of really cool images. It wasn't her usual art style, which surprised me. A little darker, a little less nature-themed. Everyone should do it, Dot was whispering, but her mouth was closer to the microphone, so it was distorted in volume. Fill in the canvas. I kind of agree, Sveta whispered back. My queen did it. Hmm, that's for her sake. I'm doing this for mine, but I want colors and art good enough to keep forever. One day, after everything settles down. Uh-huh, Dot mumbled. Her head flicked left, right, left, right, as Sveta dialed through the gallery of pictures, her whole head moving to track the images as they flew by. Speaking of, Sveta said, her voice louder, how's your queen doing? Victoria asked you to keep an eye on her, right? I tensed at the mention of my name, at seeing Amy's head turn ninety degrees. Uh-huh, she's okay. I like the giants. They're something special. She's taken about ten times longer to work on this giant than she took on the last one, and she took twice as long as normal for that one, Sveta remarked. You're distracting me, Amy said. I thought you said your control and concentration were good now, Sveta said. They are, but you're slower. What does it take to get you out of my hair? Amy asked. Again, we want to see the lab. We want to vet the giants in progress. Labrat doesn't trust you. We don't trust you, Sveta exclaimed. We don't even know what your powers do. Would you submit to me touching you too? Fuck you, Amy. Ha! Huh? Sveta barked. No. Hell no. Good. Then what? Amy asked. Because no, we're not going to bring a bunch of unknown powers into a sensitive area, especially considering Shin's perspective on foreign powers. We could demonstrate their powers, Engel offered. You've seen most of mine. You know Sveta's. Sveta was holding up her phone to her shoulder. A tiny hand pawed through images, caressing the occasional one. And his? Amy asked. Theirs? I really hope you know Weld's, because he was around when you were still in Brockton Bay. I wasn't exactly hanging out with the wards. Slicky and Slides. More effective movement in tighter spaces. Egg hatches. Don't hatch right now, Engel said abruptly. Sveta's head turned, the phone moving in Dot's direction, apparently to hold Dot down. Egg had cracked, head, most of his torso, and one arm demolishing into fragments of shell, leaking thick yellow yolk. The thing that bulged out of the encasement looked like something between a combination of a morass of worms with hook legs and a featherless bird soaked in yolk. The actual configuration was impossible to make up, as it was all curled up into itself. The giants stirred, restless, dripping with afterbirth, turning their gaze toward Egg. Slowly, with lurches and throbs, the pink-black, yolk-slick mass receded the eggshell exterior closed around it. Amy didn't relax until Egg's head had fully reformed. He did up some clasps that kept the plastic wrapping around his body and touched the brushing of canary yellow hair at the top of his head, fixing it. Is that you? Amy asked. Nah, she's herself. So are her sisters. We brought him because we thought Chris would be interested, Sveta said. He was nice enough to cooperate. For cloning? Amy indicated the giants. Hell no, Sveta said. He'd like it. It's the kind of thing that always piqued his interest. It's incentive to talk, and we really want to talk to him. Hi. I blinked. The black word had appeared on the video feed. He doesn't want to talk to you, Amy said. Around the table, LaRue, Eric, Armstrong, and others who were looking in hadn't remarked or reacted. 
Nobody else seemed to have spotted it. Don't look alarmed. Only you can see this text. I flicked through the images, trying to look nonchalant. I rotated through once, then stopped on the car full of kids. Yep, it's me, Kay. Miss you. I changed from the view of Kenzie over to Rain and Tristan. I nodded at the screen. You too, huh? Again, I nodded a bit. What's up? Eric asked. Golem and Precipice make a nice pairing. Huh. He didn't ask more questions, didn't elaborate. Want to help coordinate on the DL? You'll have to be discreet. Discreet, I mentally corrected her. A bunch of Shin capes, capes from the prison and ones I presumed were originally Shin, had emerged from the building. Rain and Tristan backed off. Amy stopped working. Sveta, Engel, Egg, Weld, and Slickian walked off to one side to get a better view. My hand had found a natural resting place over the keyboard well before this point. Pressing the keys down as softly as I could wasn't difficult. Yes. I didn't hit enter, because it would have taken another movement of my hand. It didn't matter. On it. Immediately, she began sending messages to the others. New patch. Anti-Mathers measure. Don't freak out. The text appeared in their field of view, with the eye cameras they wore. They barely seemed to notice their attention on the capes. I typed as quietly and unobtrusively as I could, got frustrated, and opened a notepad document. I began taking notes, rune, other stuff, and in the midst of it, I typed, This Amy stuff is taking up too much focus. This might not be the biggest danger. And deleted it. Kenzie's reply appeared a few seconds later. Tattletail thinks so too. I watched the screen, tense, trying to think. I paged through to Kenzie's video footage, overshot, and ended up on Chicken Littles. Good enough. Tattletale? Kenzie asked. I wondered if she'd waited for me to get to the right footage so I could follow along. Your voice isn't exactly dulcet, look out. Thinker headache, remember? Before you make it worse, consider that Tattletale with headache is going to be crabby. Tattletail with no headache buys you treats. Can I give you an eye camera when we're at the workshop? I think jamming something that looks like a bunch of forks welded together into my eye is the sort of thing that makes headaches worse. It's painless, Kenzie said. And it's important. There was a pause. I could imagine that great titanic agent working with the crystals, drawing connections, pulling up data. Sure. Cool. It'd be a direct, private line between me and Tattletail then. Good start. Arc 17, Sundown, Chapter 8 This is going to be a juggling act. At Shin Station, Capricorn, Sveta, and Rain were part of a greater assembly of heroes, forming the group at the station entrance and the loose perimeter around the Mother Giant. The shepherds who'd been stationed at the entrance had backed off as a crowd of capes emerged, half and half. Half had clothing in the Shin style, with masks and draping cloth. Capes, like more old-fashioned capes, had worn on bet, but with more emphasis, layered with one cape atop another with a slightly different cut, so the edge of one beneath framed the one above. Stylized drapings of cloth made to evoke images, or made so overwhelming that the cape was 90% of the costume. There were patterns reoccurring across the costumes that looked like Shin's equivalent of tartan, argyle, or houndstooth, but more complex. The other half were ours, our most problematic. Cole Belcher, Gamble, Croco Shit, La Llorona, and more. Coronzon, Seer, Arima, Bomet. Fallen, arrested during the raid of their compound, taken to the prison. 
broken out by Lab Rat and the Red Queen. A couple of the capes in their periphery looked like they might have been at the Fallen Raid. Allies of the Crowleys, bikers and drug dealers, roped in, arrested. Amy joined the group from Shin. Giants walked with her, kneeling on either side of the group. She stood with one hand on a giant, doing her work, as others gathered off to the side. In a way, it was good that I'd tied her hands. Good that we'd pit her against a threat that essentially never stopped coming, and forced her into supplying a constant stream of soldiers to wage war against it. It limited what else she could do. Koronzon approached Amy, bending down to say something in her ear. It looks like she cured his cancer, Rain murmured. Koronzon would be the senior member of the Fallen group when Mathers was captured. From what little I'd seen of him earlier, he'd been someone who was very like Mama Mathers in how he'd moved. She had been so thin and malnourished that she'd looked like she would creak when she moved, a wisp of a person who came across as old when she definitely wasn't. Koronzon, as Rain had suggested, had had cancer and had been ill enough he'd hobbled. He didn't hobble now. He moved like a young man. He wore a shawl of animal hides that had been bleached as white as hides could get over white robes that had stains around the ankles. A hood covered his head, and a thin black mass bubbled and twisted in the expanse beneath that hood, casting his face in permanent but inconsistent shadow that made it look like his skin was boiling. It didn't follow his face perfectly, and at times he moved his head or glanced over at the heroes, I saw someone with sharp features and a sharper glare. Can't listen in. Sorry. It's okay, Kens, Sveta murmured. Do we have a problem? Moonsong called out to the Shin Capes. Koronzon kept talking, his voice low and impossible to make out, Amy listening, not responding. What are you even doing, Amy? Sveta called out. What is Shin doing? They're playing games with you, and you're playing games with everything. Can you get a message to Sveta for me? I asked. Depends on the message, Eric said, without looking up from his screen. Tell her to tone it down. If Amy listens, she's going to be on the defensive. Is this a continuation of your plan to manipulate your sister? It's a continuation of my plan to not have the Red Queen flip out and hurt people. Amy! Sveta's voice had that digital edge to it, filtered through long distance and a microphone, with no benefit from Kenzie's attention because Kenzie wasn't good at sound. Victoria's going to be disappointed. Victoria's always disappointed! Amy snapped back, turning. I'm a deluded little monster, according to her. According to half of you, apparently. More than half, Sveta said. Speaking as someone who spent far too long being an actual monster? I could see Egg shift position, where he stood a little distance away from Sveta. It doesn't have to be the single thing that defines you. It apparently does, but I'm not doing the defining, Amy replied. She is. They are. Let me talk to Sveta, I said again. Or take my message, pass it on to her. Just tell Sveta, Victoria says to relax. That's all. Eric didn't. I typed, Tell Sveta to relax? Amy! Sveta started. She stopped. A pause. Sveta took in a deep breath. I could tell you to call me the Red Queen. I don't think it would be unfair to ask either, Amy said. Especially when people can't stop saying my name with such negative emotion tied to it. Amy, Sveta said, less negative. Why would Shin trust you and Cryptid with something this big? Objectively, would you trust yourself? I saw the momentary hesitation on Amy's part. She answered, If I had to. If you had no other options, sometimes you have to force yourself to trust. I don't think Shin thinks they have many options. Chilling fucking words from someone who had one primary goal, 
me, and who felt backed into a corner by her own actions. It doesn't feel like they explored a lot of the alternative options, Moonsong said. Cooperation, treaties, deals. We were doing well before, and we jumped straight to this. We could debate that forever, Amy said. She brought a hand with a fingerless glove onto her hair, pushing it out of her face. They think all parahumans are fucked up, rotten, and dangerous. I don't think they're completely wrong to think it. If you have a few thousand rotten eggs scattered around, I think the adage about putting all of your eggs into one basket deserves to change. At least then you can hope to manage it, instead of about worrying about every step you take. That's a great fucking metaphor, Amy, I thought. If you have a few thousand rotten eggs, the only basket anyone rational is going to put them in is the waste basket. You're calling yourself a trash can. Not to mention the basket case interpretation. Coronzon leaned in close to say something to Amy's ear again. Amy turned to Cole Belcher, said something, and the heavyset man with sandpaper stubble on his chin, black smears on his face, serving to create a skull mask, and greasy black hair turned to go back. I've got to go. Red Queen, Moonsong called out. She had a good, projected voice. We have more to discuss. I'll be back, Amy said, letting go of the giant she'd been working on and walking away. Be good. If they do anything, my soldiers have permission to defend Shin. Moonsong was silent, but I could see her fuming. She'd been ignored and she was an experienced enough heroine to know that posturing and position were critical for capes. It was something my mom had hammered in many times. Posturing, position, and power. None of those things could exist in isolation of the others. Continuing to speak into a void or shout after Amy would hurt her reputation because it would have meant begging for a response. Fucking stupid when it was Amy being the bitch here. Call yourself queen enough and you'll start to act like one. Keeping in mind that enough queens in history had been sufficiently monstrous or problematic to get the guillotine. Amy's absence had cut off the procession line, leaving a small army of capes she was supposed to be keeping under control behind. The heroes, frozen by the implied threat of a fight because Amy had left orders to protect Shin, and any action could be taken as aggression. Fucking fuck, Amy. What are you doing? Every time you get in touch with me, my life gets a hundred times more complicated. The voice in my ear was Tattletales. Tense, not happy with how the situation had been left, with the shin capes and the heroes in a standoff that was complicated by the continued production of giants. I rotated through the individual video feeds on the laptop. No Tattletale feed, but the kids were in the same building. I went to my notes, typing up details on the fallen, and in the midst of it, typed and deleted a message for Tattletale, hoping Kenzie or her system would catch it. Koranzan retreats into a portal, stews, emerges as a monster. White hides and cowl, boiling black fur for mask. Arima grants danger sense and hyper-awareness to others. If she's protecting Amy, can't drop something on Amy from a great height. Single eyeball mask, wing motif. Seer blasts out shadowy duplicates, can exchange location with any of them. Horse head, hides, robes. Bomet gives humans animal features and vice versa, permanent. Not touch-based as originally assumed. Three-faced mask, animal, human, and hybrid. Hey, Tattletail, considering what the Undersiders pulled in Brockton Bay original... That sounds just. Karma coming around. If it weren't for us, the city would have been condemned. And controlling businesses, influencing the local heroes, and managing all organized crime in the city are your reward for that hard work. Yep, Tattletail said. Apparently a cosmic power that gave her incredible insights didn't help her grasp my sarcasm. Or she was just acting like it didn't to annoy me probably the second. She said, Your tinker is about to start making her thing to jab in my eye. 
Until then, I'm at my computer in the kitchen, watching the same feeds you are, making coffee. Shin capes at the station? Yeah. I don't know how far this goes, how far until she breaks or something goes tits up. Wish I could tell you. I'm working with limited information here, going to pull my team together, situate your kid to get all the information possible, and I'll use that information to put together a better picture. Good? I don't know if it's good. I'm worried this isn't it, that this latest panacea fuck-up is going to distract us from whatever the real problem is. Kenzie said you felt the same way. Yeah, Tattletail said. I could hear her sigh. She fell silent. I could see from Candy's point of view that Darlene had passed through the kitchen, where Tattletail stood by the counter, laptop perched there, her attention on the coffee machine. Not wanting to talk if she could get caught talking to me, I could appreciate that she had a good sense about that stuff. Let me get the eye thing, and we'll see what we can do as a collaborative thing, Tattletail said. Okay. Armstrong had risen from his seat. Another guy had joined LaRue and Eric, leaning over the table. The tone of the room had changed. I'd been so sucked into that video feed in front of me and the space around me and behind me where people might be looking over my shoulders that I hadn't noticed. Citrine. Mayor Jean Wynne, with two people in her company, presumably wardens. I watched through Kenzie's feed as she passed through the kitchen again, carting stuff this way and that checking a box. Tattletail spoke. Your kid says Citrine just showed. Yeah. Kenzie was altering the video and sound feeds. What I was seeing of her milling around was what others were seeing, but she was telling Tattletail stuff and getting her up to speed, presumably. I'd have been a bit spooked if it wasn't so useful. Citrine took the seat at the end of the table that faced the screens. Do you need anything? Armstrong asked. No, Jean told him. She was pale enough to look really washed out, all dressed in black. Her hair was styled and perfect, her makeup done up nicely. It made me think of my mom's efforts, in a way. But where my mom kept her hair short for strictly utilitarian reasons, Jean had hers long. My mom was a blade that she kept sharpened, Jean was elegant, regal, even in mourning. I want to make sure my city's okay, Camille. I wondered if she actually cared. It was hard to picture when she was as emotionally reserved as she was. Hey, your kid has a tummy ache, FYI. You know why, right? The sudden comment from Tattletail made my head spin for a second. Too much of a change from where we were. I know. She and I talked about it this morning. Just making sure. You have to warn people. Case in point, check your feed. Look at what your kid is doing. I've been keeping an eye on the situation. Rain was giving a rundown on the fallen to the local capes, talking quiet while the standoff persisted between the two groups. Three groups, almost. The shin capes didn't mingle with the prison capes and Amy. I switched, getting an uncomfortably close view of Chicken Little's face. He leaned back, and she leaned in. She was talking. And get your bird cameras going, for more targeted strikes. And there's the topological stuff, in case the topology topples and the city thing happens. I typed out a message to her as she went on. She didn't seem to get it. I looked up and over at Eric. Can I call Kenzie? Strictly non-cape stuff. You'd need to outline what you want from us. Stopping a fight from breaking out between kids. Possibly a serious one. Again, tell us what you want to communicate and we'll review it quickly. I clenched my fist. I... Red light, look out, Tattletail barked on the microphone. It was something that would be picked up by anyone watching any of the kids. I was safe to stop and listen. Huh? Kenzie twisted around. Means freeze. Stop. Freeze. Oh! Kenzie stopped. Chicken Little backed off, and from the view of the other kids, I could see Kenzie deflate a bit. Why? Proxemics, Tattletail said. 
personal space? Tattletail's got it, I muttered. Good, Eric said, sounding happy. I know what proxemics are. Is, Kenzie replied, sounding as annoyed as I'd heard her. You're bad at it. For right now, don't get in so close to your buddies. Don't get any closer than you'd need to to reach out and put your hand on their shoulder. Was I making you uncomfortable? Kenzie asked, looking at Chicken. A little. Oh, I'm sorry, Kenzie said. The scene put her in the middle of the room, Chicken having retreated about three paces towards his room with all the now empty bird cages. Darlene was near her room, and Candy sat on the back of a chair, feet on the seat, back to the wall, leaning forward. It was almost like Kenzie was surrounded. I wouldn't have wanted to handle it that way, making such a point of it. Especially not after the whole thing last night, when the heartbroken had turned on her. She looked visibly anxious. You do that sometimes, Chicken Little said. I'm sorry. I'm not mad or upset, Chicken Little said, insistent, like he was already expecting or seeing resistance that didn't come across on the camera. Maybe it was how fast the apology had come after his statement. I could almost relate, thinking to my dealings with Amy. I really didn't want to connect Kenzie and Amy in my head. Sorry, Kenzie said, still a bit defensive. Difference is that Amy doesn't say sorry. I'm not even convinced she feels sorry. They're both really bad at listening or noticing cues when it's stuff they don't want to hear, though. I'm just trying to explain so we can be better friends in the future. Chicken Little went on. You get into whatever you're talking about and the conversation becomes one-sided, and it gets really hard to get a word in, especially if I'm trying to say step back a bit or stuff. I typed out more words. Take five, or ask for a short break. Kenzie didn't react. Can I call in? I asked. Talk to her? If you tell us in advance what you're going to... I interrupted. I want to reassure her, distract her, refocus her. She's a kid who had a surprise bad night after a bad evening, and I want to ensure today goes more smoothly. I want her to take a break. Can you fill us in on what happened yesterday? I don't think that's in the notes. Do I need to submit a damn form? What, in triplicate? I asked. I want to help a kid by calling her for a short conversation. Nothing to do with warden concerns. Everything's to do with warden concerns. Armstrong looked concerned as he walked back over to where his chair and laptop were. Citrine was unmoving at the head of the table, elbows on the white surface, hands clasped together and pressed to her mouth, or around it. I wouldn't be mushing up my hands to my mouth if I'd paid as much attention to lipstick as Citrine had. No fucking allies. Fucking idiots, all of them. That stab of loneliness. The frustration. Eric, seriously, is this a power trip? Because I think you're assuming responsibilities and guardianship that, as far as I can tell, weren't officially passed on or handed down. I am assuming those responsibilities, but I have to, Eric said. It's either that or you leave this room. That's crazy. Believe it or not, Victoria, the world doesn't revolve around you. The wardens are busy. They took the time to review your situation. They made their call. I got what you got, and that's all we get until they have a spare few minutes to give us more. The difference between us is I have Cineral's trust. I've worked with her for a little while now. She likes me because when I make assumptions, I make the right ones. I know how she thinks. I'm making a judgment call that these continued restrictions are what she would want, and that she'd want to vet any statements you make with all necessary context before letting you unduly influence your team. I looked over at Armstrong. This doesn't feel right. Maybe not, the man replied. Chevalier will report in by phone in about fifteen minutes. Some of the others will be calling in too, including Miss Militia, who you know. Can you hold on until then? If you want to appeal, you can do it then. I'll pull strings to ensure you get the chance. 
I'm worried this ends up an actual bloodbath before then. It's kids, Eric said. I pressed my fist against my forehead, face turning up toward the ceiling, taking in a deep breath. Lookout is powerful, yes? It's in the records she's proven herself to be capable. But you don't get kid capes without trigger events and trauma. She's been through a lot, and so have those other kids. They're parahuman kids. Some are heartbreakers. The older ones or the young ones? Citrine asked. I turned, feeling a glimmer of hope. Young, but not the youngest. They're little nightmares. They're great, except when situations like this come in and someone needs to step in and steer them. Yes, Eric said. You trusted her to Tattletail's company, so trust Tattletail to be that someone. Stay put, no call. Those are my instructions. And I'm following these instructions on your say-so? I asked, bristling. Pretty much, Eric retorted. You aren't winning me over here with this attitude. Is that possible? I sat up straight, hands on the desk. To win you over? I mean, it helps to try. Helps what? I asked him. If I have to make situational calls, and you're being unreasonable or emotional, I might make different calls. Listen, if you happen to be right, you can make your case to Cineral and the other wardens, and I'll get hell for it. I don't care about your hell, or your status in the wardens, or anything like that. I want the world to end up okay. I want my team to end up okay. Last night, the heartbroken... Two of those kids there are heartbreakers, as you probably know. I know. They mobbed Lookout, and she only barely got out okay. Now there's another mob, and Lookout is tired, off balance, and spooked. They're on camera. Kenzie's voice had an edge to it. Enough of an edge that it interrupted me. Chicken Little had been doing most of the talking in the background, and now he fell silent. The conversation had been heated with underlying emotion, and probably a few things left unsaid. Which seemed to be an ongoing problem, because this wasn't the first time Chicken Little had tried to air his grievances or curb Kenzie's problematic tendencies. But each time this stuff did come up, the context of the situation meant it couldn't be a debate. That wasn't even the biggest concern. Bloodbath. Darlene was conspicuously still and quiet through all of this, and it was her defense of Chicken Little and her very obvious attachment to him that spurred on her worst behavior. No jabs, no comments, no teardowns, no don't-hurt-the-chicken lines. She did nothing, and that made me worry. "'I think you've said what you need to say, Chicken,' Tattletail said. "'She's right.' This isn't the time or place. Cameras? We're on candid camera, Kenzie said. She smiled. I thing, remember? I told you it'd be on and stay on. Chicken Little touched his chicken mask. It's easy to forget, Candy said from the sidelines. Sorry, didn't mean to gripe with people watching, Chicken Little said. He was a calm little guy. I could imagine myself being a lot more frustrated at the circumstance. No, Kenzie smiled back. We're okay, right? We're okay. We're teammates. Nothing changes that, Chicken Little said. Good. Let's refocus for now, Tattletail said. Look out. Go to your workshop. Get what you need. Build what you need. Everyone else, pack. I'm going to make something to eat, depending on what's in the fridge. I've got ten different kinds of egg, probably, Chicken Little said. Throw those out so they don't go bad, in case we come back here. Or store them to bring with us if you really think you can eat them, Tattletail told him. But pack. No procrastinating. Chicken Little groaned. Speaking of procrastinating, there's a blanket in the medical room, Candy said. Cold hands are awful to tinker with. Let's bundle you up. The heat should kick in soon, Tattletail said. I'll remind you, Lot, the operative part of the word refocus is focus. Soon isn't now, 
I'll get the blanket anyway. Thank you, Kenzie said. I'm going to go get some water, then I'll get to work. It's like herding cats, Tattletail said as the two kids ran off. I had to switch to Darlene's point of view to keep my eye on Tattletail, with a brief cycle through points of view to make sure Rain and the others were okay. Standoff was in progress, a bit of adjustment because the size of the mob of giants had increased, forcing the heroes to move off to the side. Some other stuff, some ongoing conversations, but it looked quiet, tense. I was more concerned on ensuring Kenzie was handled. Tattletail was talking as I cycled back to her. Very hard. I'm trying to be good, Darlene said, quiet, sitting on my hands, keeping my mouth shut. It's working. In another circumstance, I could see you getting heated. Darlene fidgeted. She's in a weird mood, look out. You're not wrong, kiddo. Do me a favor. You know where the medical boxes are. Spare me having to use my power to find them and dig up some ibuprofen. Then help me make... Grilled cheese and tomato soup? Hot chocolate and cookies a bit after? Darlene nodded, smiling. She got up out of her chair. You used your power to work out what's in our pantry. Mm Mm-hmm. Come on. Extra cookie for you for not stabbing Lookout with a pen. And you're not grounded anymore. Knife, Darlene said. I try to always keep a knife now. I would have shot you if it came to that. You would have tried. Tattletail put her hand on the back of Darlene's head or her shoulder, guiding her. I looked across the table at Eric. He hadn't reacted in the slightest, which made me think he wasn't watching the video feed of Darlene's perspective. Tattletail guided the kid into the tiny kitchen that was in one corner of the hideout. Darlene's point of view was the best view I had of Tattletail. Snuff re-entered the building, leaning into the doorway. Candy stopped in her tracks. Tats, it's Snuff, Candy said. Undersiders are coming, Snuff said. Tell her, I'll leave you alone. I heard, Tattletail called out. Thanks, Snuff. Snuff went back outside. I watched through Darlene's viewpoint as Candy, hugging a folded blanket to her chest, found her equilibrium, taking a few seconds before resuming movement, throwing the blanket over top of Kenzie, who was in her computer chair. "'Who's coming? Imp?' Darlene asked. "'Yep. Aunt Rachel. Foil. Parian. Remember to use their cape names since the cameras are on.' Darlene nodded, the camera bobbing. Tattletail pressed her phone to her ear. Ibuprofen. You know where it is? I know where to look. Darlene went to the same room Candy was collecting blankets from. Tattletail's voice came through the mic, presumably for me alone. Hot chocolate, extra cookies, and whatever treats Imp brings for your kid? It won't make her unbearable or messy? She'd be holding the phone to her ear while talking to me, so it wouldn't be too suspicious. I typed. The messiness comes from social stuff, not really sugar. She'd appreciate the extra care. All right. Anything to watch for? I'm conserving some strength for what's to come. I typed my reply. She hit a life milestone, and she's probably missing the fact she doesn't have a mom or dad to give her that extra bit of care. When undersiders arrive, she'll be the odd one out. Yeah. So embarrassing. Fuck, this was hard. Juggling, remembering who was aware of what. Of course Kenzie was seeing my interactions with Tattletail. I typed. We're all coming at this from a place of caring. Tats wants to help. I mean, see Little telling me I do all these things? I didn't know. I stand too close and I lose my breath and I thought everything was going super well and it isn't. It never is. (laughs) And everyone watching. I see the faces on webcams and security cams and audience feedback systems tell me how many are viewing, and it's a lot. Ugh. 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 (laughs) Ha-ha. I replied, I'm sorry. Your team wants to take care of you, so let them, okay? Candy's bringing a blanket, and Tats is getting treats for after lunch. I'll be here as much as I can.
Smiley face. Take 20 seconds. Take stock. What do you need? Breath of fresh air? To sink into your work? A friend? If you don't want to type to me, you can talk to Candy, I think. Making sure the others are safe. With that, with renewed focus and motivation, Kenzie got to work. I typed, The fucking bureaucracy of this place. I want to chase leads and look into other possibilities, but it's a mess. Prioritize my eye thing, Kens, Tattletail called out. On it! Tattletail added in a quieter voice, Because what I really need for this headache is information overload. She took the pills from Darlene, cracking open the bottle. A good minute or two passed as people got settled. I switched back to the heroes and Shin parahumans. Amy was back, her hand on a giant, and so was a monster. My first take was that it was another empowered giant like the Chevalier or Nursery, but I could see the collar it wore, the same as what Chris had worn when pursuing us in our little prison escape. It was Lab Rat, fresh from his lab, and he now loomed in the gate's entrance. He wasn't as tall as the giants, but there was more mass to him. He was rotund, belly expanded to the point his legs weren't visible above the knee, his arms past the elbow. Smaller arms lined his sides, stumpy like a maggot's limbs. Hairless, with dulled features, a porcine lump of a nose that seemed to extend from the brow rather than any bridge of the nose. Wide eye sockets rimmed with ridges of red and black, like the orbs had been set into wounds carved in loops and circles until there was enough of an indent for the eyes to rest in. A hole for the mouth that seemed unable to completely close. All of him was covered in what looked like paper cuts or other lacerations. Some were fine, pink against the ghoulish white flesh. Others were crimson, jagged, like someone had hacked at him with a chainsaw. Black masses that could have been branches or wire stuck out of the wounds. In places, the branching wires were stuffed into the wounds and pried those wounds wide in their efforts to straighten back out. When he shifted his weight, his mass shifted, wobbling like a waterbed, and the sheer mass of black wires poking and prying at his insides and around the gashes became evident. Of all of them, only one at his side poked through, causing skin to break, then split from the pole of the flesh around it. Wires were visible in the flesh and bloodless wound, thicker than elsewhere. One of his hands held a syringe gun. A smaller one held a clipboard. He was naked in the cold, not that anything was visible, and didn't seem to mind. Eerie to see something like that speaking with a misshapen mouth, with the cadence and apparent ability of any ordinary person. Heads around the room turned as LaRue put the image of Chris up on one of the main screens. Mr. Armstrong, should we send notice of his appearance to the wardens? I don't think so. This is normal for him, Armstrong replied. Have you seen this one, Antares? No, I said. No idea who he could have gotten it from either. He scans parahumans to get data he can utilize in his forms. My eye roved over the crowd of Shin parahumans. Two stood out to me. A man with what looked like a blue moth mask, wearing multiple layers of blue and white capes that wrapped around him, almost encasing his body. He didn't seem to have access to his arms or even the full range of motion of his legs. His hair was nearly white, he was tall, and his lower face, visible beneath the mask, had a constant, slight smile to it. Another was a woman, who slouched badly with her arms hanging at her sides as if there was an anchor tied to each hand. She was missing one eye, the socket surrounded by a burn, and one of her breasts was gone. She was beautiful in a scary sort of way, and the scars didn't take away from that. Her posture did. She was paying more attention to Chris than anyone else, and Chris tended to get a lot of attention already. Obsessive level of attention, then. I'd heard that Goddess had access to a parahuman who could alter people's appearances. 
that she'd used this parahuman to make her parahumans beautiful and healthy. It was in the warden's records, because there had been notices to watch out for Shin agents after the issue at the prison a week ago, to warn teams about taking on new and attractive members. Those two felt like the ones to watch. It was another intuitive thing, another thing for me to keep track of, another thing for me to juggle. Another train of thought to go down as I mulled over my newfound connection to my agent, to my wretch. I could remember papers, remember areas being explored. This time, I was thinking less about what contributed to those connections, and more about what happened when the connection manifested. Added control over powers. Added nuance in power, sometimes in the form of new techniques and moves. More power, obviously. More range. Those were the basics. Powers that had drawbacks could find those drawbacks relaxed if the user regularly practiced with their power, meditated, put their powers to use in the field, which might be conflated with being in the midst of more conflict. God, what had it been? I racked my brain to remember one file. A passing remark by a cape with control over sound, who had pumped sound into a tinker's engine. They'd evidenced a good sense of what sounds would be most effective. It had been a city-wide whining sound that was supposed to target people with criminal intentions only, and the sound manipulator had known what sound was best. They had noted in their paperwork that they didn't think they'd have been able to do that the year prior. Blessed paperwork. The little details that emerged. That was awareness. It might suggest a grasp of the subject matter adjacent to the powers, a fire manipulator getting a sense of flames and how they burned, because that was the sort of thing their agent paid a lot of attention to. And, of course, courtesy of a bit of paperwork from Gollum, who stood next to Rain, while Cuff talked to Rain about girls, there was another dimension of parahuman agent growth related to that, because another thing adjacent to all powers was powers. Was my intuition augmented by my closer connection to the wretch, that radiant, fragile, multi-limbed specter I'd glimpsed last night? Did it give me a greater sense of parahumans, threats, and where threats lay? If it did, how was I supposed to distinguish between my actual gut and my power-provided gut? I typed, Tattletale? Bad time to start talking. I'm going to have to put the phone down soon so a little kid can jab something metal into my eyeball. I typed more. Blue bug person and the hunched-over woman with the scars that she hasn't had Amy heal yet. Why are they grabbing my attention like they are? Hold on, kid. I heard Kenzie make a complainy sound. Surprisingly whiny for Kenzie. I have stuff to do! Through Kenzie's perspective, I watched Tattletail look over to her laptop, switching the feed, and making the video full screen again. Did your power tell you something? Kenzie asked. Yeah, my power. Tattletail's tone was almost sardonic. The one in blue is the cocoon trump. Makes people beautiful, stronger, healthy. Gives them protections, keeps them a certain age. I typed, the one with the slouch is paying attention to Lab Rat. We want you gone, Amy announced. How ironic, I mused with no humor. Not an option, Moonsong replied. Capes behind Moonsong had shifted position in the last ten or so minutes. The standoff hadn't broken, and it was apparently a question of power and position. Amy could move because the procession of giants she was treating and giving innate instructions to hadn't ceased, but the Shin group was doing a better job of keeping still and staring down our side than the inverse. Moonsong, I noted, hadn't budged. Breakthrough was doing pretty well. Rain had only moved to square off against the Fallen, facing them. The Shepherds and the Shepherds' sub-teams. They had a core team of about 16 members, and another 30 lesser members who handled the ground game, focusing on neighborhoods and sub-communities within the city. 
The huntsmen were there, I noted. Breakthrough was there, too, but only half of the group. Opposed by a stubborn Amy who had found her next cause to be stupid over. She was backed by Chris, Fallen, Shin Capes that had apparently been tortured, and Prisoners. The sides looked to be about even, not counting the Mother Giant, nor the army she had gathered in rings around her, shuddering fonts of fertility, flesh, and afterbirth. The awful-eating, squirrel-sized goblin was the most normal person in her immediate circle right now. "'You have forces massing on our border. Shin insists,' Amy said. "'I thought you wanted cooperation with Antares.' "'I want cooperation with Shin, too. I gave you what you want. I need you to listen to them, too. This is non-negotiable.' They can't attack, I said out loud. Arima will protect the key players, like the Red Queen and Labrat. If they leave, we won't regain the ground we've ceded, Armstrong told me. I don't think they win. I think you have some exceptionally talented capes there, but I think the bad guys, Shin, they come out ahead. They'd say we're the bad guys, Eric said. Can we get a hold of Chevalier? You said he'd be available. We need a judgment call. Armstrong motioned at a nearby terminal where the warden's staff were gathered at one of the bigger computers. No, sir. He's still walking to the portal. Weather's slowing him down. Can we send a helicopter? Is one free? No. The three closest helicopters are transporting foresight, clearing a jam on one of the main roads so the people can keep evacuating, and coming back from the chite border situation. That last one won't reach Chevalier before he reaches us. Can't use powers, Armstrong said. I'm in, Tattletail murmured, her voice a buzz in my ear. I can see. How to even handle this? Ahem, listening? Tattletail asked. People around the table reacted. Listening, Eric said. Senior wardens are tied up elsewhere. You have two ex-directors here, Armstrong and Pierce. Have you been following? One of the capes there is a problem. Woman with the slouch and the burned eye. She's aggressive. If anyone makes the first move, it's going to be her. She's the source of the black shit Labrat has inside his body. She inspired the power he's built his body around, like a trial run of the giants. Thank you, Tattletail, Armstrong said, leaning forward. He looked back at a woman who was at the terminal. We'll pass it on. Passing it on, the woman said. Pierce, I assumed. Informing team leaders. The escalating hostilities continued. No longer a standoff. The Shin Capes were finding positions that were less standing in their individual groups and more finding the spots they wanted to fight from. Spacing out. Some Capes advanced, so they wouldn't have as far to travel to start hitting shit. The slouching woman with the missing eye was among them. Others moved closer to cover, like the pillars by either end of the station, or even using the kneeling giants that Amy had yet to tend to to shield themselves from possible fire. The ones to watch were the ones who didn't move at all. Bomet, Seer, the Cocoon Cape. A quick check of the kids showed Chicken Little with Darlene at his desk. Kenzie was in her computer chair in her workshop, bundled up in a blanket with a steaming mug of what might have been soup off to one side. Candy leaned in behind her, hugging her around the shoulders while looking at the screen. Candy's mug set off to the side. No murder happening there. Juggling, juggling, I thought. I felt so out of place, out of my element. Especially when the prick sitting across the table from me wasn't letting me have any input... You realize, Seer called out, if a fight breaks out, I break you in half, Rain boy. Rain didn't respond. No extreme violence, Amy said. I gave you rules and biological imperatives. Follow them. I am, Seer said. Shin set their own rules and imperatives, remember? You struck your deal with them. You gave us the rules they dictated. 
we can do whatever's necessary to protect Shin, including if we think a mass-murdering little shit like him might pull something. Dangerous, horrible little shit like him, Arima said, her voice young. Rain was stone still. Amy was silent. She didn't have nearly as much control over her rotten eggs as she liked to pretend. Chris turned his back to the scene, lumbering back inside. bomet has got a trick up his sleeve, Tattletail said. People near him need to back up. Armstrong signaled. Pierce accepted the signal, passing on the message. Moonsong gestured to teammates. They backed up, and Moonsong took a few steps back as well. Bomet moved to get closer to some capes at the front line, and Moonsong had them back up as well. Bomet could give people the features of animals, and vice versa. It took surgery to fix, unless he cooperated. He hadn't cooperated, apparently, for the entire time he'd been in the prison. He'd said it was a matter of principle, belief, and making unbelievers appear on the outside as they no doubt appeared on the inside. I hadn't heard anything about Amy doing anything to make him come to Gimmel and fix people, either. Good. You're going to need to pass on my tips far faster than that in about twenty seconds, Tattletail said. Yeah, Armstrong said, giving you a direct line to Pierce. Was that a literal twenty seconds? Pierce asked. Yes. Two? Brace! Pierce ordered, leaning into the microphone. The slouching woman moved, falling to her knees, her hands hitting the ground like dropped weights. A line of black wire branches ripped out of the earth, tearing up road, each one larger than the last. With Moonsong in front, Moonsong was the first in the line of fire. Between the touch of the ground and the imminent impact, there was only about a second. But the heroine didn't run or try to get out of the way. Instead, she raised a hand. The branches were uprooted, flung skyward. So was the offending cape. With the break in her contact with the ground, the branches ceased appearing. No! Moonsong called out. Years of good relationship, and you're throwing it all away! The suddenness of the counterattack seemed to give the villains pause. Amy, perhaps most of all. She'd never been a fighter. She'd hated the idea of appearing on the battlefield. I opened my mouth to tell Eric and immediately gave up. I typed. Bait Amy. She's scared. She wants a way out. I need you to pass on a message from me to the Red Queen, Tattletail said. Do not tell her it's from me. I typed. My outburst earlier. It's eating at her. Tell her... I kept on typing. Tattletail recited, passing it on, building on it with her power. Amy! Sveta called out. I don't want to talk to you. Amy was so good at the position thing. So good at placing herself in areas we couldn't touch her, where she had rank or respect. She had power. But posture... She had a way of looking weak, even when she was on top of a world, so to speak. They were going to eat her alive. It was inevitable. I could see it in the fallen. Earlier, Amy, you said when there are no other options, you end up extending trust to the wrong people and places. That's not what I said. What options are you leaving Victoria? She asked. She raised her voice. My words. Typed, translated, built on, and passed on. Seer lashed out. A bolt of darkness, and a bunch of duplicates. Rain slashed out with a silver blade, maybe anticipating that one would become real. It didn't. Which, in turn, saw Scribe attack. A chunk of building tore away from the wall, flying toward the Shin group. Already marked with her sign, gripped with her telekinesis, probably well in advance. One of Scribe's companions leaped up with a jet of flame, touching the rubble. It started crackling with electricity. Someone in Shin's faction blasted it, tearing it to small chunks. But small chunks of wall were enough to gash, to concuss, to hurt others. 
One caught Amy in the head, and for a long three or four seconds she was out of view. I could entertain the idea of her dying and feel nothing except suspension, not even hope. Remember her outburst when she snapped at you? Called you a deluded little monster? Threatened you? Sveta's voice sounded so minor in the midst of other sounds, but I had zero doubt Amy heard it. Amy straightened. The hurt on her face wasn't, I was pretty sure, from the head injury. Last chance, Amy called out. Her voice had taken on a different tone. You guys don't get to dictate borders or rules. If Shin says to back off, back off. Listen, Sveta called out. She said that because she was backed into a corner. If you keep on this course of action, you're only making that worse. Capes were backing away from the mother giant now. Sveta was one of the ones who didn't back off as much, because backing off would mean she was out of Amy's earshot. The imperatives might have been in evidence here. So long as our side was retreating, their side wasn't attacking. But retreat meant giving ground to Shin we might never retake. Not like this. Your dad has his head injury. So did your mom. Your sister had her stay in the hospital. Shitty as it sounds, your entire family has its issues with control and labels and identity. Believe me, the time I spent with Victoria, I know, Sveta called out. You are a member of that family, for better or for worse. The only thing keeping you from being a part of that family is the decision you're making right now. You will lose Carol. You will lose Mark. You'll lose the chance to meet Victoria over iced tea twenty years from now to talk and catch up. Amy shook her head. My heart sank. Seer stalked forward, Bommet at his side, his eyes glowing yellow. Amy reached out, holding out her hand. Her other hand went to her heart, pressing down over her crimson coat. People have been telling me to get real and to get a clue for a while now. It's about time I listen, right? No, Sveta said. Listen to what I'm saying right now. Relax. Get your guys to back down. You have a way forward. I don't want a way forward, Amy said, barely audible. I don't even like me, at all. Why would I inflict myself on my family? There's a thread, Tattletail's voice came through, trailing into the ground. She took meat from the giants and put it beneath you guys. The chest thing that's symbolic. Run! Breakthrough started running and telling others to run before Pierce had even finished communicating it, courtesy of the Kenzie tech. Seer hopped backward, pulling Bommet out of the way, as Amy exerted her connection through what was apparently an imperceptible vein of flesh that reached down her body and into a pool of biomass underground. She must have been setting it up from early on, anticipating attack or already thinking about defense. It erupted. A triangular jutting of flesh stabbing up from the ground, barring Seer's path. Amy turned her head, reaching to her belt. She held what looked like a vial of chemicals. Lab rats, Tattletail reported. Going to lift her up. Break the thread, Moonsong called. Don't! Tattletail called. Sveta lunged forward. At the same time, another growth of flesh speared up out of the earth. I couldn't see the side that faced her, but I saw it yawn open like it had a mouth to take in the vial. Sveta grabbed the outgrowth, and her arm unspooled to form tendrils. She snatched it out of the closing mouth, a few tendrils getting caught in the process, severed. Black blood flowed. Sveta tumbled to the ground. Amy backed up, and more growths stabbed skyward. Building-sized, skyscraper growths. She'd tapped into the nursery. I could only imagine what she would have been able to do if this growth of a thing had drank Labrat's chemical and mutated. It took the entire hero team to defend themselves. Rain's silver blades. Moonsong pressed growths flat. Gollum created giant hands that reached up and gripped them. But they were like fingers, claws, tentacles. 
reaching skyward, preparing to come down. Moon, Tristan called out. Rising star! He was already creating his orange motes. Moonsong had only a second to decide. She decided to cooperate. She used her power, reversing gravity on the motes, sending them skyward, dropping a few. Tristan created a few more motes at the more distant locations. A finger came down toward their group. The orange motes solidified into rock, a spike. The finger was impaled. The spike turned to a piercing stream of water. The water gushed into the internals of the finger and toward the base of the mass. It ripped at the metaphorical seams, exploded. Others came for Sveta, separating her from Amy. Defensive. A building blocked her exit to one side. Limbs came down on two more sides, leaving her only forward, and soon that was blocked off. She wasn't as agile with her new body, all considered. Not that she'd been adroit in her prosthetic one. I felt so fucking helpless, watching as the fingers closed in, shrank the space available to her. Amy, at the same time, backed up. My sister, cornering my best friend, leaving her nowhere to go, while a spike-tipped claw loomed above, ready to drop like a scorpion's tail. It plunged, broke right past an outcropping of Capricorn's rock. I had Sveta's view as she was trying to get to her feet, still trying and still looking skyward as the spike came down. A blur of black, darkness. I paged through to other views, to confirm what I didn't want to see. I saw Sveta lying on the ground, her face buried against Slickian's shoulder, the mover in the tight black costume who could slide through tight spaces. Go! Amy called out. Leave! Shin wants you gone! I want to pass on the message, Sveta called back. Get it through that thick skull of yours. Why? Because Victoria said she sees something in you. Her words. Not that you're a good person. Not that you're a saint or a healer or a possible tool. You're a person to her. Flaws and good sides included. Those are her words. She kind of hates you, and I think you know that's for good reason. She's willing to extend you a chance. I have no fucking idea why. I said that before you tried to stab Sveta, I thought. One by one, the limbs receded, pulling into the ground leaving ruined road and buildings in their wake. The front of the station had broken away due to one power use. She hadn't even used her army. She'd made them back off. This wasn't the Amy I'd known. This was the Amy who had spent years with Marquis. I can't even talk to her without her getting upset, Amy said. Obviously not, Sveta said the first thing she'd said that wasn't in the script. "'What's the point, then?' Amy asked. I typed, Kenzie giving Sveta the words. "'The point is you realize nothing you're doing is making things better or happier. You realize you've been hearing people say you need to talk to a therapist or reach out and you have a gut reaction not to. Maybe you stop listening to that gut reaction. Victoria's willing to concede the idea it might be your power,' Your agent nudging you. Let's take that concession. Let's fight past it. Did she ever think that maybe, just maybe, my being around someone who has an aura that makes you think she's the best thing ever, or the scariest thing ever, might mess with someone like me? Like, maybe it's an abusive relationship, yanking me this way and that, and that's why I'm so screwed up? Amy asked. I froze. The statement felt heavy like it took something for her to voice it. How long? How long had Amy been holding on to that? I typed. Sveta said my words. You never went out into the field, Amy. You hated caping. She used her power around her mom and her dad, around Crystal, around Shielder, and even her boyfriend more than she used it around you, at higher and lower intensities. If it had that effect, it wouldn't have been you. It was Amy's time to freeze, to consider. I'm vulnerable, weak, pliable. I was alone. 
They were actual family and Gallant was emotion resistant. I typed. Family doesn't mean anything to the agents, Amy. Second triggers don't follow family lines. They go by association. Who's closest and who's most convenient? Do you think Crystal and Eric weren't vulnerable in the years around their triggers? They triggered too. They were second triggers like you. They had their bad moments. They felt alienated, capes among regular citizens. They had trouble making real friendships. Mark, you know Mark had his own struggles, weaknesses. I watched Amy's expression through Sveta's eye. I watched her turn. Had she been blaming me? For how long? I typed. Talk to someone, Sveta called out. Victoria knows someone. She can set you up with an appointment. Tonight. Ignore that little voice that says no or wants to resist, because it might not be your voice. Amy didn't respond, instead pointing at Seer, at other capes, directing them back to the station. They obeyed. Sveta took a few steps to get closer. Amy! Sveta called out. You almost killed Sveta, I thought. My heart was pounding. I could have spit bile. I swear, if you walk away now, I will kill you. Okay, Amy conceded, barely audible. The anger and hatred subsided, and it left me feeling utterly empty, drained. It had taken everything I had, and if I had to look at Eric's face, if he gave me that look like, we didn't need you after all, or if he suspected I had acted, I was going to flip that fucking 18-foot-long table, damn the consequences. I had my finger to the power button on the computer, like I was crushing out its life. I watched the screen go black, video feed frozen by the shutdown process, and closed the laptop. I didn't know what to do with myself, and I didn't trust that what I ended up doing wouldn't be flipping that table or punching down a wall until I'd burned out the last of my energy. But I was aware I was part of a partnership, and I'd be damned if I entertained even the notion that Amy was overcoming her own partner's pressures while succumbing to my own. Nudges, intuitions, feelings, influences... I was aware I was acting different, since the connection had come back up. That I had hints, I had benefits, a kind of security, a new kind of vulnerability. For now, I just had to ensure I remained better than her. That meant saving the world, staying on course, maintaining my own balance. Thank you, fragile one, I thought to myself, for the hints and the nudges. I'll pretend they're from you, because I can't keep fighting and hating you. I'm spent. Short break, and then we have more to do. 